Okay, I would like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of November 9th, 2020. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or sign up to speak on a particular item. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Once the item is called, no further speaker signups will be allowed. So please make sure you visit malibucity.org virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called. So you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I'll call on you in turn so we can make our discussions clear for the record and for the public. Can we have roll call, please? Councilmember Fair. Here. Councilmember Mullen. Here. Councilmember Wagner. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Peak. Here. Mayor Pearson. Here. We have a quorum. Great. Um, we'll now do the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God and indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Um, before we go to approval of the agenda, I know that 4D is being continued to a date certain. Can I have that date please? I don't have it in front of me now. We can continue it to the November 23rd meeting, Mayor. Okay, to 1123. And I would like to ask that we move items 5A and 6A forward to after the consent calendar because both of them have been bumped more than once. And I think it's only fair that we bring them to the front for those people that have had to wait a long time. I'll second that. Okay. So we have uh, any comment on that? Or are we going to bring six go? B before it also, just because that's a pretty brief item. That's, I mean, I, I was just going to comment. I didn't know if anything got pulled from the public. Well, we're, we're not on the consent. We're, we're, we're not on consent. Yeah, we're not on consent yet. Um, I mean, you, do you want to? I mean, it's, it's just, a, just a thought because, you know, these appeals can take some time. Um, okay, let's move. I would, I would add to my motion, move 6B to after consent as well. Is there a second on that? I'll second. Second. So Mr. Mayor, can I just, um, hi, it's Christy. Can I just, I know. Yes. <laughs> Somewhere on here. Oh, there you are. I see you now. Here I am. Um, can I just, uh, confirm that the motion is to approve the agenda with the continuance of item four, C. C to oh, wait, not on C, 4D, yes. 4D, 4D, I mean, 4D, and then to rearrange the agenda, moving up items um, 4A, 5B, 5A, and 5B. I believe yeah. the items no. are written up nope. are 5A, 6A, and 6B. Correct, 5A, okay. 6A, and 6B, exactly. Okay. Yes, uh, that is the motion. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Uh, Mayor Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, can I have a report on the posting of the agenda, please? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on October 29th, 2020. Okay, excellent. Okay, now we'll move to uh, public comment on items uh, which are not on the agenda. For
for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction, but we city council may not act on these matters except to refer matters to staff or schedule the matters for a future agenda. Do we have public speakers? We do, Mayor. We have nine speakers. I'm going to read them out in order and then call them one by one to speak. Okay, they are you. Bruce Silverstein, Jenny Rosinko, Bill Sampson, John McGinley, Lonnie Gordon, Paula Murphy, Jessica Isles, Nicole McGinley, and Andy Lyon. Our first speaker will be Bruce Silverstein. Okay, thank you. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, you are, Bruce. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, so as everyone knows, we just had an election for city council um, and we just got updated results uh, just shortly ago. Um, and currently 6,747 ballots and votes have been counted, which I, I think may be the most in Malibu. And there are still more to be counted, but it's starting to look more and more like the result is a given. Now, last week I got an email from Christy Hogan which informed me that I had been elected, that I was a councilman elect, and that I was now bound by the Brown Act, which, if, if correct, would have prevented me from submitting public comment in advance of this meeting today. Now, I have been told by many people that the city manager and the city attorney work to stifle the public, to control the agenda, and to do all kinds of other things. And as you know, I ran on a platform that included replacing the city manager and the city attorney. I have sent numerous emails to the city attorney over the past 48 hours asking for information and providing her with legal research that I was forced to do. And I have yet to receive a response. Same thing with the city manager. She invited me to be briefed on city council, on transitioning to city council. I informed her that I wanted that meeting recorded because I want transparency. In fact, I'm going to have a number of initiatives for full transparency moving forward. And she has refused to respond to my inquiry. So what are you going to do about this council? You have a city attorney who I believe is acting insubordinate at worst and certainly incompetently at best. And you have a city manager who also is refusing to be civil or act responsibly. And I, I believe something needs to be done about this. Now, I'm going to be, if I'm elected, I'm going to be taking office in another month. But this is not acceptable in the interim. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jenny Rosinko. Thank you. OK, am I unmuted? Yes, I can hear you, Jenny. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Over the weekend, I emailed each city council member individually with these concerns. I apologize for the redundancy, but feel it's important to verbalize my concerns for the public record. I recently requested the notice of application for wireless communication facility number 20-012, an installation upgrade near Winding Way. I live in Paradise Cove, so this is in close proximity to my home. As we are all well aware, the City of Malibu's wireless facilities ordinance is outdated. We are also well aware that there have been an influx of small cell wireless antenna installations and upgrades throughout the City of Malibu, especially since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. I do not feel the public has been adequately notified or educated regarding these wireless facilities many of which are located in close proximity to residences. So tonight I am asking you, our city council members, to utilize the authority that you have to please put the application for wireless communication facility number 20-012 that is near my home, as well as any other applications for new installations or upgrades on hold until our city's wireless facilities ordinance has been updated in language that protects the city's residences, residents, not the telecom industry. I also ask that these WCF applications be put on hold until the public can be adequately notified and educated on the pros and cons of such facilities, especially those in close proximity to residences and schools. I do not feel that a yellow postcard titled notice of application is adequate notification or education. 
Those yellow postcards too closely resemble filming applications, which are common in our city and easily discarded with other junk mail. I almost discarded the yellow postcard I received this summer regarding another WCF installation, one that was also near my home and unfortunately received approval. I feel that the language on the yellow postcards describing these WCF installations and upgrades is both benign and ambiguous. It does not adequately inform the public of the pros and cons of these WCFs. I thank you for your time tonight and for putting first the interests of Malibu's residents over those of the telecom industry. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Bill Sampson would be our next speaker, but I don't see him in the meeting. So we'll try to come back to him and Thank we'll you. hear from John McGinley next. Okay, great. Am I on council? I can hear you, John. Great. Hello, council. As noted earlier, today marks the anniversary of a tough, tough day in Malibu history. And I wanted to acknowledge first and foremost, all of you for what you've done to help us rebuild our community and continue to be Malibu strong. Thank you. I was very disappointed at Thursday's meeting to learn that the city is still choosing to have telecom law firm, Dr. Kramer, update our WCF ordinance. During the September 29 meeting, Jerry informed you about a webinar that Dr. Kramer, our WCF consul, consul was to give on October 1, 2020 titled, small cell deployments, the critical factors involved in achieving swift approval. Well, we watched that webinar and here's something I believe you should see and hear for yourselves. Starting at minute 30, Kramer coaches everybody participating in his webinar to never use the word radiation when discussing the permitting of cellular antennas. He also reveals that he considers his firm is part of the industry. Would you please show the clip? That I have not used in this entire discussion. It's the word that you love to use and I can, I, I never can understand why our industry, we not consider ourselves part of the wireless industry, as we are. Why does our industry love the word? I'm, I'm, I'm going to whisper it. Why do we love that word? It's technically an absolutely accurate word. And it scares the bejesus out of a lot of people. You don't want to. My children, if you notice the entire lecture, I have not used that word except the two times I've just used it. I've talked about RF emissions, which is an absolutely accurate statement, which has a far different connotation. If you can please stop using the R word, the R word is the F word to us because it just makes our job in, in trying to get small cells approved much more difficult because that's the trigger word. So use the correct word, which is not the R word, use emissions, transmissions, any emissions you want, but don't use the R word, please. All right, with that, we're gonna move on. From examples like this, the council is determined that it does not feel comfortable with Dr. Kramer's continued consulting on wireless applications and has begun the process of terminating his contract by using an RFP. And yet TLF is writing the ordinance on a separate contract that will bind our city going forward and will serve as the basis for the new consultants decisions. Respectfully. John, your time is up. Thank you, council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lonnie Gordon. I'm not sure if she's in the meeting, but we're gonna give it a try. Okay, here I am. Here, can you hear me now? I can hear you, Lonnie. All right. 
Good evening, everybody. I'm sorry I missed the uh, first part of the Woolsey fire. Um, I'm not sure what you called it, but anyway, thank you very much for what you did. Thank you very much for who you are and what you're doing now. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't have a lot to say, except I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna ask you to nod your heads one way or the other. I sent in an email two days ago, I believe, regarding um, our, T, our telecom consultant. Did you happen to get it? Yes or no? Did you happen to read it? Yes or no? Because I felt it was really important for you to see these things that people will be discussing tonight. And I know that um, other cities have enacted an ordinance to called an urgency ordinance to institute a moratorium for new applications for small cell wireless facilities and telecommunication facilities that propose installations in the public right away until adoption of a permanent ordinance. The urgency is to allow for thoughtful discussion and deliberations given the newly adopted regulations prior to accepting applications. And unless specifically regulated or banned, there's a risk that the city can receive an application prior to the city's enactment of a regulation that reflects the new technologies, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> and use the public right of way. As such, the city should consider adopting the urgency ordinance to ensure the preservation of public peace, health, safety, or general welfare until the final regulations have been developed and reviewed by the adopted Council. And there's much more to say. I'm going to send this to you because, um, whoops, my Zoom just told me to update to a 5.0. I'm going to send it to you because this was an urgency ordinan ordinance um, adopted by Sebastopol and other cities as well. And I think that in, in light of what is going on, we need to have an urgency ordinance until our ordinance is adopted because the city goes dark in December. Uh, in January, if the RFP is not complete, then all of these installations can be installed and we'll just be, I hate to use the word, but up the creek. So um, I'm asking you tonight to please consider putting in into action an urgency ordinance pause on all of the, these installations. Thank you. Thank you, Lonnie. Our next speaker will be Paula Murphy. Hi there. Hi, Paula. Uh, I'm here to speak tonight about the ordinance that the city of Malibu is drafting to address the small cell installations in Malibu. In studying the actions of the currently contracted attorney, TLF Kramer, Kramer is consulting with the city to deliver an ordinance that will provide a set of regulations for future installations in Malibu. It has come to my attention that the law firm TLF Kramer seems to have a worrisome conflict of interest with the telecom industry. I don't believe that TLF Kramer will draft an ordinance that will adequately protect the interest of, interest of the residents of Malibu. Instead, Kramer seems more interested in facilitating things for the telecom industry to help them formulate plans to convince cities and their residents to back down and allow installations in places that are best for the telecom companies without regard for the health and wellness of our community. I pulled a quotation from a tutorial video that Kramer has posted on the internet regarding the issue of radio frequency emission concerns. As you can see, Kramer states that the practical reality is local governments are not allowed to consider health effects to the extent that a proposed project complies with the FCC rules. This quote is misleading. The reality is that local government must take into consideration the health effects of these cell towers, and each installation should be closely scrutinized by the planning department 
and they should never be allowed on school property or in residential areas. We may not be able to reject on that basis, but we can at least consider it so we can be more strategic in the development of our ordinance and processing applications. As we have learned during the COVID-19 pandemic, we must as a city go to great lengths to protect our most vulnerable population, children, the elderly, and people with pre-existing health conditions. And this should apply to small cell towers as well. We can't just pick and choose which health threats we care about and which we deem unimportant just because the federal government wants to impose mandates on municipalities in favor of industry. We have to stand firm that we will do our best in all situations to put the health and wellness of our residents first and industry second. I'm asking you today to pivot from Kramer and his law firm that clearly will want to create an ordinance that makes it as easy as possible for the telecom industry to install in our city recklessly cell towers and instead use the community's ordinance in our Paula, city. your time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paula. Our next speaker is Jessica Isles. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, Jessica. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you for listening to this. Um, basically, I think we're at a place where everybody knows that Dr. Kramer works for both sides. He has his bread buttered on both sides, and um, I think it's buttered more richly by the telecoms industry. So we definitely want to move away from the kinds of things that he does because we feel like he's so mixed up that he won't give us the best ordinance. The question is today, given that we know that, um, is Dr. Kramer writing the Malibu ordinance, ordinance according to the TLF template, according to his law firm's template? Can anyone answer that question? Can, I don't know how it works. Do you have to pose the question to the council and someone asks it? Or, but that would be a question that would be good to know. We can respond after the speakers are done. Okay, so that's the question. Is Doctor, has he been commissioned to write the ordinance according to the TLF template? Um, and if it, so that's two questions. Um, if so, who on the city council actually made that request? Did you vote on it? Who voted on that? If it was a yes or if they voted no. Um, and then thirdly, given that this group has gone to great lengths to provide a template which has been used by other cities to create an ordinance which would protect us in the way Malibu citizens would like to be protected. Um, can you please use that template? Um, I think Scott wrote it and I'm not sure of his last name, but I know that, that there is a template there and it's been sent to the city. Um, so if it's not being used, could you let us know why not? So those are maybe three or four questions there that it would be lovely to get some transparency here so that we know where everything stands. I think that's pretty much it. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Jessica. Our next speaker is Nicole McGinley. Nicole, you are unmuted. Oh, on this anniversary of the Woolsey fire, I personally am reminded to center myself in gratitude. And I'm grateful to all of those that stayed and to all of you for your service to our community and what have been two years of serious muscle and grit. I want to give back and I'm grateful to have had time recently to dedicate to the community to make up for those that are buried in their rebuild permits and that are in their rebuild process that are moving back into their homes that are doing remote learning with their kids and with their jobs. We're a very unique and special community and you know we're really we're forever bonded from these past two years together in Malibu. 
Um, so in an attempt to be extra clear, please bear with me and any redundancies. I just don't want to leave anything out. So Dr. Kramer and his firm, Telecom Law Firm, have two separate contracts with our city. One, the consulting contract, and two, a contract to update the wireless ordinance. Council reluctantly renewed the TLF consulting contract to avoid being left without a consultant and directed staff to issue an RFP in that same discussion. There were concerns about the TLF ordinance contract as well, but council was reminded that that was not the matter before them. So on Thursday, when we heard TLF was going to be updating our wireless ordinance, we were shocked. I mean, how can we justify this knowing what we know? All I see is more time and more application shot clocks expiring. And once they are up, they are up. And that's it. Months go by. It, it's going to be too late. And since our community figured there was no way Malibu would still go with the TLF after everything we've learned, we continued to work and to be ready with a revision. We incorporated developments. Um, we incorporated comments heard during meetings and most importantly, a critical fire safety piece that was developed by Susan Foster and two RF engineers. Now, isn't it possible for the council members to put the ordinance that the community stands behind in the hands of a city attorney to review and then to let us know if there's any reason why it should not be adopted as drafted and provide any recommended or proposed revision so it can be adopted and put into Malibu format. Now, if you still are going to consider the TLF ordinance, we ask that you also put forward at the same time the community's proposed ordinance and just simply vote on which ordinance is more in line with Malibu's mission statement and that provides the city and its residents the most protection in our neighborhoods. We feel this is a reasonable and appropriate request. You just simply put them side by side if you still need to fulfill the TLF contract and then we can just see which is best. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Nicole. Our next speaker is Andy Lyon. All righty. Good evening. Um, first of all, I just wanted to, uh, well, congratulations to Bruce, Steve, and Paul on, on winning the, uh, I guess they're pretty much in there. I, I can't imagine any more votes are coming in uh, to being elected to city council. You guys up there, you, you dodged a bullet without me getting up there. So, but that's not going to be me uh, going away. I am uh, still here. Um, and I'm, I, I just want to thank everybody that supported me. I just can't, I looked at the last reading and I got 2,006 votes from Malibu residents, 2,006 votes. And I spent $150 running my campaign by myself. So that tells me there's a lot of people that wanted to be listened to by me to help Malibu get back on track. And, uh, just listening to everybody talk right before about this telecom thing and the 5G, I really hope that you listen to these people and do what they're asking instead of what, you know, it seems like what, oh, shocker, a, a conflict of interest at Malibu. Wow. It's, uh, that's nothing new. So I, I'd like to know if there is some kind of financial gain to the city from all these cell sites going up. That was one thing I asked before, and I don't think anybody answered it. Um, but anyways, you know, I'm just thinking about the uh, the, the two year anniversary at, of Woolsey also today. And that was one of the reasons I ran because of the way I was treated when I stayed behind and saved my house. And I don't think that if there was a fire today, that it would be any different because nothing has really gotten into a plan other than some evacuations with some really confusing numbers instead of location names. And if I was to stay behind right now, I'd probably be treated the same way by the sheriffs. I'd probably be, you know, left behind and left without resource, just like we were two years ago. And I really hope that you guys get it together for the next disaster so that it's not a, a repeat of that. Um, because that was just, that. that's my biggest thing. I mean, but, you know, you're getting awards and stuff for running a great ship here, um, you know, city manager and stuff like that. And with the uh, 
awards as, as a, a great city manager, but you know what? You failed me. You failed me two years ago. You failed everybody that was stuck behind here for 10 days. You were able to come and go and you didn't do anything for the people that were stuck behind. Nothing. We had to bring it. We had to like sit here and act like criminals. I mean, it's just do something for the residents of Malibu. Listen to them about the 5G. You guys that are on there still, do something. Listen to them. Don't make us come back and beg you at one o'clock in the morning to do the right thing and then and then have to thank you for doing the right thing after we've come back and hammered you and hammered you and hammered you to do the right thing. Andy, and you guys that are going off. Up. All right. Time's up. Thanks, Andy. Mayor Pearson, we had one speaker sign up after this item was called. Would you like to hear their comment? Okay, and I'll, uh, that's fine. And let me know if Bill showed up too. Yes, we'll hear from Scott Dietrich next and then try to circle back to Bill Sampson. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Mikey. Um, first of all, it is the two year anniversary of Woolsey. And in spite of the rather horrendous and stressful process that residents who are trying to rebuild have to go through, um, everything I'm hearing is that if you're in the county, they gave nothing to help those people and they are in such much worse shape than Mallow, who residents, so thank you. But to move on, I think any time a cable company, a wireless company, SCE, wants to do something in our city, we should make it clear that we are supporting an undergrounding effort. And as such, what we should do is require them to participate in that undergrounding effort and specifically that they cannot charge these outrageous amounts they want to tear up our, to um, when, when we're paying for the undergrounding, the residents are paying for it. There might be a small city contribution, but these companies, because they don't want to underground jack up the prices so high that they make it unfeasible. So we could certainly, anytime they wanna do something, they wanna put in these micro towers, fine. But if that neighborhood's going to underground, you can't charge them um, for it because it benefits you. It's gotta be actual cost. So there's something we can work into that to the resident's advantage. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> Our final speaker would be Bill Sampson, but he is still not present in the meeting. So that concludes public comment. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, we're back. Mickey? Say yes. I saw that Rosemary was in the meeting. Is maybe Bill trying to access through Rosemary's? Thing? Oh, okay, I didn't see that. Let's check. We can get that a shot with one of the Rosemary's. Good. Okay, thank you. So now, can you hear me? Yes, we can oh, okay. hear you. We had Bill signed up. So Wait. it's my turn now or, or Gerhard's turn? I think we got a different person and that's maybe trying to speak on a different item. I right. thought saw Rosemary Sampson in there, but. No, that's not me. <laughs> did, you, did you sign up to speak, uh, public speak, Rosemary? I, I think uh, Rosemary was remuted. Um, so we'll probably be able to come back to her if she signed up for a later item. Okay, okay. I'll maybe check with her when you can, if you can. I just, there's two Rosemary's in there. I thought one of them was Rosemary uh, Bill's wife, but I could be wrong, so I apologize. I don't know. I don't think either of those are Rosemary Sampson. Can't see her at the moment, but I can tell. I see Rosemary IHDE. 
Yes, that's me. And I'm on later, I believe. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, Rosemary. We'll, we'll get to you as quick as what item are you on? I know that she signed up for to speak on 5A and possibly others. Okay, great. Okay, we'll get back to you. All right, so are we done with public comment then? Yes, now we're on the city manager update. Okay, thank you. Uh, Reva, do you have an update? I do, thank you. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Um, I know this has been a very difficult day for everybody in our community. Um, it's been a difficult day for me and for our city staff as well. Um, and you know our hearts are with everyone and we are committed to helping everybody rebuild and rebuild as quickly as possible. Uh, for those of you who've had the opportunity to work with our planning staff and our building and safety department, you know that those people um, are here for the community to help them. If you haven't had the opportunity uh, to, to be and meet them and start your planning process, please contact us um, if you're having hurdles in any way. Um, I'm here to help and um, we want to do everything we can to get everybody back home. So uh, we hope that we've taken the lessons uh, that we learned to heart during Woolsey. Um, we've implemented many, many new things and changes in how we respond and the way we can help the community and um, I hope that you've all uh, been able to follow what we are doing in our public safety department uh, to be a better and safer mountain. Um, with that, I'd like to give our uh, COVID-19 update. Um, Los Angeles County is reporting on the Department of Public Health website today, 322, 207,000 positive cases with uh, 2,238 new cases. Uh, reported um, and a total of 7,172 deaths. In Malibu, our count stands at 120 positive cases, uh, which is up from uh, 115, which was the number I reported at the last meeting, um, and sadly still stands at three deaths. Our rebuild number, we have 270 uh, single family homes that have been approved by the planning department. We've issued 154 building permits and 16 homes completed. So uh, we're really looking forward to seeing those numbers go up and to get the more people back home. Um, I'm sure you've all noticed that we are still working on the Civic Center Way Improvement Project. Uh, the past few weeks, the contractor has been working on the section between Vista Pacifica and the condos, and they've regraded the road and are installing new curbs. We've also been working on improvements to the storm drain and we'll begin installing the retaining wall next week. Um, this week, they started the work between the condos and Webb Way, and they'll be placing a new curb along the south side of the street and installing a new storm drain in that section. Uh, we are uh, replacing the existing street light that's on Civic Center Way, uh, just near the condos, and that uh, new uh, street light will be dark uh, sky compliant, as the council had asked us to do. Um, we have had a lot of reports of new homeless encampments and are doing everything we can to work uh, with our homeless outreach workers and uh, the sheriff's department to stay ahead of that. Uh, this past Friday, there were encampments cleaned up at Legacy Park and near Surfrider. Um, and we also have on the meeting this evening, Lieutenant Jim Braden from the Last Hill Sheriff's Station. Um, so if the council has questions about uh, any of the uh, public safety issues facing uh, the city right now, he's available this evening to answer questions. Um, I did also want to give an update on the uh, compliance efforts that we've been doing with our gas stations on the dark sky ordinance. As the council will recall, the compliance for other properties was placed on hold with this year's budget, but we are still have on our work plan to complete the dark sky compliance for gas stations. And at this time, we have one gas station that has approved plans and four have been submitted and are under review. They're all working with our code enforcement and planning department to come into compliance. I just want to give that update. Um, we have tomorrow a um, public design meeting for the permanent skate park. There'll actually be two tomorrow, one at five o'clock and one at six o'clock, and you can get information on the city's website on those public meetings. Our temporary skate park is now open um, every day. Uh, we had previously not been open on weekends, and it is now open on weekends, and you can reserve uh, times to skate at the city's website. 
Um, and then last, we will be having a shred event on Saturday, November 21st from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at City Hall. Um, it will be uh, COVID uh, safe. And so we do ask that anybody coming to bring any documents uh, wears a mask and practice physical distancing. Um, so that concludes my comments, unless the council would like me to uh, address any of the speakers. And then again, I do have Lieutenant Braden um, on who's available to answer questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, Karen? Yes, um, Skylar? Yes, Karen, I mean, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's one thing I'd like to uh, ask Riva to address, um, and that is the uh, State Senate and State Assembly Pacific Coast Highway Task Force. Uh, I have a copy of a letter that was signed by Senator Henry Stern, Assembly Member Richard Bloom, and Senator Ben Allen dated November 6th to John Belinsky, who is the director of Caltrans. Um, and I believe that was in response to a letter that you sent to John Belinsky about a week before that, uh, about the events here of October 26th. And uh, a, another letter had been sent to, um, to the president of SoCal Edison regarding the same events on the 26th, the power outage, and the problems it caused here on the highway. So um, I was wondering if you could give us uh, more information about the PCH task force and anything that's happened since uh, this letter went out. Absolutely, thank you, council member. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, we, there's a group called the PCH Task Force. I think it stood up about, I wanna say about 10 years ago, and it's comprised um, of the uh, three state um, officials, uh, Senator Ben Allen, Senator Henry Stern, and Assembly Member um, Bloom um, has representatives uh, too from the this city council body um, and representatives from the Sheriff Department, California Highway Patrol, residents in the Pacific Palisades area, Santa Monica Police Department. And the idea is for all of us to get together several times a year um, to talk about problems that face us uh, on the Pacific Coast Highway Corridor. And uh, we had a meeting uh, several weeks ago and talked about a lot of the issues that had come up, including the power outage and um, all of those impacts of, of the um, signals that went out which were obviously incredibly frustrating since it was an unplanned power outage. And so um, I decided that, you know, since this is a state highway that is owned and operated by Caltrans, and while ultimately the permanent solution uh, to backup power of those signals will be solved with the city's signal synchronization project, um, that's a few years out. Um, so I did take it upon myself to send a letter to John Belinsky, who's the district director of Caltrans District 7, which uh, oversees um, this area. Um, asking him and Caltrans to come up with uh, redundant power to the signals that they own and operate and also sent a similar letter to Southern California Edison since they were the ones who uh, control turning the power on and off for us, uh, even if it is unplanned, um, and the hope that they could actually stand up and take responsibility for bringing uh, backup generators um, on trucks, which they have readily available into Malibu uh, when these uh, long power outages happen. Um, and so the elected officials saw that letter and took it upon themselves as representatives of the PCH task force to also ask um, Caltrans to do the same. So that's a summary of, of that. And I also have asked um, the city's lobbyist in Sacramento to work with uh, the Department of Transportation and Edison on this matter. Okay, thank you, Riva. Um, I also, uh, I'm not sure what's appropriate or not, um, but there were some very serious charges brought by our first public speaker tonight uh, that you and the city attorney have not responded to numerous emails from him. And I, I believe he means since the election. Um, and although the results have not been certified, it looks that uh, Mr. Silverstein will be uh, a city council member. Um, can you comment that either you or the city attorney have not responded to numerous emails and quote, I believe these were his words, have refused to be civil. 
Um, cer certainly, I'd be happy to. Uh, last week, um, when we learned who the uh, looked like the uh, council new council members would be, I picked up the phone and called. Um, Paul Grisanti, uh, Steve Uring, and Bruce Silverstein. I spoke to both Paul and Steve. I left a message for Bruce. Uh, when I didn't hear back from him, I sent him an email. Um, and then I didn't hear from him on that email, so I sent him another email um, to which he responded that he and I was asking to meet with him and you know go over uh, different uh, items that that he'll need to know uh, as he becomes city council. And uh, he said that he would only meet with me if we recorded um, the meeting. And so I responded again today that I was happy to meet with him at his convenience. And again, he reiterated in writing that he will only meet with me if we recorded it. Again, I stand available to meet with him uh, to go over the many uh, different issues. As all of you know, so, as that you met with me when you became council members, that uh, we need to go over uh, you know, a lot of mundane uh, housekeeping issues. So uh, stand available to meet with him um, and certainly um, you know, can't, can't speak to it and, and that, and I'm sure the city attorney can answer the other part. Thank you. Did you want me to jump in there? Go ahead, why not? <laughs> so um, mine's a little different story. As city attorney, you know, I represent the city itself. Um, and that means that part of my job is to protect the public's right to access to the government. And I know you all know that I take that role very seriously. And the Brown Act um, is that central um, law. It's one of the key ways that we make sure that the residents um, have the ability to participate in government. Um, the Brown Act applies to newly elected city council members even before they um, take office. And if you think about it, that makes sense because it kind of closes up a loophole where, you know, a majority of the council which just elected might, you know, uh, make some decisions outside of the public view if that weren't the case. But it's not something that you might necessarily guess. And so I always make it a habit to... Um, give a heads up to newly elected council members that the Brown Act um, applies to them to avoid that um, situation and make sure that the public isn't in any way locked out of the deliberations. And um, so I did that. I sent um, a copy of a, a little how to avoid serial meetings and an explanation about um, social media and some other things um, relating to the Brown Act. I sent it to uh, council members elect or presumptive council members elect uh, Silverstein, Uring, and Grisanti. I did it at the point where it was uh, pretty clear that that was the likely outcome. And you know that I believe is the most protective of the residents. So I gave my best resident-centered, pro-public um, access legal advice to all of the uh, council members elect and um, Councilman uh, Alex Silverstein, Bruce is the only one who's kind of pushed back on that. Um, he, uh, he, wa he wants to know exactly when he crosses over that line to be elected. And um, I'm confident that I've given him um, the best advice that's um, accurate and that is in the best interests of the Malibu residents. And so I feel like pretty much that's where my job ends. So I don't, I don't know what good it does to engage in some kind of legal dispute. I gave my advice like I give to you sometimes. Okay, uh, Karen, did you have more? Thank you. Um, yeah, just um, some things I'd like to say also. Um, for, for anyone who did not tune in at 5.30 for our um, two year anniversary of the Woolsey Fire commemorative video, um, it was very sobering. Um, it brought us back to where we were two years ago today and tonight, um, and a lot of pain associated with that and, and a huge amount of loss, um, to everybody in this city, wherever you are in your loss, um, whether you already have a certificate of occupancy or, uh, you're waiting on a permit, uh, or if you haven't applied yet, uh, if you've gotten your permit and you're in the process of building, please know that the city is ready to help you at all times. Many of us council members are, 
by all means, the city manager is, uh, any of the city staff. So um, as was said earlier, if you're stuck somewhere, please let it be known. Mikey has said many times, I can't read your mind. Um, and I'll just state that again on behalf of all of us. Please let us know how we can help you, uh, how we can help you move forward. Um, the city's put a lot of uh, emergency response plans into action and, and uh, you know, we can only learn every day and anticipate what the next one will be. And it, it could be something without any warning. It could be an earthquake that happens tonight. Um, so, so we may not get a heads up on the next one. Um, but I, I want everybody to know that we realize it's not finished for most people. And we want you to know that we want to help you move ahead. So please take us up on that. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, for everybody who spoke about 5G um, and those uh, WCF installations, I know Christy, our city attorney, has explained uh, our. Uh, our position within the law and within federal law. And we may have to ask for that again, um, a reiteration of that. Um, John McGinley, my longtime neighbor, sobering video clip you showed us. Um, I appreciate that. And I wouldn't have known about it had you not brought it uh, to our attention tonight. Um, so, I don't think we're finished on this matter. Uh, I'll say, I see Christy right there. I don't know, Christy, is it appropriate for you to comment on this right now? Um, yeah, if I might, I just jump in a little bit. Obviously this is not on our agenda, so we're not gonna have a whole discussion, but let me just say a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, the city can spruce up those postcards for sure. I know it's a small matter, but I think it is hugely important that they get the attention of the recipients and I heard um, the speakers say that, you know, they looked a little bit too much like the film permitting one. So um, that's obviously the city manager's um, domain, but I know she was listening carefully too, and I'm sure took notes. There's nothing you have to do, but I just wanted you to know that we, we heard that, um, that note. Um, and then also to let you know that today, um, Adrian and Richard in the planning department and Trevor um, met with Nicole and with um, Scott McCullough and and talked about the process for the um, ordinance review. I've talked to Scott myself several times. Um, as soon as we get the work product from Jonathan Kramer, we agreed to um, all sit down and uh, compare it with what Scott's done and uh, make sure that you're uh, given the most protective um, resident centered ordinance the law will allow. And, if there's a little places where you might be able to push the law, we'll tell you that risk and give you that opportunity. So we're ready to do it as soon as we um, get something back um, from uh, Jonathan Kramer. And that, that's kind of where that goes. But I didn't want you to think, and I don't want anyone out there to think that we're just kind of sitting around. We, we are actively looking at it. And um, we've got, you know, my firm has a team of experts who only represent on the city side. so. Um, we know uh, which side our bread is buttered on, so to speak. Um, so you'll get that back as soon as we can. And I, I know um, it's been a long time, but it just hasn't gotten to our desk yet, my desk yet. Okay, thank you, Christy. Um, as far as a report of my activity, since we just met on Thursday, I don't really have anything new, committee meetings or anything since then. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Jefferson? Oh, thank you, Mikey. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, I have a list of quick comments to make. I'm in contact with uh, city members and uh, mem members of uh, the community. Um, I received this letter, which I will share with you uh, as soon as I give it to the city attorney or the city manager. Uh, it's about Joe Edmiston's activities uh, on Escondido. Once again, um, he uh, 
promotes his abilities to create trails where he sees fit. Um, and I was on the trails commission for four years. And this trail that has been created was not on the adopted trails committee's ledger. I will be brief. It's one paragraph long. Please bear with me. Hi, Reva and Bonnie. I'm reading this word for word. Would you please get together with Christy and set this matter straight and have us a better understanding of what is going on? Enclosed is a map that was just posted on MRCA website that displays a fraudulent trail that created a public trail along Via Escondido Drive and adjoining property. In addition, the trail does not exist on any of the Malibu City adopted trail maps. I will verify that. We are asking the city of Malibu to facilitate the immediate removal of the fraudulent Via Escondido trail from the MRCA website. It is causing great confusion with the general public and endangers our neighborhood character. Thank you, concerned neighbors and members of the Sycamore Park group. That's, uh, so I'll leave that till later. Uh, also, I heard from the Trancus Riders and Ropers about their lease and their insurance uh, issues that they are having. They have been asked, as I've been informed, to increase their insurance binder, indemnifying the city for $2 million when it used to be at $1 million, and that they feel that's onerous because they cannot put on events with COVID and they have not been putting on events. A lot of their equipment was burned in the fire that they have not replaced yet. So I would like to reach out to either the council or the city manager and look at the reasons why they're at being asked to increase their uh, participation of insurance. I know it sounds like a small matter to many, but the Trancus Riders and Ropers have been a long time entity here in the city. So I hope we'll follow up on that. Um, then the rumor started that the reason they're raising the rates, <clears throat> and this is the rumor part, is because somebody's looking for a place to park motorhomes that uh, are on the highway, and uh, this could be one of those sites or put homeless. So when I hear these things, I bring them up so that we can address them. If it doesn't happen this evening, I know at the next meeting, we will have time to furnish them with a reliable response to the request. Um, as far as my participation in any meeting since Thursday, I've had none. Um, Bruce, to, to help you understand how it all works here, um, I've always had um, rocky relationships on council, but diplomacy uh, takes us a path that we should follow. And that is, uh, I have always used dialogue, the phone, or on occasion emails, and if you state the situation, and this is just a suggestion, if you state what the situation is and your under understanding or lack of understanding and allow somebody to interpret or engage with you, uh, you may get satisfaction to your uh, requests. So even though I may have had ups and downs with the city manager or the city attorney or the council, uh, we always tend to resolve it through dialogue. So I hope that we can come to that level before you take your oath of, oath of office. And you can contact me. I know we haven't any contact, but uh, please give me a holler if you have some issues and I'll try and work on it with you. As far as the uh, 5G folks, I did meet um, uh, extensively with Nicole McGinley. She furnished me with the 60-page uh, draft. I did not get to read the whole draft. It, it's uh, kind of out of my league. But I did adopt 60, the 60 pages. Um, I did read certain parts that had what I felt was pertinent positions. I try and relate it to my education on 5G, which uh, only pertains to uh, neuroceptor receptors in uh, pollinators. So that's my only knowledge on a lot of this. I, I told her that um, our, our meeting was, uh, was a good meeting, and I asked her to speak tonight with her concerns. And um, I guess that's about it for me. Thank you very much, Mikey. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, Rick. Uh, Christy, um, 
I'm glad to hear that you met with uh, the 5G experts out there in the community and their representative on drafting the ordinance because I was a little, um, you know, after the last time we talked about this at, at, at length, they brought up some excellent points. I mean, it, <laughs> and it's sort of reinforced by that video right now, though, the old fox watching the hen house thing. So I'm thank you for meeting with them. And, but one of the things that was brought up this evening by um, John, I think John McGinley was, what about this urgency ordinance? You know, it's like, well, well, is there anything we can do to put this stuff on hold? They're naturally concerned about all these fast tracking of these um, wireless things that are going on. Is there anything we can do like that um, until we get this new ordinance? Is that something we can do? Um, well, you can adopt an ordinance. The, um, the difficult issue is that it won't stop the shot clocks. And so it won't have the effect that we need it to have. You know, I talked a long time with Scott about this and I, Scott McCullough, their lawyer expert, and um, I I'm feel pretty confident we're on the same page about this, that a speed toward getting our modernized ordinance is probably a better outcome um, than that. I mean, we, we would spend a lot of time and then we would just be in a situation where the, um, the uh, carriers would be claiming that they have a right to put things up that are, don't follow any rules because you know, we would have said it was in a moratorium, but the shot cop would have been expired. So a lot, you know, a lot of the cities that have done that aren't facing the same uh, number of applicants or applications at all that we are. So we're in a higher risk situation. So I think we're on the right track in terms of um, the direction we're going. It's just the speed hasn't been, um, we're still at 4G speed apparently. Are we, um, but speed of completion of the ordinance, how are we doing with that? When, when's it, what's the ETA on that? I haven't seen it. And I, I mean, I'm committed to turning it around and, and Scott and I are committed to talk to each other, deal with the turnaround right away. We're ready. We've been through the um, draft that he's prepared. Um, you know, I mean, it's, that's it. I, and I don't know, maybe the city manager has an update. I, I'm not managing the other contract, so I don't know what the status of it is. Um, Councilmember Mullen, we're working on the staff level to develop a timeline um, that we will promote, push out on the city's website. Um, I talked to staff about that this morning um, because I know these questions keep coming up and I've spoken to a lot of the residents about it as well. Um, so I think what we need to do is just lay out a timeline. Um, obviously, any ordinance that we're going to bring forward uh, would most likely need to go through Zeracis and the Planning Commission. Um, so I just want to lay out all those tentative meetings. Um, but uh, the consultant is working on it, um, as the city attorney said, and we're moving along as fast as we possibly can. But you can understand their concerns. It's the guy who may be dragging his feet on this is the same with the guy who's given the videos about how to fast track stuff through unsuspecting small municipalities. So um, I completely understand. And you know, that's the, some consult concerns, some the consultant bad. that we have right now, um, obviously, um, you know, if we, the council wants to make a change, we're ready to stand by that as well. Um, but we are on it and um, doing everything we can to move it forward quickly. I understand the urgency and the, and the concerns for sure. Well, Christy, I would thank you for meeting with them. And uh, I hope you continue to meet with them. And I thank all the engaged residents of the community for bringing this to our attention and educating us on all of these aspects of this and please stay engaged and um let's all communicate about this it's important i think it's important and thank you for all of those who brought it forward and that's really the only thing i, I wanted to say thanks okay thank you rick um skyler thank you mikey um, thank you, uh, Riva and Christy, for or everyone just for kind of uh, getting some of the questions answered for the, the wireless stuff and whatnot, um, and some of the other people for, in public comment. Um, John, if you're still there, I'd just ask if you could send me the link to that video. I don't know, but, um, but I'll, I'll email about you that. I will email you about that separately. Um, uh, Bruce. You had a 
you've raised a couple of concerns in your various emails to us. Um, I would suggest that you meet with Riva sooner than later so that you can be brought up to speed on any things. If you need to contact me directly, I'm sure, or any of the council members and have questions about things, we are all available for that. But um, to, to come out and say emails and say that you trust nothing that our city attorney says and things along those lines, um, I, I don't think is good leadership. So I would, uh, request that you meet with Christy directly and meet with Riva um, before making more allegations like that. Cause I, I don't, I, first off, I think that they're not valid. And I think that you will learn a lot from, from meeting with them. Um, that's what I have. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Skylar. Um, okay. I see Jim Braden here, our Lieutenant. Um, and uh, he looks like anxious to talk. <laughs> Jim, uh, thank you for being here. Um, can I just ask you for a little uh, update on what you're dealing with? And obviously, uh, if you want to touch on the homeless part of it, that would be welcome. Uh, or anything else on your mind? I appreciate you being here. Well, the um, we've been working. Uh, we had a meeting about, uh, a couple weeks ago. So my chief, the Cap Captain Becerra, um, the city manager, uh, who else was on there? I think we had five representatives from Sheila Kuehl's office. We had um, our host team, Jeff Dietrich, the lieutenant from the host team. They came out to Malibu and did an assessment. Um, we're in talks with the city, uh, city manager. Um, we're talking about uh, possibly focusing resources on just the issues with the homeless. And part of it is getting resources, making them aware of all the resources available and try to have as much impact as possible that, that we're legally able to do on throughout Malibu. So it's a difficult issue. You know, I, I've studied it through different communities and things and uh, trying to see what's effective and what's not effective. Um, so we're, we're working with that. And uh, I participated in that PCH task force meeting. And uh, I also, the, the crashes, um, sites were up for the year. We have different conditions because of the pandemic. Uh, we had more speeding, more, uh, the crashes were down a little, but they should have been way down because of the uh, lack of commuter traffic and things, but, but it really wasn't. Uh, I think a lot of people use the beach as their getaway during the pandemic. So um, we're dealing with that too. But I did voice my concern in that meeting for the motorhomes parking along the coast, concerns about where their sewage goes, um, concerns about trash, everything else, homeless encampments. So it's something we're working on. It's the issue. Thank you. I uh, I appreciate Appreciate the update. I see Jefferson has a question. Go ahead, Jefferson. Thank you, Mike, for uh, letting me speak before you get to speak about uh, what you've got on your mind. Uh, no, please. Uh, Jim, That um, is there a plan that you might be able to work with us on uh, at the council level for the next month or so before we're all gone uh, to uh, talk to us about how you can enforce the laws on the motorhome parking at Corral and Zuma because we do have the signs coming through uh, through Coastal, and we will eventually be posting our signs. And will we have the resources that you mentioned several times to cite these motorhomes that are not complying with the new rules that will be coming forward soon? Thank you. Yeah, Jefferson, uh, that's part of our talk, talks also. And we'll make sure that we have the resources out there and we can enforce um, the signage and everything else and, and do as much as we can so it has a minimal impact on the community. The, uh, and that's what I'm in talks with uh, the city manager and stuff and they're open to, to uh, um, additional resources it, that allows me to have people specifically focus on something. So yeah, we, we are working on it. Um, 
Council Member Wagner, I just wanted to let you know that I have been talking with Lieutenant Braden and Captain Becerra about uh, the cost of adding some resources to uh, our team for a temporary uh, period of time, uh, looking at uh, possibly adding two deputies during the PM shift, uh, which certainly would help address all of the, or, or some of the nighttime parking issues that we have, and also looking at the cost of getting some additional resources of the host team. Um, I don't know if that's something we'll be able to uh, squeeze into the budget, but definitely looking at all that and have a proposal from the lieutenant at this time. Um, we are just as an update on the coastal development permit for the parking restriction signs um, along Corral and Zuma. Uh, those are with uh, the Coastal Commission and that appeal period ends on November 17th. So uh, fingers crossed that uh, we'll be able to post signs uh, shortly thereafter and uh, hopefully make a difference there. Thank you for the update, Reva. Okay, um, and thank you, thank you, Jim. Any anything else going on to, that you want to talk about? <clears throat> okay. Um, <laughs> no, we had quite a pursuit the other night with a truck through Malibu Canyon, and. Uh, um, we were able to cut off the southbound traffic and we tried to spike strip the truck and a uh, deputy actually tried to pit a uh, pit maneuver on the truck. And uh, when it got out to the freeway and the 101, then I turned it over to the CHP. But um, we have a lot of activity in the evening hours and uh, I'm still working on, on early mornings and uh, um the deputies are serving your communities well, I'll tell you that. The, uh, uh, and like Jefferson said, we'll make sure we have the resources that we can have as much impact as we legally can with, with all this homeless issue and also the motorhome issue throughout Malibu. Okay. Can I, let me ask you one more question. It, there seems to be an increase in, on um, illegally mufflered vehicles and motorcycles and in town um how do how does a community go about dealing with that is that a, a special officer um i've heard we used to have uh, some sort of machine that could measure that sound how, do, how does that work how do, how do we make progress on that well mikey at a lost hills i don't think they ever had a actual machine there is several different laws we can focus on and that's something I can work with. Uh, there's a Sergeant uh, Travis Kelly at, at Lost Hill Station. And we can put together some uh, impact areas. I've talked to different residents. And even in the Lanita area and Trancas area in the summer, we used some of our beach resources when they were available to do impacts on, on just that. Loud motorcycles, loud cars. You know, in the pandemic, too, I think we have more of that than ever right now because we have more car clubs coming out. We have more motorcycles coming out. I think with a lot of things closed in different communities um, that uh, the beach area, the coast area has become more of an attraction even for people. You mean that historically large amount of traffic we had? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Jim. I, I really, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks. But I'll, thanks. I'll talk. I'll talk to Travis about it too, and, and we can put something together to where we we do have some focus teams, and and it's not that we need extra resources for everything. So, just like you mentioning that, we can direct resources, people you're already paying for, to focus on some of these things. And even like Jefferson said about that signage, you guys already pay for resources. It's about properly directing the resources so we can have as much impact as possible. And like the city manager said, we are in talks about adding different things that possibly could have or could impact and minimize some of the effects in the community from some of these things going on uh, with homeless, the motorhomes, a uh, large number of people coming to the coast, all these things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. All right, thanks. Um, Jefferson, I have a quick 
question of you. You mentioned about Trinker riders and ropers. Is that still the lot just by the bridge or is it a different lot now? Sorry, Mikey. Trankus uh, riders, ropers, uh, and the, the horse groups have a uh, the facility up at the west end, uh, across from the Chumash. The um, oh, uh, across IO up there. That's they have a lease a whole a lease up there, and that's where they operate out of. Is that the old tennis club? That place. Oh wow. Okay, I hadn't I hadn't heard anything about that rumor before, so I was just curious what that was. So I thought I would expose it, and then we could. Talk <laughs> city manager can deal with it there you go there you go um and christy maybe reeve i don't know um just, just so it doesn't i i just want to explore a little bit more ad infinitum on the 5g um i agree with where rick's coming from is is it possible we pass an urgency ordinance till we get to another ordinance, um, a, a one that's, you know, I'm not sure how to word this, to be honest. Um, is there anything we can do? Because if if we're waiting for Kramer, that worries me a little bit, because, you know, just, um, I mean, I guess his reputation is not real good, and, and not in this community. So um, as they have presented an ordinance, and I, I know you've, I gather you've seen it, um, is there any way to adopt that in an interim basis and are along those lines that would make sense to sort of deal with this issue now until we can properly fully deal with it all the way? Well, again, it's not on your agenda tonight, but I, if what you're saying is, um, you know, push forward the community one, that's just a matter of uh, agenda. That's all in your hands. I'd be happy to, um, take the lead to get that together, but you know, it's up to you to decide that. So okay. I have a kick this back and uh, you're still the mayor. So when we do the next agenda round of discussion that we can talk with the city manager about what kind of resources that would take. Okay. 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 Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, that answers, that answers that for me. I appreciate it. Um, Lastly, I uh, maybe not almost lastly, I know we just need to move on here, but um, just in general about getting through the selection and post-election, it's, um, it's a learning curve. It's a learning curve being on city council. Um, government isn't easy. Um, a lot of the mechanisms are not easy and they're not always logical. There's a basis for it and some things have to be earned. And I would reflect back to what Jefferson said that really good communication is key. And for myself, I find that fluid communication is key. The ability to sort of trade ideas, um, try and figure things out, the ability to form that kind of relationship where things move forward. And I'll tell you, you don't always hear what you want you know, I want, I want tomorrow morning, we go out and go, yeah, 5G, we're done. But, you know, so, you know, you gotta, you gotta work for some of this. You gotta figure it out. And sometimes um, it can be, it can be a little tricky. There's a lot of priorities going on. We have, I'm going to guess 25 approved projects. We're not even talking about now that are sitting there waiting for us. So it's an overwhelm of bureaucracy, even in a small city especially with two huge disasters in a row. It doesn't, certainly doesn't help um, and the related financial issues. So I find fluid dialogue um, is, is important, ongoing, um, impromptu at times, but that's me. That's, that's, that's what works for me. And um, I just want to thank the staff again for everything they did on the two year anniversary, a tough, tough, uh, tough day for me. As I said, at the earlier meeting um, brought back a lot of, a lot of uh, intense emotions, intensely difficult time. Um, it, it was difficult on so many levels. Um, and um, I always think Mr. Dietrich Scott said something about or 
somebody, maybe it was Andy actually, you know, it was hard in many ways with the sheriff getting in, lots of sheriffs from other cities. And as I've, you know, I almost got arrested. <laughs> um, <laughs> and honestly, I was okay if I did, because I knew what I had to do and the sheriff knew what they had to do. Difficult situation that, you know, isn't even always up to, to Jim or even, even our captain. So um, lots to always do there. We never can stop working on improving that situation um, on disaster preparedness, fire preparedness. And um, well, I'll, I'll comment on that just for a moment, if you don't mind. We have a way of just moving on at some point. So um, we got it. We got to keep, we got to keep on this. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jim, want to say something? Oh, Jim, go ahead. Um, no, all, all I wanted to say is that disaster preparedness and what you said about it's a continual thing. And that's the truth of it. The, um, I was in the field on the day of that Woolsey fire, and I was in the field all week after it. And it was a, a very uh, memorable day. And when you say, oh, this is the two year anniversary, uh, I remember vividly um, going through Malibu and look at, at the destruction and the destruction going on and trying to make the best of the situation we had. And just like you mentioned uh, earthquake, uh, Karen mentioned the earthquake, it, the community needs to prepare for these things. Um, the Woolsey fire, we saw that that you got as much resources as were available um, in an earthquake, uh, we could be very strapped for resources. So it's very important that, that the residents think in that fashion, hey, what would I do in this situation? What would I need? Because that is extremely important. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks a lot, Jim. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. And with that, I'm gonna move us forward to the consent calendar. Um, do we have city council members that want to pull anything? Okay, do we have members of the public that want to pull anything? We have one item pulled by the public. It's item number 3B4. Three. Well, Mike, can I make a motion to approve the consent calendar pulling item 3B4? Second. Okay, can we have roll call on that, please? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Fair? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yeah. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, can we have a brief, I don't know what, I don't know if we need a report or we can just go to the speaker, but on a, we are talking about the award on Doom Drive and Fernhill Drive of the Speed Humps Project. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor, I, I'm, this is for the award of the Doom Drive and Fernhill Speed Humps, and um, I'm available for questions. Okay. Um, well, let's let's bring in our public speaker. We have one speaker on this item. It's Ryan Embry. Okay. Hey, Ryan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? I can, Ryan. Okay. I wanted to, um, first of all, ask if the Coastal Commission has uh, approved of this um, permit, because we, as a city, got in some extremely hot water with the Coastal Commission in the 90s, simply for putting some boulders along, I think it was Cliffside um, and Birdview, and for erecting signs that said no parking in an existing no parking district that was established by Los Angeles County. And never mind that there'd be no parking there. The Coastal Commission said, well, it was tradition that people would violate the no parking and park there and go to the coast in California. And they sued um, the city and it was in litigation. Uh, Christy handled it. Uh, we settled, which uh, I did not agree with because we ended up funding, I think, 10 years of a ghost shuttle and it cost the city hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
So before the city embarks on awarding this contract, I would urge you to get the consent or approval from the Coastal Commission on this issue because I pretty much think you're going to get comments and you might be able to survive a challenge. Beyond that, uh, the transparency didn't occur in this process because the city has a council policy, a city council policy, which both the city council and the staff were supposed to abide by. And that's policy number 45 called the neighborhood traffic planning process. And that required a threshold of petitioners, the property owners on the street segments to qualify for the proposed change, which in this case is speed humps. And the industry practice for traffic planning and traffic calming is that only street segments with prima facie 25 mile per hour street segments qualify for speed humps. If you have a collector road or an arterial road, road with lots of traffic or a higher speed limit, then the conditions need to be enforced with active traffic law enforcement because the speed humps do severely impact the uh, response for emergency fire ambulance paramedics and the evacuation of the patient uh, in ambulance. And the five minute mark is when brain damage sets in. And no, no changes have occurred since the city uh, evaluating speed humps on Doom Drive back in the 90s. And so I'd urge you to get coastal approval prior to proceeding by placing this item for uh, consideration um, maybe a month from now. Brian, your time is up. Until you have approval from the coastal. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you Ryan. I appreciate it. Um, any more public speakers? That concludes public comment on this item. Okay, um, Rob, I know parts of what Ryan has just said, we sort of discussed a little bit before. Could you kind of reply to uh, his comments? And then I see Skylar has a question hey, afterwards. Skylar's got something first, or do you want to? I was just going to ask if, um, or even Rob or Christy, if we normally get uh, coastal development permit or did for the speed humps that are already on Point Doom or the ones on Malibu Road. So and, and or even if that's needed, I'm not aware that it's needed because it's like a repaving thing and you're not, but I don't know. So I, I think I saw Richard pop up in there. I think he'll give a, another explanation on coastal development permits for this work. So I'll have Richard bring this up. Under the Coastal Act, there's a provision for uh, roadway maintenance of uh, it's in public infrastructure maintenance and repairs. And my understanding from this, and also working with our previous city manager, uh, where the concern lies that the Coastal Commission would get involved in is if we did something that affected public access. So this would be some sort of new restriping or a new development that would impact the ability of parking as, as Ryan Embry brought up earlier in his discussion on the rocks. Uh, but something in the roadway like this, it's a restriping and repavement project uh, typically falls under the exemptions. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and then the next question Ryan raised in regards to the, the study and whatnot, I thought we had gotten a handful of signatures. I know that we did a long time ago um, in that area, but this is going back to be 2012 or 2013. So I don't know if any of that stuff had gotten updated. And then I just was also going to say that I had received, I've received a lot of verbal comments from people um, on those streets uh, for years, but more recently, because obviously this came up about three or four months ago, maybe six months ago, maybe longer than that. Um, about it and they were really angry as to why they felt like the city just dropped the ball on it and didn't do it and they were very frustrated at the speeds that people have been driving and walking their children and not feeling safe on those streets um, especially with all the uh, construction from the fire 
uh, and larger vehicles that were on those roads. So I was just going to add that, but asking the question about the, you know, whatever the, I forget the policy that was referenced, maybe. 45. 45. So that policy that was talked about was speed humps and, and uh, uh, Skyler, that you know that's pretty well. The, the, the procedure that was put in place is for the public's request to put speed humps in their neighborhood. This item was brought up by the Public Safety Commission probably, um, I think it's maybe January or February, right before um, COVID really hit hard. And um, in July, this item was brought to council. We had a meeting, we discussed it. Um, and it was council that directed staff to go ahead and put speed ups in this area. In the meantime, I've had several residents um, in, in the area and particularly on Birdview, I think, I think it was Birdview, where they requested speed humps. They've got a substantial amount of um, signatures and, and approval. Um, the property owner that was leading that really did a really good job, reached out to a lot of people in that neighborhood, not just on Birdview, but just for the whole area in great support for speed humps. And so um, it, it's been through the public process, through the Public Safety Commission. It's been a council, we discussed it. We, um, so it's been that route. Um, like I mentioned, it's that route is a little different than when the public requests it, where in this case, the Public Safety Commission re requests the speed humps from there. So I hope that answers your question. It does very much so, thank you very much. Any other comments or questions or a motion? I'll make a motion to uh, award the contract and get some speed humps on those streets as soon as possible. I'll second that. And I just want to note that there are speed humps on Ocean Avenue in Santa Monica. So I, this is not going to impede the ability of first responders at all. There you go. Um, can we have roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mellon? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. And now we're moving on to long delayed item 5A, Big Rock Mesa Landslide Assessment District update. Um, I see Rob sitting there, so I'm assuming you're taking the lead on this one. Yeah, you got me back to back, so. Excellent, um, lucky us, excellent. So good evening, council. Tonight we have an update on the Big Rock Mesa Landside Assessment District. Uh, last spring, we had a the contract for the operation in May was set to expire in July. So um, the city requested some proposals for, from consultants. Um, we also set out to have two representatives within the Big Rock community be part of the selection committee that selects the consultants. And we went through consultant interviews, we evaluated their proposals, and the selection committee selected Yay and Associates as the most qualified consultant. Um, Yay and Associates started the work up in the Big Rock, it started in July. And one of their first items of work that I had them do is really go through um, not, not only the Big Rock, but also the other two assessment districts that they're be, uh, monitoring, which is Cala de Barco and Malibu Road, do a full inventory of all the equipment and unite on the equipment and provide recommendations on what tasks and what items need to be done to really improve um, that assessment district, so specifically the Big Rock Mesa Landside Assessment District. So, so tonight I, I have Lori Berry from Yane Associates. She's going to give a presentation on um, the update for um, Big Rock. And um, then following that, there are some recommendations how, how to move forward. So, so with that, I'll give it to, Bear, to uh, Lori Berry. Hi, good evening. I think I'm gonna share my screen here, um, screen two. Okay. 
Okay. Excuse me, just let me minimize this. So good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. My name is Lori Berry and I'm a, I'm a senior project manager and engineer with EA and Associates. And I'm here to present council with a project update and uh, some recommendations for improving the Big Rock Mesa landslide assessment district. I don't wanna go uh, spend a lot of time about our forum, but I, I, what I did wanna emphasize is that we have a team of 160 geologists, engineers, and construction personnel with decades of experience in monitoring, evaluating, and managing large-scale landslides. Um, I just wanna point out our key personnel for this project is, is myself as the project manager. Nick Simon is our field geologist, and he's the one you see uh, waving to you and, and doing a, a, the lion's share of the field work. Um, and our team is also rounded by John Duffy, who's um, a senior civil engineer, um, um, excuse me, a senior uh, engineering geologist that um, has spent uh, most of his career at Caltrans. And he has worked on some of the largest landslides throughout the state of California with his 30 years at Caltrans. Well, I wanted to provide, uh, provide just a brief history of the, of the Big Rock Mesa landslide assessment district and, and what its purpose is. Um, the photo here, uh, you can see the white outline is the assessment district boundary and the orange, uh, the orange outline, uh, the larger one is the, uh, the historic landslide that occurred in 1983. Um, the development began around the late 1940s in the Big Rock Mesa assessment district. Um, and then in 1983, the, the large um, main Big Rock Mesa landslide occurred. It was about 137 acres. Uh, between 1986 and 1996, um, different consultants did extensive exploration and, and studies and, and also installed uh, many of the existing dewatering facilities. The city of Malibu, that work was all done under um, the County of Los Angeles. In 1991, the, the city of Malibu was incorporated and then uh, following some, some storms um, in the late 90s, uh, the uh, current landslide assessment district 98-1 was, was formed by the city of Malibu. Now the purpose of the landslide assessment district is to maintain stability of the Big Rock Mesa by lowering groundwater uh, with a series of dewater with a dewatering system of wells and hydrogers. Uh, it's also we also monitor slope inclinometers and, and the water levels to assess the effectiveness of that dewatering. And then we also manage improvements to maintain, repair, and replace the dewatering and monitoring facilities. Uh, the key the key item about uh, managing this landslide is to control the water in versus the water out where in this case the water coming into the landslide assessment district is through imported water um, and then and as well, as well as uh, natural rainfall and precipitation and the way we get water out is through dewatering wells hydrogers natural evaporation and the, the surface storm drain system that, that collects and carries it out of the the land mass and, and out to uh, the appropriate outfalls. And I just wanted to emphasize here we are in, in um, mid 2020, late 2020, and we're still operating and maintaining the same um, landslide assessment district. So last spring, as, as Rob mentioned, Abe was selected as the city's consultant to maintain and monitor the Big Rock Mesa landslide assessment district. Um, we started our work in July, and to that end, we monitor and, monitor and measure the dewatering output um, measure the water levels, we survey the slope and clinometers, we maintain and repair equipment, or replace equipment under the capital improvement plan, um, and we also record rainfall and, and water usage. And what I want to emphasize, and I'll, I'll get into this a little later, is that um, based on the data we've reviewed and, and the information we've collected since we've um, began, is the water levels remain lower, the dewatering system is functioning and maintained, and there is no consistent discernible shear movement in nine kilometers. So we have been extremely busy since we've um, come on board in July. It's just been a few months. Um, we have monthly obligations to record the flow from the 23 dewatering wells. We've measured and recorded the discharge from the 37 hydrogers. Uh, we take the water level measurements from 29 standpipes and we collect and uh, test water quality samples uh, to become compliance with the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board and PDS permit, which has to do with discharging um, the water we're taking out of the, out of the system and, and discharging it into the Pacific Ocean. 
So we do that on a monthly basis. Um, we've also performed the baseline surveys on the inclinometers. We've performed a thorough inventory of all of the facilities. Um, we've scheduled maintenance on some hydrogger conveyance along PCH that we're, we're almost have our permit for. And, and then we've also completed maintenance and repairs on eight different dewatering wells within the Big Rock Mesa, doing different um, things that are within the scope of work, but um, repairing electrical trolls, um, pumps, um, things along those lines. I want to go through uh, sort of the result of, of our data a review and um, all that history and share some of the data trends that, that help us to wrap our heads around the district and to provide recommendations um, for the capital improvements. So the two sources of dewatering, um, like I talked about, are dewatering wells and hydrogers. The dewatering wells are an active system um, that uses a submersible pump, electric pump, to lower and maintain the water levels within the area surrounding the dewatering well. The hydrogers, on the other hand, those are the white pipes that you see sticking out of the, the bluff along the PCH. Those are a passive system. Um, they're simply a, a perforated uh, pipe that is drilled horizontally or a little bit at an angle into the hillside and it'll drain an area um, where water is present. There's been some concern that um, recent years, the, dis the overall discharge volume uh, coming out of the Big Rock Mesa has, has decreased and that that may indicate that um, there's problems with the facilities. Um, that, that is not the case. Um, if the water levels, the overall groundwater table is decreasing, that means that there's less surface area in the, in the well to um, recharge and, and so the amount coming out of those wells will be lower. The hydrogers also have a little bit, act a little differently than the dewatering wells. Um, we found that over time, or we found that many of the hydrogers um, will rapidly dewater a, a relatively confined area um, shortly after they're installed. And then that area will, those hydrogers will have very little or low production um, uh, from there. And then there's some uh, hydrogers that historically were, were installed and, and really never produced much water. So just kind of pointing to how complex the geology is and, and not all of these systems are as uh, predictable. And I just wanted to provide a, uh, uh, an example of, of the steep, um, the steep trend of, of as soon as the hydrogger is, is installed, there's a, a decline in dewatering production. So this is one that we still monitored today, H4. Um, you can see that when it was installed back in June in 1984, it was producing um, up to 14 gallons per minute, actually a little higher. Um, and then within just six months of December, it was, it was down to one gallon per minute. And this is the kind of the range of, of flow that we would see from this hydrogger today, is this low, a steady flow production. And I just want to show one more example of this trend where shortly after the hydrogger was installed, this is HD3, again installed in 1984. Um, really high productions as much as 80 gallons per minute. And then just by six months later, down to 20. And then it hit five gallons per minute about a, a year after install. And this one just happened, shows um, sort of how the, the data will, uh, how the hydrogers will reactivate in response to uh, rain events. Um, but again, these, these continue to flow, not nearly as high or at the same kind of volume as they did when they were installed, but um, they did do bring water out of the Mesa and we continue to monitor them. Another one of the um, one of the inputs that we look at going into the mesa is, is water as rainfall. Um, rainfall is something we cannot we don't have any control over, um, and uh, this is a plot of all of the the rainfall from 1968 to 2020. As you can see, despite um, and I'll, actually I'll stop back up that the average of this of this data set shows that the the average for those years is uh, about 15.4 inches. You can see here, oh, here we are in late um, 2020. Um, this is data from a few months ago, but the last three or to four years, we have had above average rainfall, yet we have not seen any um, a change in the dewatering uh, production. And just wanted to point out that it might take several years of above average rainfall in order to see that increase in water level where, where the dewatering production is, is uh, affected by it. Another data set we uh, consider is the water usage. This is, this is the largest source of water entering the Big Rock Mesa. Um, every month, uh, 
we record and the previous consultants record the, the master water meter. And so this is all the imported water that's used for the homes, irrigation, septic, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> we have data uh, dating all the way back to 1984. The, the blue squiggly line is, is, is that data taken monthly. Um, and then the black uh, is, is sort of a, <clears throat> excuse me, a weighted trend line that, that just helps you see the trend of, of this data because on an annual basis, you have obviously ups and downs in water usage. What I really wanted to point out um, here is that our water, the water usage, um, and I only had data through the end of 2019, um, is very similar. If you follow this, this point where, where we are near today and follow it back um, to 1984, the water usage of in the end of 2019 is very similar to the water, what the water consumption was in 1984. <clears throat> um, the dashed black line is a, is a true average, and, and you can see that the water usage uh, now is, is not only below the average, but again, it's close to 1984. Um, there's a concern about overall increase of water consumption, but, but you can see that that is not the case. Um, and, and even so that the water usage has trended down since 2014. And, and this is a, an attribute to um, really all the homeowners in the district to, to keep um, water conservation at the highest priority um, to limit the amount of water they're using for irrigation. And, uh, and that'll help keep the amount of water entering the district uh, to a minimal. So <clears throat> one way that we look at how the um, dewatering system is, is functioning is to look at the groundwater levels. And if they're going down, then that points us to that the, the system is, is functioning. So um, looking at the dewatering or the groundwater levels um, along with the slope and clinometer results is really our best tool for assessing the function and success of the dewatering system. So this table just provides a summary of different dewatering wells and standpipes um, throughout the Big Rock Mesa. It's not all of them. Um, it's sort of a sampling from each of the major sub areas. And um, what this table shows is the earliest readings that were taken from these facilities uh, that we could find in the research, most of which were in the early 1980s and one a little later here in 1991. And then in October, um, and Nick took uh, the more recent water levels from these same facilities that we're still monitoring today. And I wanna add that he also took these with the pumps turned off to try to get an example of what the true water table um, is. And here in this graph, I just wanna point out that um, the current water levels, you know, in the last few months, the present time is um, as much as 60, 150 feet lower than what the, the water levels were when the, these wells were installed. So you can see the water levels are, are significantly lower. You know, in another way, we can review the groundwater level data to help us understand where to make improvements through the district and how to over evaluate the overall success of the dewatering system is to kind of review those groundwater levels relative to the estimated groundwater tables that were presented in the main design documents that were published in 1992 in particular. Um, this is these five cross sections. These were um, prepared by Bing Yen and Associates in the main design document that supports the, uh, the dewatering of the Big Rock Mesa. And that's as far as we understand, that's the accepted document um, so that, that helps us understand the geohazards and the, and the um, stability of the mesa. So all I, what I did here is I just want to show you, so there's five, five slices essentially through the mesa, and these are right in the same locations from the Bing Yen published report. And what I did here is I um, went through each one, and all I did, I wanted to highlight here this dash blue, the dark blue dash line is the estimated groundwater table from 1983. And again, this is straight from the Binyan report. The lighter blue line is the, um, the estimated groundwater table in late October 1990, essentially the water table that um, was that Binyan had already been able to achieve um, with the amount of dewatering that was in at the time that they published their reports. So again, we're trying to get to this light blue line and even lower is, is really the goal of, of the dewatering. And so there's several wells and high, uh, wells and standpipes that still exist that, that are part of the system. Um, not all of these uh, lines on the section do exist, but what I did was highlight the ones that we're still monitoring as part of the existing scope. 
And what I did are these red lines is I put in a scaled measurement of the recent water levels, just to show kind of where we stand today relative to these um, 1992 uh, evaluations. So you can see from this cross section that um, all of the, the water levels we're able to obtain with, with the current system um, were not only below the 1983 um, level, which is when the landslide occurred, but were below the 1991 level, uh, and in many cases even lower. Um, there are a few instances here, there's another cross section where we're a little bit, we're, we're below the 1983, but um, a few areas a little bit higher um, or the similar to the 1991 levels. Um, kind of a similar case for cross-section CC. And then as we move further west, um, the ground the existing groundwater levels, again, noted by these red sticks, um, those are today's readings, are, are lower than the 1991 and, and well below the 1983 uh, estimated groundwater tables. And, and same situation here. So um, we looked at all of that information, uh, tried to put it into context, tried to you know, wrap our heads around what it means, looked at the water coming in, um, the rainfall, those trends, um, and then obviously look at the, the discharge. And um, just wanted to make a few statements relative to our scope of work, the following points I wanna make in response to some of the public letters and, and uh, reports prepared by E.D. Michael and, and other residents of the Big Rock. Um, the project dewatering wells and hydrographers are functioning. Um, the groundwater level measurements in the standpipes and dewatering wells indicate that in the 2020 water levels are well below the 1983 water levels and are near or below the 1991 water levels. That lower dewatering production over time combined with the lowered groundwater level that we're finding um, means that the dewatering system is functioning that the 2019 water usage and presumably now, uh, we just don't have that data available is similar to 1984. And that the sloping clinometer data does not reveal a consistent pattern of discernible shear movement. So the next steps for um, this fall and winter as we enter into the rainy season, uh, we'll be continuing our monthly monitoring per our scope of work, um, perform as needed maintenance to keep all the facilities operating and, and running. Um, we do our compliance testing and reporting for the regional water quality control permit. Um, we're also going to install some pressure transducers in a few select locations where we do want to continuously water monitor the groundwater over the next rain season. Um, and it'll help us interpret if some of the, the obscure readings are associated, just to help us, uh, I guess, resolve some, some erroneous readings and to just get a better handle on, on some of the locations with um, some inconsistent readings over the history. Um, we want to replace an electrical control box and we will start to do our hydrogger clean out. And so we have a plan moving forward and, and by looking at the all the existing data, um, we still have to kind of come up with a, a way that makes sense to figure out where to put new improvements, bigger projects, not just repairs and keeping everything going, but how do we um, increase and improve the dewatering system at Big Rock. So what we did was just develop a really simple way to kind of see things spatially. Um, we assigned a functionality status to each of the dewatering facilities um, where green means it's functioning and maintained, uh, yellow means it's functioning but, but flagged for some improvement, and red is not functioning. And I can go through this um, afterwards if you're interested. I, I wanted to go a little quicker um, through this presentation tonight but all of the dewatering wells are, are functioning and maintained. Um, there are a few that are flagged, a couple that are flagged for improvement that are, are considered yellow. Um, there are no red dewatering wells. And then um, the hydroggers, uh, there's our other means of dewatering the district um, are really a combination of, of generally green to yellow. And this kind of ties back to what I was saying that some produced, um, heavily, some produce only intermittently when it rains. We keep an eye on all of them. Um, and we propose to you know, flush them out to uh, get more production out of them. They, they do build up a scale and calcification. And uh, we will um, just wanted to point out that we kind of are using this system to help point out, um, to help figure out where we wanna do our capital improvements. So that ties me into um, sort of what I consider our 10 year capital improvement plan. Um, 
the facts regarding the existing assessment district and the capital improvement planning is that there's currently about $100,000 a year um, in the budget to do a capital improvement, which is intended for um, a major rehabilitation or replacement of a well, a hydrogger, or an inclinometer. Um, and, and based on this amount, um, really there's, there's only an opportunity to do one major improvement every few years. So essentially, if something costs two or three thousand, two, two or three hundred thousand dollars to replace a well, we have to wait a couple of years to save that funding from the capital improvement in order to put that well in. But then that takes away from some of the other repairs that would also be important um, to the district. So because of that timeline and, and the amount that's available right now, it's very really difficult to prioritize which facilities should get upgraded first or, or where um, we put in our next uh, deeper um, dewatering facility. So given that information though, um, you know, we still, uh, there we go. Yeah, actually this is just uh, again, reiterating the $100,000 that we're gonna use uh, that's set aside for, for this uh, 2021 fiscal year. Um, I already talked about the pressure transducers, um, the replacement box, the hydraulic flushing. So this is, this is the sort of a breakdown of our current um, year ahead. And then the next capital improvements you know, I showed you a few areas where those uh, the current water levels are a little bit above the, the 1991 levels, and we feel like that's an important area to, to install um, some new or replacement dewatering wells to get those water levels down deeper. Um, so that's what uh, one, three, and four are, are, are new dewatering wells to, to um, get more water out of the mesa. We have a, a plan to install three new hydroggers and then we wanna go through and rotate through and flush the hydroggers. So based on the estimated costs to do these things, um, we're looking at about 10 years to get uh, all of those done. <clears throat> so I presented, uh, we presented a similar presentation um, to this to the, as a general public meeting to the Big Rock Mesa Assessment District homeowner several weeks ago and presented recommendations uh, to improve the assessment district. And since then, we have met with the Big Rock Mesa Dewatering Committee to discuss these recommendations. And the slide that I'm that's up right now that I'm showing you is kind of re a result of those discussions and the items that we agreed would be the most important to implement um, as soon as possible to improve the landslide assessment district. So um, our recommendations uh, for improvements for the landslide assessment district is to the increase funding, to increase the capital improvement budget, um, to fully fund some of the well improvements, to increase funding for water quality testing and improvements, to increase funding to create a reserve fund. Um, and so this will provide adequate, adequate funding to perform the additional capital improvements we need um, to improve the water quality testing and also have a reserve fund um, to help with emergency situations. Um, this recommendation also includes um, a scope of work to in introduce a, a new type of uh, landslide monitoring technology called INSAR, which uses satellite data to um, record ground surface movement. And this would be done, um, this, this data would be collected uh, every 12 days. It's, it's part of a package. Um, it, it's, it's, um, we collect through the, the satellite company. And um, this information will be used in conjunction with the slope inclinometer data to help us recognize potential trends of ground movement, um, where those trends are occurring, um, and uh, help us prioritize locations for, for new upgrades and uh, will also to some extent provide an early warning of, of movement. We also want to uh, improve the surface drainage area along the Headscarp region and between the homes on Seaboard Avenue. Um, there's some existing storm drains out there and it's important that um, we reduce the amount of water entering the ground um, and, and, and collect it through the storm drain system uh, however possible, wherever possible. Um, there are some hiccups and, and uh, um, excuse me, um, um, just some difficulties with this particular item just because we would have to require, uh, have to acquire additional easements from private property owners and then also revisit these areas probably on an annual basis to clean them out and, and perform maintenance. So the other considerations that we shared with the uh, dewatering committee and, and at the public meeting, um, these items are, are things that would be um, are more would be more useful to 
increase the dewatering system to with to introduce newer technologies and some remote monitoring. And implementing these technologies would be kind of make this the district a little bit more slick, but they're not necessarily required to to maintain these lower groundwater levels. Um, nevertheless, it would be advantageous to start implementing newer technologies. So what we have here is is to replace the pumps and the flow meters with with digital. Uh, sensors that would eventually they could be connected to a small cellular device um, and the, the possibilities from there are endless it could be either that we're walking around and we can pick up the reading on our phone with a bluetooth and then event or we could put in some kind of a remote acquisition system so that you can actually monitor it from from home or from your office um, same thing with the slope inclinometers uh, to install sort of permanent um, slope inclinometers with with pressure transducers to, to implement that remote application. Uh, so the, the cost to, to do this all at once and to do it for all of the existing facilities is, is pretty costly. Um, and we would kind of prefer to use the money to do some of the, the more critical um, capital improvements to actually lower the dewatering. Um, but the benefit, uh, the nice thing about, about these is we can still introduce these slowly um, over time, a lot of these, if we have to replace the pump or we have to replace a meter, we can start replacing them with this higher end digital meter, digital, or a, a higher end pump that would eventually, once they kind of all turn over over a period of time, we can, we can start to do this remote monitoring. Um, another consideration that, that we discussed was um, to complete that proposed 10 year capital improvement plan um, all, all up, all, as soon as possible and in one year. Um, the benefit of doing this will accelerate the installation of these important items. Um, this is a one-time cost also, a, a hefty one-time cost. And uh, it's we believe that the recommendation to kind of have a, maybe not quite this amount, but have a regular amount of funding coming into the district would be more beneficial, um, not only because sort of the priorities change, um, we would want that funding available on a year-to-year -year basis so that we could um, react to other changes or other natural um, disasters or other things that are going on, have that emergency fund available. And then finally, we um, discussed the benefits of performing additional technical studies, slope stability analysis, and modeling. Um, the previous technical studies and, and modeling of the Big Rock Mesa um, are, are very well done, very thorough. Um, and uh, they're ex the accepted design documents with regard to the landslide. Um, in our opinion, the results would not, uh, after doing you know, extensive studies and, and bringing on a new consultant and looking at a um, majority of, um, of uh, options, you know, we, in our opinion, the results really wouldn't change that significantly. And so we believe that it's a better use of the district's funding is, is to actually improve the facilities, improve the monitoring, and be able to dewater and, and deepen the dewatering system to, to take as much water out of out of uh, the district as possible. And with that, I, I wanna thank you for your time. Um, and I believe uh, there might be some questions. I'm happy to answer those for you. So before we kind of go yep. and answer some questions too, I, I just wanna follow up with um, kind of what we did back in October 6th. We had we had this sim very similar presentation we brought to uh, the, community, the community members up in Big Rock um, answered a bunch of questions and then um, had, a, had a lengthy discussion about the recommendations to improve it. Uh, um, I also met with the Big Rock Homeowner Associations, the, the dewater and subcommittee, and to really refine and get their input on really the things that they thought too would be very important to, to improve the, um, the districts. And so so you saw those recommendations in the in the presentation. Those recommendations, which which were discussed at length with the with the community, and um, they are in agreement with those those items. Um, but in order to do those items, we we would have to really amend and start the assessment district over again. But um, getting direction from council, if that's the direction we want to go. Then we the next step would be is to meet again with the property owners, figure out a mechanism, and start start more of a dialogue and and um, just a collaborative effort to try to get those items into a really good, um, meaningful assessment district. So so with that, uh, we'll be available for questions. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for that report, Lori. Um, council members, before we go to public, do you have questions? Let's go to public comment. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Rick? I just want to say I really appreciate that presentation by Lori. It's, um, it's a, that whole thing is kind of a big mystery to me. I kind of think I know what it's like, but the graphical representations with the water table and all of that information was really, for someone not steeped in it, was really illuminating. So thank you very much for that. Welcome. Okay, Jefferson. Thank you, Mikey. Just wanted to uh, thank the, the staff and the engineers at Yay and Associates. Uh, I was on council 2008 to 2012. We had Fugro was running it back then. And um, their, their scientific uh, show, show and tell was not as thorough as yours. So I, I believe we have a better understanding because of your thoroughness. And I want to thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I guess we'll save the rest of our questions so we have to hear the public uh, speak on this item. And I'm sure we have one or two speakers. Just a few. We have 14 speakers on this item. I'm going to read all their names in order and then we'll call them one by one to speak. Okay. They are Joe Drummond, Colin Drummond, Rosemary Eyed, Christopher Cunningham, Ed Don Michael, Bruce Silverstein, Dee Dee Graves, Jeff Greer, Gerard Eyed, Georgia Goldfarb, Norm Haney, Scott Dietrich, Craig Hill, and Paul Grisanti. And then I just wanted to note, we had a request from Rosemary and Christopher to play one video split between their times. So we'll pause that briefly when we're switching between speakers. Great. The first speaker is Joe Drummond. Great, thank you. Hi, Honorable Mayor Mikey and City Council members. We appreciate you asking Yay and Associates and Public Works to give an update on the dewatering equipment and the slope stability of Big Rock after 90 plus residents asked for a moratorium on development back on June 8th, given the constant movement of our hill and the deteriorated equipment. They were also supposed to respond to Don Michael, E.D. Michael's report submitted to the city almost two years ago. As you know, I've been working on this since then and still have no solid answer on our hill stability and whether development can be stopped in Big Rock. The purpose of the assessment district is to reduce landslide movement, yet we are still moving and still for some reason approvals keep coming in. Big Rock was designed, including the dewatering system for five times less the homes here. Ye's presentation stated that most of the wells are now in working order after over 15 replacements, rehabs and repairs, et cetera, since the submission of Don Michael's report. So we feel good that we help a little. However, we are only dewatering to ground level levels the same as over 30 years ago, yet we have in, been in a long time drought. If the equipment is designed to reduce water levels, then we should be much lower than this. Lori just stated that Big Rock is using the same water as over 30 years ago, but as of October 2020, the last six months water usage has almost been the highest ever at an average of 173,000 gallons per day. So the dewatering should be greater than it is. By yay proposing over a million dollars to increase the assessment district, they do admit the system could be working more efficiently than it is now. Next slide. There are still some shoddily maintained equipment as seen in the photos of a hydrodger being held by, up by a broken pipe duct tape to it. There are also the damaged swales destroyed and blocked by boulders and full grown bushes on the head scarp and in between Big Rock Drive and Seaboard Road that were designed to carry water off the hill and are nowhere near able to in their current state that needs to be added back into our scope of work as this must be affecting stability. Next slide. <clears throat> Gay and Associates have not completed any slope stability studies of the hill, given that we do move at least 0.1 inches per year in different areas of the hill, that's all circled in red, that um, and almost one to five inches after an earthquake, as per the latest Fugro reports on the slide shows, we are moving even into drought, plus all the cracking rock fall and ponding water that is not accounted for in the AD monitoring reports. There is likely more movement than this, given the limitations of the current measuring equipment in their isolated areas not to mention a massive increase in development over this time. Any movement of our hill means we are close to 1.0 in safety factor, not the 1.5 allowable for development. Why Ye and Fugger before them won't give a factor of safety number based on this movement is beyond us. We are an active landslide area. Next slide. This is the crack pattern in Pitical Way, cul-de-sac Don Michael recorded on August 27, 2020, the day he met Ye geologist Nick Simon briefly on Big Rock Drive and talked to him about this. 
Compare it with the second photo of his November 18th, 2018 report, 21 months earlier. Note there are no slope inclinometers to de detect movement near this track. These cracks have not, that have returned along the original landslide and the new road paved on April 2018. Oh, your time is up. Yeah, Colin will continue if you can keep that slide up. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. These cracks that have returned along the original landslide in the new road paved in April 2019 at Pinnacle Way are of great concern to we Big Rock residents. Uh, this obviously shows that we're a low factor of safety and susceptible to a landslide. The bottom line is Big Rock requires a moratorium on any new development that adds water to our hill. Please make a motion tonight or charge us to the new city council to put a hold on any new development in the Big Rock landslide assessment district in, until we are deemed stable. There's an analogy for how human beings normalize change and not realizing how bad things have actually become. It's called the boiling frog effect. The notion that a frog immersed is in gradually heating water will fail to notice the creeping change in its circumstances, even as it's literally being boiled alive. It's an apt metaphor for the way the city has been addressing the active landslide in Big Rock. <clears throat> we have a geologist who correctly forecast the 1983 slide and design the dewatering system telling us that we should be concerned. We have 100,000 square feet of new builds and additions since 1992. We have a city that continues to issue waivers for these builds with a low factor of safety to protect itself, but not the residents. The city should require with no exceptions adherence to the 1.5 factor of safety rule until the applicant agrees to indemnify the city and any big rock property owners damage from reactivation of the slide and provide proof of adequate insurance to cover damages. We also have a city that approves build after build saying CEQA does not apply because quote unquote, it's not possible that the cumulative effect will reactivate the slide. How is it possible? It's already happened once and there's movement now. And we have a new study from Ye and Associates, which reports on the deteriorated watering system, the watering system, but doesn't report on the stability of the hill, which is the purpose of the assessment district. City councillors, please don't be boiled frogs. Please protect Big Rock residents from another Malibu natural disaster. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rosemary Eyed. You there, Rosemary? Unmoved. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, Rosemary. Okay, thank you so much. I live also in Big Rock on Piedra Chica, and there's a property next to our house, and on that property was never allowed a new build because of geology, drainage, and flooding. But now that someone wants to make an addition six feet up to that property and it's allowed because of waivers and not the same geological standards as a standalone, as a standalone build, even though essentially it's a standalone build because of the difference in foundation. But somehow this gets past the planning department and commission. It doesn't make sense, these waivers that put our hill and homes in jeopardy. My husband moved here, he bought the house in 1967 and I came in the mid seventies. So we witnessed a lot of storms, a lot of earth movements, a lot of tragedy. And for some reason back there in the early eighties, we were the canaries of in the coal mine. We saw this light coming because our house is more or less on the lowest point of Piedra Chica. So we saw the signs and we had some storms before that. So it was not a very good time for us because we could barely use the bathroom. So I think you get the drift. I still smell Malibu perfume once in a while in our neighborhood. I see in the morning and sometimes during the day the pump trucks go up. And I wonder why do so many trucks go up on Big Rock? Um, it's not a good good thing for Big Rock to do that. 
Then I look at other areas like La Costa and I see the landslide, you know, and I think Malibu just okays everything. Every build on the steepest hill in the worst neighborhood, geologically the worst neighborhood. And then you look up and you see the bare hills, La Costa. Then even in Bel Air, I see houses come down the hillside. I mean, I, it doesn't make sense. If we live in a geologically sensitive area, landslide, why do you approve all of this? Maybe you can explain it to me. Is it the extra income for the city? Or what is it? I don't fully understand it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. Our next speaker is Christopher Cunningham. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Christopher. Okay, um, actually, there's supposed to be a video that's playing before my um, my speaking time. So I'm gonna ask to go after uh, Gerhard, who will be playing the video. Okay. Okay, we'll circle back to you. Our next speaker is Ed Don Michael. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm Don Michael. I'm consulting geologist for the Big Rock Mesa Homeowners Association. I've looked over the uh, um, RFP and uh, I looked over the uh, city's um, um, work in that regard, and uh, it looks fairly complete as far as it goes. Um, I hope they do as good a job as Fugro did, uh, but in, in the final analysis, these meetings we have, we have that we're having now are, can only be really evaluated in terms of writing. Uh, zooming doesn't really uh, work well in, in developing the real issues that are involved. Uh, Fugro's work was always qualified by saying that nothing they wrote or did uh, could be taken to mean that they were talking about the safety, uh, the, the safety of Big Rock Mesa's landslide and whether or not it was going to move again. I'm wondering if the uh, work that Yeah is now going to be doing has that same qualification. Uh, but folks, the landslide has a very, very low safety factor. And um, increasing in rainfall sooner or later is going to happen or a seismic shock of some magnitude might uh, set it off. I, uh, no geologist could deny that the recurrence of cracks along the periphery of the original Big Rock Mesa landslide uh, doesn't mean that it has a very low safety factor. Uh, I'm sure that it's very low. Uh, I wouldn't surprise if it moved tomorrow. I'm less sure if the if that movement would cause damage, um, but I'm even less sure that the movement would be catastrophic, but um, we just don't know. And it's unfortunate that um, so far, I may be unfair here because I haven't read what Rory Bay Barry has been saying, but it's, it's not a good idea to look at past conditions and use them as predictive of current conditions because once a slide moves uh, in simple terms, the, uh, the coefficient of friction is different. Uh, it's not uh, improper to look at the records, but to give the impression that the earlier records are similar to conditions now, or better than conditions now, and therefore implies that there will not be any more movement. Uh, it's just uh, it's just wrong. The mechanical conditions we have now are different. The Ed, your time is up. What? Your time is up. Was that there for three minutes? Yeah, that was three minutes. Well, it's not enough. I'll tell you that. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. We appreciate it. And please feel free to follow up with a letter if you need to. Our next speaker is Bruce Silverstein. 
Hey, am I unmuted? I can hear you. Okay, thank you. So uh, before turning to the Big Rock Mesa Assessment District, I do have some comments about the matter I raised earlier this evening. There are two ways to be fraudulent in the law. One is to state false facts. The other is to omit material information that puts otherwise truthful information in proper context. What the community witnessed earlier tonight was artful dissembling of the latter form by the city manager and city attorney. There's far more to the story than the misleading spin they provided. It's all in writing. It's all been shared with the press in real time in the interest of full transparency, which Ms. Hogan insinuated I was trying to evade. In fact, the city manager and city attorney seek to avoid true transparency I'm seeking to establish, and their contrary claims are projection and deflection. The spin room aspect of the comments from the dais is systemically protected by the fact that the city manager and city attorney speak after the public, and there's no opportunity to correct their misstatements. Once I'm sworn in, I'll have a chance to make sure the facts are all on the table. The public will have an opportunity to see what's really going on. That's why I will not speak to the city manager or city attorney without a recording of the conversation. I do know how to get along and how to get things done in a cooperative manner. I could not have succeeded with a high-level corporate governance practice without being able to do so. I know when I'm getting a runaround. I know how, I know with respect that, and I know with respect to the past few days, that's what I've been getting, and that's an understatement. It's not poor leadership to call out bad actors when they behave badly. Failing to do so just rewards bad conduct. I believe a significant portion of the community agrees. I believe that's why I received more votes than, from the residents than any other candidate in this election. We're not playing a game here. I ran for office on a platform that exposed the inappropriate manipulation and control of city council by the city manager and city attorney. I know that no member of city council other than Jefferson Wagner wanted to see me elected and actively worked against my election. So I'm not surprised to witness the continued defense of the city manager and city attorney this evening. I am, however, disappointed. And I suspect that's true of members of the public who are paying attention to this meeting. Nonetheless, I intend to press for government reform and I won't back down. With respect to the Big Rock Mesa Assessment District, I'm just beginning to get up to speed with the serious issues in that area of Malibu, and they do seem very serious to me. I still need to learn a lot more before I can formulate an informed view, but I will say the protection of the health, safety, and welfare of the public is the central obligation of government. And I do have concerns that there are serious safety issues in Big Rock and that the city needs to be very cautious in reviewing applications for further development that could alone or in combination with other development have a cumulative adverse impact on the environment, particularly the geology. It may be as many residents of Big Rock have advocated that there will need to be an environmental impact review for further development at some point, and that point may be sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dee Dee Graves. Okay. Um, thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. We're requesting a moratorium on any development in Big Rock Mesa. The Big Rock Mesa residents are concerned about the stability of the Mesa, and we on the highway are directly under the Mesa and are equally concerned. It appears the wells, hydrographers, and pumps installed after the 1984 slide are not solving the problem. Another slide, small or large, would close PCH and destroy many homes across the highway with the possible loss of life. The landslide, the Big Rock Mesa landslide occurred in September 1983, moved slowly into 1984. There were many lawsuits filed in March 1984. They were finally settled by a $97 million settlement in 1989. Caltrans, the county, and the insurers paid the homeowners, but no one was assigned liability. At this point, if there were a slide, I think liability would be assigned. All of the building on the Mesa must stop, and the updated systems of dewatering the Mesa that is routinely checked and maintained in working order. This is an absolute must. This is our community. Maintaining its safety and the integrity of our elected officials is at stake. Please save Malibu. Thank you. Thank you, Didi. Our next speaker would be uh, Jeff Greer, but he doesn't appear to be in the meeting at the moment, so we can try to mm -hmm. circle back to him at the end. Um, so we'll hear from Gerard Ide next, and I believe he may have a video he wants to play. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, now you say hi. Hi, I would like to yield my time uh, to the video that you see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now. Thank you. Um, just, I just want to make sure I heard you right. No specific slope stability was done for this property, right? That's correct. Okay. It and was not required by the city geologist, and I did not do it. Okay. And you said that no additions can be added below 1.25. That's correct. Okay. So you said the whole, I think Mr. Michael said the whole neighborhood was under 1.25. He felt that it might be around 1.0. And honestly, no one's done it. Logically, when a land mass moves some, it has to have a safety factor around 1.0 or less. And if you look at the sloping clinometers that the cities or that was installed that the city is monitoring, they do show a quarter of an inch a year on some years. And during the, um, actually not a quarter inch, less than that, it's 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. Um, during the Northridge earthquake, it moved about 0.5 inches, okay? All of that would suggest the safety factor is low. <coughs> However, when this first came out, and I was this geologist for the city at the time, and I was wondering, how can they say it's a 1.25 when, in fact, we see there's some evidence of movement, especially during earthquakes. And I was told by the geotechnical engineer with Bingen and Associates, that's just the way it works. Beats me, all right? So I can understand why Mr. Michael is saying it's 1.0. And this I know it is a big issue on a piece of property that is of concern to a lot of people. And you would, I would have, I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm naive in this stuff. But I would have expected that the city would have wanted to wade in, in terms of what they think. So I'm just surprised that's not there. But we'll come back to that later. Can okay. I, I'll ask a question just to follow up that what was already said about. I don't know if we call it variously the slope stability index or the factor of safety. That normally that's supposed to be 1.5, and there was an allowance made at some point back in the past that in Big Rock it could be 1.25. And I understand that we're allowing less than that because they're signing waivers saying, yeah, I, I understand there's a risk here I want to build anyway. But my question would be, how low is too low on those waivers? If we came back hypothetically and if somebody found that the stability index was 1.01, .01, this thing was right on the edge of movement, would you still say, yeah, we'll sign, we'll, we'll let them just sign that waiver? You know, at, at, at what point? Does, the, does that waiver process become too risky? And do we even know what the stability index is there right now? I don't think we have a number for that that's at all current. Get the exact number, but I believe there are certain variances that take place for anything, um, for the factor of safety, if that's at a certain lower point, I have to get that exact number. I don't have that off the top of my head, but there are certain variances that are asked for and granted for that. That concludes Gerard's time. So next okay. we'll hear from Christopher Cunningham. Okay, great, thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Christopher. Okay, good evening city council members. You just saw some video from the planning commission meeting on October 21st of last year where there were a number of questions that the planning commissioners raised with respect to building on a lot in the south southeastern area of Big Rock Mesa. There were no clear answers to those questions then, so I would like to ask a few related questions now. First, according to the Malibu Building Code section 22.44.2180, the safety factor for slopes and landslide areas in Malibu is 1.5, yet there were some reference in the video that Big Rock has an allowable safety factor of 1.25. So where does it state in the Malibu Building Code the allowable safety factor below 1.5 for Big Rock? And what was the basis for lowering the safety factor for Big Rock to 1.25? By doing so, is the city encouraging development on an active landslide? Secondly, the Mesa lots are in an active landslide hazard zone, and there has been no slope stability study that shows a safety factor for these lots at or above 1.5 or even above 1.25 for that matter. In fact, the only slope stability study conducted for Big Rock in the last 28 years by Bin Yen, that Don Koleski also references in the video, shows that five of the six zones in Big Rock Mesa landslide area have safety factors of 1.2 or less. Let me repeat, five of the six 
zones in Big Rock Safety Mesa landslide area have safety factors of 1.2 or less. In the video, you also saw Koleski state, quote, beats me on why Binyan did not conclude that the slope stability factor was 1.0 or less when in inclinometers show movement. The Drummonds provided this information to both the city council and planning commission in a letter dated November 1st of last year. So now having this information, what is the basis for why the city would continue to allow a variance from the city's geotechnical standards and codes on slope stability with respect to development in Big Rock? Also, the city's apparent circumvention of the existing code through its continual issuance of waivers undermines the code's purpose to protect property owners. This is because the city takes the easiest path and simply has the developer sign a waiver to take on the liability and indemnify the city and does not consider the risk borne by nearby property owners who waive nothing. It also looks at each applicant in isolation without considering the cumulative effects of multiple new developments on the Mesa. Does the city know what the current actual safety factors are for these lots when they issue these waivers? Why doesn't the city geologist require a slope stability study from developers in the active BRM landslide area to get a current accurate safety factor for these lots? Finally, I'd like to revisit Craig Hill's question in the video, since I didn't hear the response. How low below the 1.5 safety factor is the city willing to go with these waivers? Or in other words, what is the minimum safety factor at which the city will not issue a waiver when we have two geologists, Cole Leslie and Ed Michael, Edie Michael, both indicate that the safety factor in Big Rock Mesa is not only below 1.5, not only below 1.25, but closer to or even below 1.0. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Georgia Goldfarb. You there, Georgia? Okay, can you, sorry, can you hear me now? I can hear you, Georgia. Okay, great, one second, I just have to um, Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to move. I can't get the Zoom thing out of my my script here. Oh yeah, I hate that. Oh, there there we went. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> apologies. Okay. Well, additional water is very likely to contribute to further movement of the slide. I do not know that this is the only factor. Development itself, with the weight and disturbance of Earth, may also contribute. In addition, other unidentified factors cannot be excluded. The fact is that the slide continues to move and that this movement has not been adequately delineated as people have discussed. We don't even know the slope to stability factors for individual houses. Another thought that has been discussed is to require that new development assume liability for any movement. However, I think it would be impossible to attribute movement and consequent damage to one development or another which would mean that liability would also be impossible to determine. Further, this remedy transpires after the fact of damage to homes, which is certainly something we all want to avoid. This solution seems like an unending quagmire that cannot protect our homes. Another issue is the high risk of wildfire and the increased risk attributable to more structures in the community has not been discussed. But this is a fact and should not be avoided in determining where new development may occur. In addition, future insurance coverage cannot be guaranteed. Um, adding more development will only exacerbate this problem as well. So permitting further development can only exacerbate any and all of these problems. Therefore, I oppose further development for these reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Our next speaker is Norm Haney. Oh, I think I'm unmuted. I hear you, Norm. Yeah, my comments are uh, in praise of uh, Ye and Associates and the amount of work uh, that they have been able to accomplish under the um, 
comprehensive uh, leadership of Rob DeBow. It's just amazing to me. Uh, they've been on the job between 60 and almost 90 days, and they have monitored uh, information on all of the wells, all of the hydrographers, uh, found that the water table in most cases is as low as it's ever been, and come up with a comprehensive program for how the dewatering can continue and even lower the water table more than it currently is. Now that costs a bit of money, a substantial amount of money actually, uh, but they were hired to come up with ways in which they could increase the stability of the slide. And they're on course of doing exactly that. So I, I want to appreciate the work that they've done and also the leadership provided by Rob DeBow. And I'd very much like to get a copy of their report. If it can be emailed to me, I'll, I'll print it out myself. Um, and with that, uh, I appreciate the other comments by the other speakers as well and, and the concerns that they have. Um, you know, I, I, I think a step system is the best system for eliminating uh, water uh, going down to the slide plane. Um, that would cost a bit more, but it would ensure the stability. I'm talking about a step system for an advanced wastewater treatment system located somewhere uh, along PCH where uh, brown water from the existing septic tanks would be uh, directed to an advanced wastewater treatment system uh, for tertiary treatment. Um, and I think that that would be the next step to ensure uh, long lasting um, stability of the, um, of the slide. But that's a ways off and it's also fairly costly. People would have to, have to commit to 50 to $75,000 a piece. I think it'd be worth it, but um, that's not what's before you today. What's before you today, I think, is uh, Ye and Associates' work um, and their new leadership. And um, I'm, I'm really shocked at the amount of work that they've been able to do and the recommendations uh, for further work and further reduction of the water uh, level. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Norm. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich. First of all, I'm very impressed with uh, Lori's report. We've uh, uh, considered this extensively at Public Works on the commission under Rob's leadership. It's a complicated issue. I have read uh, Edie Michael's report as well as Fugro's uh, update. I think this report um, made it much clearer. That said, Malibu cannot afford the lawsuits that would result from another slide. And let's be clear, when you get to a factor of safety below one, you're moving. And if you get have a factor of safety apparently like a 1.2, if you add in a severe storm, if you add in a, uh, an earthquake, we could have houses tumbling down the hill. And Malibu can't afford it. We can't afford the dollar amount that would result from the lawsuits. We can't afford to see that happen to our neighbors. So I, am, I do not live in Big Rock. But as a citizen of this town and a public works commissioner, we have to put safety first. And I believe that that means that we need to go back and require a factor of safety of 1.5. No more waivers. That there's, and if that means no additional development because they can't meet that factor of safety, so be it. Secondly, and Rob had proposed this, and it's in that report, 
that Lori made. Um, I think that assessment district needs to be redone. You're talking uh, the amount of money that was appropriate in 1998, I believe, when it was formed. And they need a lot more money now. They need to accomplish these things, not wait 10 years. They need to accomplish all those improvements now. And that's only going to happen with more money. So I think that that's the direction we need to go in. But you've got to stop development right now unless somebody can meet the safety factor of 1.5. I think that 1.25 waiver should have never been done. It puts the city and the neighbors there at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is Craig Hill. Good evening, council and staff. Um, the assessment district's purpose has been lost. It's supposed to, it used to be about ensuring that the hillside remains stable, yet no one's been evaluating the stability factors. That's job number one. Before Fugro, Bing Yen did it, but there's been mission creep over the years and now Public Works treats it as though we're outside the scope of the new consultant's contract. The stability evaluation overall and by subregion is the whole point. Without knowing how unstable it is or isn't or and where, the whole system of wells and hydrogers and inclinometers is, is just a game of whack-a-mole. And you can't just assume the stability tracks linearly with groundwater level. Multiple factors are in play such that a level of 100 feet 30 years ago might mean something completely different today. Uh, as Don Michael pointed out, the coefficient of friction changes. So we homeowners are paying a premium to licensed professionals precisely to make those evaluations. If it were just about wells and monitoring, we could hire Roy Brothers Drilling and drop a few inclinometers down there ourselves. I mean, I say that only half tongue in cheek because these days you can probably get a monitoring device on Amazon that works with an iPhone app. But anyway, the city without having been requiring stability numbers and the guidance they provide has been shirking its duty of public safety. The city has development applicants sign a waiver and each new project has neighbors throughout the zone whose stability will be affected, but who haven't been given the choice to waive anything. And with each waiver signed, liability accrues against the city as for each non-waiving neighbor. Now, each new house might not affect overall stability much on its own, but in the aggregate, they will, and they probably are right now. The city's practice of sequential one-off waivers doesn't capture those cumulative effects. Um, so in the end, we can't say anything about whether we need a new or revised assessment district until we have the stability evaluations in hand. Until then, we're flying blind, playing whack-a-mole on a cart before the horse on the deck of the Titanic with an elephant that's not even in the room. So my recommendation would be to make any equipment fixes that are obviously needed right now, but then direct consultant Ye to prioritize making stability evaluations for the whole hill and for smaller subregions, uh, because there's little point spending more money till we know why we'd be doing it. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Our next speaker is Paul Grisanti, and then we're gonna try to circle back to Jeff Greer if he's in the meeting. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Paul Grisanti, and I have uh, been on the Planning Commission for about 16 years, and I've had the opportunity to read reports from nearly all of the previous consultants over time. And I, I, uh, I appreciate the fact that the current report, what I've seen of it, is very good. Uh, I'd like to ask people to consider a few things. First of all, we're looking at an average water level that is more than 90 feet below what it was in 1988. How much water do you think it took to raise the water level 90 feet over an area of about a square mile? Maybe a little more than that? Considering that it's filling the spaces between the individual grains of sand and earth and everything else. I don't know the answer, but it's a hell of a lot of water which weighs eight and a half pounds per gallon. Uh, the 
The other thing I'd like you to remember is, as the council, you're sitting on this and you have to talk about it, but the money that the homeowners want to spend is their money. And if they want to, to assess themselves more money and spend more money on this, I think you should agree to let them. Do they have enough people willing to vote to do that? And the only way you can find that out is by allowing them to increase the amount of the assessment and see what if they can get that uh, voted for. And as far as, as coming up with factors of safety, I guess we should be asking uh, the consultant here what she thinks it would cost to develop the factors of safety for each of the regions that were originally identified back in the Binyan report. And those are the questions that I think are essential in order to make a decision. And, you know, I believe the factor of safety is better now than it was in 1988 because there's a heck of a lot less weight. But again, I'm not a licensed geologist or geotechnical engineer either. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Jeff Greer is still not in the meeting, so that concludes public comment on this item. All right, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, back here at council. Can we change my view so I can see something here? Thank you, you might be looking for the gallery view button in the upper right. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, there we go, I got it. Um, Rob, do you want to start us off by maybe responding to what you heard or or where are you at here? Like, let, oh, and then so, we'll get so, yeah, let me let me kind of just kind of piecemeal because there's two I, I think there's two things and actually Paul made a pretty good kind of summary too at the end. We have two things we're looking at here. We're looking at actually modifying the assessment district to talk about the, the improvements. One of them is um, increase the capital budget so we can do more projects earlier, uh, um, have a have a reserve fund add the scope for increasing the um, the the assessment district to include some swales that they mentioned and do some of the things that um, that the dewatering committee and, and the city and the consultant we all kind of agreed and worked on kind of doing uh, so what what I'm really looking at here is getting some feedback from the council and seeing if that's a good approach to go is saying, yeah, let's let's look into that. And if I, I get that that initial thoughts of yes, go ahead. My next step will be to meet with the community again, talk about um, how we move forward on doing that, working with them on an ongoing basis because this is their assessment district. I, I want to really have a really public involvement with them, really something that they can be part of the process and developing this and making this a really safe community for them. And so that's kind of what I'm looking at. The development part of it is, I see it's kind of connected, but it's not what I'm kind of looking at at this point. I'm just looking for direction for actually modifying this assessment district or not. Does that make sense? That does make perfect sense. Um, can you address the stability question that seems to be on everyone's mind? Wait, before you do, Rob, oh. let me just jump in this, Christy. Let me just jump in just to emphasize one part. Um, so we're not making a decision tonight about it. What we're saying is either no interest, don't bother, don't spend the resources, or um, yeah, this may be of interest. We want to know what the community thinks and what the, um, the people who are in the assessment district think. Go ahead and staff and spend resources and time and bring it back to us after you have talked to the, um, those in the assessment district. So it's like a, you know, keep going or stop direction, not you won't be making a final decision tonight. And, and of course, Christy makes it a better presentation than I did, <laughs> but that's exactly what I'm looking for. And, and what I propose to do is after getting that direction from you, go to, go to the community, get some more information, provide some feedback and updates back to council to where we are 
once we get to a good point with the community, really seek about getting approval to modifying the assessment district and that whole process, which is a whole steam of um, different items that we got to discuss and move forward on. But this first step is just like Chrissy said is, yeah, do we want to put the effort forward into actually modifying that or hold back or do whatever. So that's, that's what I'm looking for. Okay. Um, well, let me let the rest of the com uh, council ask some questions. I got, you know, one or two myself, but um, <laughs> uh, let's uh, Rick's got his hand up. Why don't you start Rick? Thank you, mayor. Um, I got a question. Why are we issuing waivers on this? I mean, if that's if that 1.5 thing, and if I'm reading it right, that applies throughout the city, right? Why would you waive it in a place that's a you know a landslide area? So I don't know. I'm I'm going to punt that over to Yolanda's group, and maybe they could respond to that. I'm I'm not. I'm not in the development or that approval or building part of it. And, and so she's more, she's, she's better equipped to answering those questions if she, she's still around. Great. There, there she, she is. is. Hi, good evening. Um, and yes, uh, the second part of the question and a lot of what we heard from the community was the development portion of it. Uh, the development portion of it is a um, is a uh, significant amount of information that we have our consultants, con shires, our geotechnical team that can better explain how the city in the past four decades has been doing reviews and the codes that are we are following. We're not only following the um, California building standards with the amendments by Los Angeles County, but we are also following uh, the, the local um, procedures that we have for in your technical reports. I'm gonna ask um, Mike Phipps from Conshire to respond and specifically to the hazardous waivers that, we, that the city issues. And yes, it's throughout the city. And also that to respond and to add more information regarding the uh, factor of safety. So uh, Mike is joining us here. Uh, are you there, Mike? Oh, you're muted still, Mike. There you go. Okay. Good evening. Um, so I think uh, the best way that I can put this uh, with the cliff note version is, um, you know, the, the city incorporated in 1991 and inherited the Big Rock Mesa landslide from Los Angeles County. Um, and, um, you know, the, the code sections uh, specifically with uh, today, they are sections 110 and 111 of the uh, Los Angeles County code that, that uh, Malibu um, adopts and amends um, every three years. Uh, those sections have been around for literally four decades. Um, the city picked up really the same processes and the type of review that, that the county was doing um, before cityhood. Um, and, um, you know, um, well, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, I think that, um, you know, factor of safety at 1.5, um, the landslide is, is never had that and it's probably never going to have that. Um, the factor of safety was determined in the, um, in the Bingyan report in 1992 um, in I think six different areas. And so they're all different. Um, so there's been some concern expressed about, you know, some areas being lower than others. Um, you know, the, the point I want to get to is that um, the code, section 110 of the code, allows for um, additions to be built um, 
It allows for remodeling to be done um, within certain parameters of the code. And it really requires, um, it requires stability to be um, addressed by the geotechnical consultants um, in a manner of speaking, um, is the property safe for the intended use based on um, what's being proposed? We can't allow um, a brand new single family residence to be constructed because the factor of safety is not above 1.5. Um, these code sections were written by the county um, long before cityhood. And like I said, um, everything has been operating under these same code sections in perpetuity. Um, factor, one, factor of safety 1.5 is, is in the uh, LTP LIP, um, section 9.4. And that's really what prevents a brand new single family residence from being built in Big Rock. Um, there have been some attempts to do that and those applications have had to apply for uh, variances that end up coming before you, the city council. So, um, you know, the real situation here is that we, we look at the developments in the context of the code and what the code allows for. And it's a certain size of addition that can be allowed or a renovation or a remodel. Um, there's also a whole arm of this uh, relating to the environmental health and uh, wastewater systems. Um, you know, uh, not, not allowing an increase in fixture units, an increase in bedrooms, um, moving away from any kind of system that's going to um, result in deep percolation to the groundwater table and move to these uh, drip dispersal systems, which um, predominantly evapotranspirate into the air. So uh, we're trying to avoid putting water into the ground we're trying to improve the surface drainage on these properties. Um, allowing room additions actually uh, increases impermeable area and will create more runoff that will go off the site probably rather than uh, into the ground. So uh, there's a little give and take there. Um, that's the, uh, you know, that's the context in which we do these reviews. We, we, we do them in accordance with the code sections that um, that we have before us and, and um, you know, I'd have to say nothing has really changed in the way that these reviews have been done in the 28 years that uh, Malibu has um, been a city or, or before then when it was under Los Angeles County. Um, I think there was a period of time when the landslide started moving in, in 83 and um, was arrested a, somewhat a few years after that where not much was happening, but um, I think there's a history of things being approved by the county um, in a similar manner following the same, same code section. So what my, my answer to you is nothing has changed in terms of um, how these have been reviewed and this is how we review them. We, we follow the codes. So, so it is possible to get a variance but it needs to be approved by the planning commission or the city council is what you're saying. So my yeah. question is how many of them have been issued approximately? I mean, it's, there's, they're, what they're saying is, Hey, they're building stuff with waivers. I mean, is that really happening? What's the story? Well, um, I don't know. I know there've been a couple um, in the last few years that have um, either in the works, or I don't, I'm not sure if any of them have come before you yet. Um, I think that Chris Dean might have a better answer for that than I would. Um, but I, but I am aware of uh, at least one or two where um, the developments were either houses that burned down in the '93 fire, and the property sat vacant for uh, 15, 20 years or longer. Um, and finally, somebody came back and wanted to rebuild on, on that property. Uh, I think there are, uh, there's another example of one that was red tagged during, uh, shortly after the, the Big Rock Mesa slide moved um, and has now come back before uh, the city uh, with somebody trying to rebuild on that property. 
Um, Mayor, Mayor Pearson, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just want to make sure that the council stays on track on the item that's before them tonight. I know there's a lot of interest in the conversation about development, but again, as Rob explained, we're looking for some pretty specific directions. So I just want to keep us focused on that, um, especially as the hour gets late. You don't want to just stay up all night and just kind of go all the way through and just push through? I'm just kidding. Um, okay. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I think, I think right, said it well. Taken. I got it. Yeah, but, there's a lot of interest here in a lot of, a lot of these issues. So you're right. Um, but we're here to receive a report and give direction on the assessment district moving forward. Still begs talking about the other stuff, but I get that it's not exactly on the agenda. Um, other, uh, I, more questions, Rick? Along those lines, or along lines of what's on the agenda? Uh, it was basically that's the thing I wanted to get at is you know why are we uh, if we are and how prevalent is it that we're straying from the safety factor? That's you know that's what they should be following. Throughout. And we can but, certainly bring back an item that provides more information about all of that. Um, but that's not what's before us this evening. Yeah, I'm, I'm all in favor of this, uh, as Rob says, continuing the ball forward, especially it involves working with the community and getting all their input. Okay, great. Uh, Sky? Thank you. Um, thank you everybody for the input thus far and for all the public speakers. Um, so I think the first thing for me that comes to mind with this, just like out of concern in public safety is like, is it safe or not? You know, um, and I think that sort of based on the report that we got that it indicates um, that I, while there might have been a little bit of movement, but the water seems to be relatively stable and to how the dewatering is working and that there's obviously a, a priority or that the, the, the retrofits and things that need to be upgraded in regards to the mechanical systems um, can be made and, and done so in a sort of prioritized fashion. So I, I would make the recommendation that we would, you know, sort of, I guess, continue and, and uh, um, urge them to move forward with, you know, increasing the budget, prioritizing certain capital projects at, at you know, the time that they see fit. But I then separately have this sort of direction that's dealing with the development and the safety. And I'd like to see something, you know, sort of come back to the council that, that addresses that maybe better. I, I feel like, I feel like there was an appeal or something that we had, it might've been a few years ago in regards to a project from, from Big Rock. And I remember it might not have been there, but there was something that had to do with the safety factor and coming to an answer of why it wasn't able to meet what it meant everywhere else. Um, I can't remember whether or not the project was approved, but I think that we should try to develop some sort of certainty, you know, within that for that area so that one, the, the property owners know which direction they can go. Um, because I do think that if, you know, even with the waiver in, in place, it would likely be probably some sort of a litigation nightmare if God forbid council or the planning commission, you know, somebody got a, a house up there on a waiver and the whole thing slid and people got hurt. That would be, you know, I think a, no one would be happy about that at all. So I just, I, I want to have sort of a clear, a clear assessment of the, of the safety in the area that can be provided to council and can educate them on, on how best to make that decision. And then maybe that kind of also factors into the threshold of how much money needs to be set aside and other stuff or, or what can be prioritized in a fashion that maybe makes it safer if that can be said. I don't even know if, if that can be said or not, but I, I think that that's sort of in, you know, um, placates not the right word, but, but definitely listens to the concerns of the residents because clearly there's been a lot of concern over time over there in relation to how development can affect that landslide and water usage and everything else. So I would make the recommend or try to see if I could make a motion that would do both of those things that would sort of move the, uh, move the study forward, get some more money, get some of the capital improvement projects, um, you know, 
taken care of and then give sort of a better understanding in terms of like a safety assessment. So, so let me just kind of jump in with that too, is, is, is yeah, just, just like Riva said that we can bring back an item about the safety and about development on here too. That's, that, and then we can do that. That's, that's easy. And I'll second that motion. Okay. Okay. Um, Jefferson. Yes, uh, I listened to the speakers. A majority of them were all concerned about slope stability. We all heard the reports. We know what's going on there. Um, this isn't anything new. I think uh, granting waivers in the future is something that'd be very uh, iffy. And uh, they're willing not to increase their fixture counts. They're reducing their water consumption up, up there. They are concerned about movement. Uh, so I think they, we need to come back to them. We need to move forward and promise them that these waivers have got to stop. And uh, the slope stability is per paramount. And as we consider the values of the properties and the lenders that are lending against these properties up there, they want surety. These homeowners want surety. I think the city wants surety and uh, the lenders would. So in that course of action, in that direction, uh, we need to bring this back. We need to have a more uh, substantial input from the homeowners that are living up there that have been there for many decades and know what the real situations are. But, uh, it looks like they're on the right track. They're becoming more active than they have in the past. And I, I really applaud them for that and their knowledge and the depth of uh, abilities that they're willing to explain their position. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Karen? Yeah, thank you, Mikey. Um, I think Paul Grisanti summed it up pretty well. Um, and as he has been on the Public Works Commission for 16 years, I know he's dealt with this over and over again. Um, and as Rob said, there's two considerations. Um, and Skyler, you know, his motion addresses this. Um, modifying the assessment district, um, Rob, you offered to meet with the Big Rock Mesa uh, assessment group again. Um, and as Paul said, that's their money. So I fully respect um, that process. Um, and the development is a separate issue. And if I lived up there, I would probably be asking the same questions. So um, I, I, uh, I know we've had a motion, it's been seconded, but I think we can, I would be happy to have us move ahead um, and, and move to keep this going. Um, and, and I think that's what you meant, Skylar. Maybe that's exactly what you said. The direction to staff is to move ahead uh, with this, uh, accept this report and, and let uh, the Mesa homeowners or uh, assessment district decide how much money they want to spend, if they want to spend any. Oh, that's part of my motion. <clears throat> yeah. The second, the second part of it comes with bringing back sort of, I guess, would, would be, a, you know, sort of addressing the safety concerns, how development may or may not affect that. But I think maybe within that, and I don't know if it's possible, maybe one of the more technical people could, could say that, um, or explain it to us or just say whether or not it is. If you could say like, you know, if you can't, it's it's sort of like the one size fits all approach in terms of like where the, the slope stability or this this number of 1.5 comes from, um, that that's sort of like the one size fits all, but then all of a sudden we're like, this whole area is in this like area that doesn't fit that. So there's been, and maybe leeway is not the right word, but some flexibility given with meeting that. And maybe that should be better defined as to this area must meet 1.25 or something, you know, so that there's like a, a bit of certainty. And then that uh, maybe, maybe some help with the motion could be to direct staff to pursue um, an additional assessment district and, and work with the neighborhood um, on moving forward with that and to uh, review the safety factor um, and bring something back to council regarding that. Would that work what you want? Yeah, and then just maybe adding in like a 10 or 15 minute break because we haven't been able to go to the restroom. For <laughs> That's up to you. I was just trying to get y'all to a motion. 
No, I, I think that's good. I think, I think we're all in green. Um, of course, we want the Big Rock neighborhood to do what they feel needs to be done to feel safe and to take care of their, of their area um, naturally. So thank you, Rob, for your help on that. That I think obviously we can see where the vote's going there. And I agree with what I heard. I think Skylar and others say um, a lot of questions. I mean, as many years as I was on planning commission, we rarely had anything in this area come along. It was, it was just really thin. So um, yeah, I want a better understanding myself. Um, and, you know, we need to understand and set some parameters here. I num hear numbers thrown around 1.5, 1.25. Great, I mean, they mean something to somebody, and I I get that 1.5 is a lot better. I actually couldn't tell you exactly why that's true. I can't do the math in my head right now. So um, I think it'd be great to come back and and get a much better understanding and make sure that we all feel that this uh, this area is uh, that the city's you know handling it correctly. And I don't know that it is or isn't. Um, I know. I'm glad, really glad to hear though that the water levels are 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 down. So obviously that's that's down from 83. I think that's fantastic. I know that I used to have to go by my uh, dad's house and check the cracks all the time. Hasn't moved lately, so it's a good sign on that part of seaboard. <laughs> um, but with that said, we need to we need to we really need to look at all of Big Rock and that whole area. So I think we have a motion. And a second. So um, let's vote. One more time. So let's vote. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Peak, if I can just clarify that motion. I think I captured what you were looking for, but you're directing staff to work with the Big Rock neighbors to create a new assessment district and plan related capital improvement projects and review the factor of safety in the district and bring back an item with that information. Yeah, and I think specifically within regards to the factor of safety is how the development affects the area and what should or shouldn't be allowed. Or kind of in like more like layman's terms. Okay. Yeah, what's the impact of development? It's a very important part of this. Absolutely. Correct. Uh, who was the second on that again? Was that you, Rick? Do you you sec you still keeping your second there? Okay, then can we have roll call, please? Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. So I'm going to ask for a, uh, like an eight and a half minute break. <laughs> um, I know some people have been waiting. It's a tricky night. We're going to quickly do 6B. It should be very quick next and then get to 4A. I know there's a lot of waiting, but a lot of items have been fallen behind for various reasons, then we're gonna just push forward as best we can. So with that, um, we'll be back. Are we uh, coming back here? Uh, yeah, I just waiting. I don't see Karen. Hello, hello. You there, Karen? And there she is. Okay. Um, so I think we're ready. We're back. Okay, we are on. <coughs> I assume staff is there somewhere. I'm just going to assume and I see Susan. Good enough. You're running everything, Susan. You're the only one I see. Um, so uh, we're on item 6A, Siren Feasibility Report. Continued from too long ago. And um, please take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Mayor, Council. 
So about one year ago, we contracted with a consulting firm, Mission Critical Partners, to conduct a siren sound study. A sound study is the first step in implementing an outdoor warning siren system so that you can identify the most effective type of siren and placement of warning sirens. So we request the consultants to identify alternative strategies for an effective system, make a recommendation on the best strategy for a community, provide sound coverage maps for our strategy, and then provide some real rough cost estimates so we know what we're in for. The study was completed in June and presented to the Public Safety Commission in August. As you will hear from the consultants, because they're going to do a presentation in just a moment, um, outdoor warning siren systems, <clears throat> excuse me, they do have limitations when it comes to sound coverage uh, in mountainous areas like ours, as well as when the wind is blowing and when people are inside, especially if you have well insulated walls and windows. Uh, the commission recommended that we bring back another item as soon as possible with even more options to consider with an emphasis on options that could possibly be more effective for alerting residents during the night when people are sleeping. So uh, with that, at this time, I wanna turn it over to our consultants, Pat McFeely and Brian Malinich, I'm not sure if I said that's right, sorry, Brian, uh, to provide an overview of the study and their recommendations. Good evening. I appreciate uh, your time tonight to uh, give us a few minutes to uh, go through this presentation for you and answer any questions afterwards. Uh, Mission Critical Partners, uh, as Susan pointed out, was um, contracted to uh, come in and take a look at uh, the feasibility of um, a outdoor warning system or a siren system in your community to uh, alert in case of uh, emergency. Uh, go to the first slide, please. Um, so as just a brief uh, outline, outdoor warning systems, it's used for alerting large area population. Um, it is outdoor alerting. Uh, as Susan pointed out, it is not uh, reliable for indoor coverage uh, due to the insulation of buildings. Um, people pay a lot of money to ensure that the outside noises aren't heard inside. Um, so that uh, does uh, reduce the coverage of uh, buildings, as you'll see as uh, Brian gets into the maps. Uh, sirens can be both sound, tone, or voice to give instructions, and they can be installed uh, so that they do not rely on public utilities, uh, which helps with the um, whenever you have fires or Santa Ana winds and the power goes off in the areas. Next slide, please. Uh, for the study, uh, when we met with um, your team to talk about it, we, we took a look at uh, the feasibility of alerting the public uh, with an outdoor warning system. Uh, we took a look at, uh, most vendors will take a look at ideal weather conditions for telling you what your sound coverages will be. Uh, we took it one step further to include some of your worst weather uh, it, and when you would be using them probably the most at, during fires during the Santa Ana winds. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, where tone would be needed or where voice would be used and uh, the benefits and drawbacks of both of those. Uh, we took a look at uh, how we could put this in place uh, with independent or being independent of the utilities uh, so that uh, power you would be using um, both utilities as well as uh, solar and other options. And uh, where we needed to focus our coverage on for the uh, fire prone areas. Next slide, please. Uh, so we first took a look at uh, city owned properties uh, for areas where we could possibly put the sirens uh, and what sort of coverage that would give us uh, for those key areas. We also looked at the, the key areas and where the best sirens, since this was a feasibility study, uh, we took into account um, where the best coverage can be provided with the sirens, not necessarily the exact location you can place the sirens. Uh, and we also looked at uh, right-of-ways and putting sirens within the right-of-ways to uh, try to also get the coverage in those areas. Uh, we did uh, software propagation for sound propagation. Um, so it would give an idea, uh, a visual of what would be covered and what wouldn't. 
uh, in three different scenarios. And Brian will be going through those scenarios. We took a look at uh, ideal conditions. We took a look at uh, Santa Ana winds. And we took a look at uh, indoor versus outdoor uh, for the coverage. Um, next slide, please. And Brian, I'll turn it over to you to get a little more technical on the uh, sound levels and into the uh, maps and recommendations. Okay, good evening. Um, I'll try and stay out of the weeds, uh, but before we get into the coverage maps, I thought I would step through uh, a little bit of the background and what goes into them. So this table here shows um, sound level examples to give you an idea um, what we're talking about here. So the left side shows dB, which is decibels, and that's how you measure sound. And from top to bottom, it shows uh, very loud to very soft. And the column to the right shows some description of what you can expect, you know, what is soft, what is very loud. Uh, when we design an outdoor warning system, it needs to be louder than the ambient noise level. Um, and typical industry standards um, is between the 70 and 80 dB threshold. And this chart just gives you an idea of what that looks like. And this chart uh, comes from a FEMA standard document um, that lays out these industry um, standard metrics that we use to design to. Um, next slide. Um, as Pat mentioned, one of the one additional scenario that the Malibu team asked us to look at was indoor. Even though this is an OWS or outdoor warning system, they wanted to know, okay you know, people are sleeping at night, what can we expect as far as indoor coverage? So um, this table comes from the same FEMA spec document and we pulled value, we used worst case value of 25 dB from this. On the left, it shows uh, light construction going down to heavy construction. So we used worst case for that and we subtracted 25 dB for that, that scenario. Next slide. Um, last slide, as Pat mentioned, uh, we wanted to uh, look at the effect of Santa Ana winds. Um, since the purpose of the primary purpose of this system is primarily to alert the public of wildfires, although it can be used for any other alerting, uh, like tsunamis, weather events, terrorism, things like that, the main purpose is wildfire. So, and there's a specific event that happens during wildfires that, that everyone on this call, I'm sure, is aware of are the winds that are created by fire and they're called Santa Ana winds. So uh, these winds will affect the performance of the system. So we wanted to make sure we looked at that as well and designed for that scenario. Next slide. So here's the table. Here's the scenarios we looked at. Um, we looked at three different scenarios and as Pat said, the baseline uh, was um, the sites that uh, the city provided in the RFP initially. They provided six sites that they owned. Um, so we used that as a baseline. Knowing that um, it would take more than six sites to cover the city, we use that as a baseline. Um, also, he mentioned earlier too, uh, tone versus voice. It, 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 this is a very fundamental question, a design question when you do a, a siren uh, design is, you're going to use tone only. You're going to alert with uh, tones and educate the public on what those different tones mean, or do you want to broadcast pre-recorded voice messages or live audio? If the answer is yes to voice, it's um, a whole different design. You have to be careful how loud the system is designed for, because if it's too loud, neighboring sirens will work against themselves, and you'll have really bad echoes and stuff. So. Um, you do have a requirement um, at, at Point Doom, the Civic Center area, and Zuma Beach. Uh, those are gathering areas for uh, evacuation, uh, potential gathering areas uh, in one of your plans that we reviewed. So in those areas, um, we designed those areas for uh, lower power in scenario two and three. So that's that's the reason for the different scenarios. And essentially, it's a mix of high and low power um, and it goes down to this voice versus tone requirement. So our recommendation um, was scenario number two. And we'll, we'll look at the maps here in one moment. Um, so scenario one is the, 
the least amount of sites. Scenario two is a good mix of high and low power. Um, higher power sirens will be at the northern boundary. And then scenario three is absolute worst case for if you have a voice requirement citywide. As you can see, it really drives the number of sites up. Um, so we just we wanted to look at these scenarios and sort of show you the the range of a worst case. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So there's like 12 maps. Um, for, for sake of time this evening, we're just going to show you scenario 2A, unless there's any additional questions. Um, but this map here shows our our recommended design. Uh, for this feasibility. Uh, this is a mix of high and low power sirens. Um, it's 20 sites. And like I mentioned before, the low power sirens are in the areas where you have a voice announcement requirement. And this is a, this is sunny day right here. Next slide is uh, the picks. And, and uh, if you watch the transition be between the slides, you can see uh, you lost coverage at your northern boundary there. And these are arbit arbitrary sites at the northern boundary. Again, this is feasibility design. But this shows you the effect of Santa Ana winds. Essentially, those winds come from the north to roughly 40 miles an hour, and they can really push um, that sound. Um, so, again, it's critical to look at this when you, when you design it. Uh, next slide. And here's more... For informational purposes, um, this shows absolute worst case. This is painting the worst picture for in building, but here's the, that additional scenario that the, that the city asks us to look at. So we took that previous map and subtracted 25 dB from it, essentially. And then uh, the next slide shows in building uh, with Santa Ana winds. So with that, I'll uh, hand it back to Pat. Thanks, Brian. Um, so one of the things that, that we took a look at, and there's there's a couple of more maps we have after this that show the different scenarios. Um, so feasibility-wise, uh, outdoor warning system is, is feasible for Malibu. Um, what you're looking at is up in the hills, probably doing more of a sound versus voice. Um, and the reason for that is as much as when you have the Santa winds, as much as it pulls the sound into the other areas, it's going to be very hard to model and very hard to uh, adjust the sirens to give you perfect voice each time. Um, down in the gathering areas, we looked at uh, definitely doing voice there because you would be able to do centralized um, sirens around that area that would then cover those areas, even with uh, the Santa Ana winds pulling that sound uh, further out to you off land versus uh, towards uh, closer in, inland. Um, but this is, these are just uh, a couple of different scenarios we looked at. We looked at multiple ones. Um, but as Brian said, we kind of took a look at uh, anywhere from probably the 20 to 20 uh, or 33 siren scenarios uh, would be able to cover your area. Um, one of the things that we uncovered as we were going through the um, the study was the, the need or the requirement uh, for more of waking people up in the middle of the night, um, being able to get them out of bed uh, versus just alerting outdoors. Uh, so siren systems are, are just one tool in the toolbox um, that you have for alerting the public. Uh, there's uh, multiple other types of systems you can put in. Um, that would be able to do indoor alerting, uh, either uh, tone alert radios, advisor alert radios, uh, something similar to what you get from the uh, weather service with weather radios uh, that you would be able to then activate or take over to make announcements into, uh, into indoors uh, versus outdoors. So there, there's a lot of different tools out there that you can use um, moving forward uh, for your alert warning um, scenario or toolkit. I guess it, we got went over this pretty fast. Um, I know you guys are stuck for time, um, but uh, I guess any questions?
Councilors? Mikey, may, Mikey, may I suggest we go to public comment? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. How, how many public speakers do we have? We do not have any public speakers <clears throat> for this item. Oh, well, that, that was a long lift right there. Whew, that was hard. How about we go back to councilor questions? Uh, Rick? Yeah, great presentation. I think that uh, I can see the wisdom in placing them sort of up canyon, upwind for the maximum benefit of, you know, the um, acoustics of the canyon, et cetera. I think that's really smart. That seems wise. So no, that's good, a great presentation. Yeah, the, the one thing that you will have to be careful on that is um, as you put them closer and closer to your border, uh, you're, we can't cut the sound off at your border. Um, so you will have bleed over into other um, areas. Uh, so if you move forward with any sort of solution, I would make sure your neighbors are well aware of what you're doing uh, and have that discussion with them that on days that you don't have Santa Ana winds, if you utilize the siren systems, you will have bleed over into, into their areas um, that they will be here, their, their people will be hearing. Well, that's an excellent point and we want to be courteous, but I suspect most yep. of them will want to hear the sirens, that's for sure. I agree. Do you, do you know, does the sound bleed up into the uh, up Corral Canyon area? Um, not sure of the exact areas. Uh, if we pull up the, the map, you, we can see, and a lot of it will depend on the final placement of the sirens. Um, so what we did here was feasibility. Uh, next stage would be coming in to do a uh, more detailed engineering study of seeing where you have power, um, what you can do. Um, but if you take a look at that map of, of the 20 siren site on a normal, perfect, beautiful day, little wind, uh, you do see you do have a lot of bleed over into a lot of your different uh, areas there. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Skylar? Thanks, Mikey. Um, has any has there been any conversation, maybe Reva would be able to answer this, with the county about working with them and them also implementing something like this in the Santa Monica Mountains? I haven't had any of those conversations, but we certainly could take that direction from you this evening if that's something you'd like us to pursue. I just, I feel like if we're going to do this and, you know, I, I mean, I get, this is a public safety thing. So I sort of consider a, a lot of the people that may live in unincorporated LA County as being very much part of our community and always have. And I think that um, in terms of the design and looking at the fact that maybe placing some of these up canyons is more benefit beneficial and how the, the sound can be dispersed that it would probably be pretty wise to at least direct you to have a little bit of a conversation with them and see if they're open to it. Um, Cause that may, that may affect how, I mean, that would obviously affect how this whole thing would be designed. You know, I mean, at least we could, you could have the conversation with them and that can either say, you know, maybe go down that road or don't go down that road at all. Um, I mean, obviously you want to know whether or not council wants to do this, you know, whether or not they're involved or not, but I think it would be, I think it would be smart for, for somebody to, to approach them and have that conversation. And then uh, I, I feel that going to the, the, like the more like the siren based system where there's like a sound is something that just takes, it's, it takes time to be learned by the, by the population. And um I feel it's something that are, you know, we have a very intelligent community. I do believe that people would learn that over time. I just feel that sometimes you can maybe get more of a message out with the audio. Um, I think the, and, and then I, I had a, a question actually for these guys is in other areas where I've been exposed to the siren based systems, mostly Hawaii, those are, are tested on a, I believe it's a monthly basis, Correct. right? Would a system like yep. this you need to be tested out loud on a monthly or more frequent or less frequent basis? Or can the newer systems kind of be done like you, you know it's working, you know, sort of you said like the two-way thing where they can communicate back and forth to the base or whatever? 
Correct. So, so the newer systems um, have a lot of different features that, that I think a lot of the ones that are currently uh, for the tsunami around Hawaii do not have. Um, they allow for uh, self-reporting back uh, self-diagnostics on the system. Um, but it also allows for sound tests. Uh, and what it does, it uh, does a sound test at a very high frequency um, that humans can't hear. Uh, so instead of uh, you getting every week or every month, depending on what your testing schedules uh, are decided to be, um, you test it at this very high frequency. May may affect some dogs. It's in that range of like a dog whistle or higher. Um, so it is actively um, testing the whole system, but it allows you to hear it. Uh, the other thing that, um, that that we probably would recommend is every so often schedule it at a noon time and do Westminster chimes or, or something like that, um, just so that the people know that they're there. It, it gives also a comfort level of hey, there are sirens around. We can hear them. We, we know we're covered. Um, so it all comes down to in the final design of how you want to test those systems. Um, but you definitely can test them without people ever hearing anything on them. Um, to the to the point of uh, voice or tone, um, your voice sirens can do both tone and voice. Uh, normally, you will start off with the tone. Uh, people my age were were uh, well known with the weather tones, uh, just because anytime we're listening to radio or watching TV. You got those. Uh, nowadays, everybody's streaming everything, so you really don't get those test messages at much anymore. Um, so I think that's the most well-known tones that are out there. Um, but uh, you definitely started off with a tone, and then you could do voice. Uh, the concern with your voice um, is you're going to be using, on a clear day, your voice is probably going to be fine. Uh, but once you start throwing the Santa Ana winds in there and they start mixing together, you may get some reverberation of the sound from multiple sirens covering different areas um, just because it's pushing that sound into the other areas. And that's some on a lot of voice systems. That's the, the biggest complaint you get is when I need it, it, it's the worst conditions. And you can't say that it's always going to be 40 mile an hour winds or it's always going to be 30. Um, so it's a lot harder to uh, dial those systems in for what is the ideal weather you're going to have when you use them. Um, I mean, so I just realize on some of that. I, I, I think for us here that in the event that this would be used, if we're just talking wildfire, and this is not obviously the tsunami world, um, that I would anticipate if the fire is that bad we're probably in conditions where it's at least up in the canyon area that the winds going 40 knots are significantly higher than yeah. that i think in the incident that uh, got us to really have this conversation the wind was blowing significantly higher than that probably upwards in the 70 plus mile an hour range at many of the areas in the canyon at times maybe not consistent yeah. but you know gusting so, but but I think the good thing that, that you say in there is that you can that the system that's going to do voice is also going to be able to do the siren. So you can correct wearing the siren. That's a notification. The voice comes on. You go back to the siren. It's dead for ten minutes and then comes back on or something like that. Um, yeah, and, but, and one of the, one of the ways you can get around that is instead of having the voice go off on every siren at the same time, you can stagger. Um, so that one siren does the message, then you do the, the next one. Um, and that will help with some of the issues of being able to understand it. Another thing you can do with the sirens, um, especially when you get out into wildfire areas, if it's, if it's, uh, you don't have that much of a population that area, or even if you do, um, you can actually have mics in the control units on the boxes of the sirens themselves. So that if a fire, um, the personnel are up there or, or someone authorized is up there that's able to open the cabinet can just take a mic out and talk over that siren as well. So it does give you a lot of different options there as you implement a system like that for outdoor warning. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and then the, you, you talked about the construction of them a little bit. I think that it would be smart uh, if this is explored further council that we go with the 
steel pole that's painted and maybe make it look brown so it, or you know like kind of what Edison did on part of the poles on Malibu Canyon um, and it's my understanding that this would be not um, it, each of these units even though you would say that they would have you know they're all AC powered for the most part we would probably set all these up just to be on solar with the newer technology not connected to the grid at all. Correct. Our recommendation on it is actually to have both um, where possible. Um, you solar will, so, so the way the sirens work is, is there's, um, you have batteries that actually run the siren um, because the charger isn't enough just to run the siren. So it pulls that much amperage out the, out the start. Uh, so it's running off batteries all the time. So what you're doing is you're replenishing the batteries. So you can either do that through solar, which takes a longer period of time, uh, or you can do it through um, regular power uh, from the grid, which will charge them a little quicker. Um, the reason we would recommend solar within your uh, area is the first thing that happens during Santa Ana winds and fire prone uh, times, um, they shut the power off. Uh, so our recommendation would be to have the solar there to be able to keep the batteries going, keep the charge going for the period of time that you uh, want that siren to be available. That's good. Um, picking up on what Skylar said, I, I agree with the metal poles. We lost over 1,800 uh, poles in the last fire, wood poles. So if putting these on wood poles would make no sense. And they... And I'm curious with the metal poles in a large fire event, what sort of damage could we expect to the to the system? It would all depend on the proximity to where the large Yeah. Fire. Keep it away it, from the it bushes. Depends how hot the <laughs> depends <laughs> how hot the fire is gonna be. Um, I mean, we've all seen where metal poles melt, uh, if, if you have that much of an intense fire. Um, I think it all depends where it's at, and what's around it, and, and how intense that fire could be. Um, I think in any scenario you're looking at, um, if there's direct fire hitting the pole, uh, you're going to lose the siren and the equipment on it, um, just from the heat aspect of it. Um, just think of uh, car batteries are used, to, or, or boat batteries, or, or depending on the, the, the type of battery they stick in for the particular unit, depending on the vendor. Um, just think if, if a car got close to a fire, what's left of a car. So the right public scenario. right away makes more sense of some sort. Yeah, I would say it's going to be the easiest for you to probably implement um, just because it's public right away. Uh, but we will still have to go through um, all the different hoops you'll have to go through for your SECA uh, and things like that and ship up. As far as the heat, there's a couple things you can do. You can do heat shields on the equipment cabinets and implement uh, plenum rated cabling just to prolong, just to get more hours out of the system before it burns down. But yeah, it'd be hard to fireproof at 100%. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, any more questions, counselors? Karen? Um, I just wanted to say that, uh, well, what Mikey just pointed out, we lost 1,800 power poles in the Woolsey fire. And, you know, we lost power because of the fire, not because of a power shutoff or, or if there was a shutoff, it was just incidental to, to the fire. Um, and I just want to remind everybody on the council, um, here we are, the anniversary, the second anniversary of the Woolsey fire and public safety is our number one priority. You know, we voted on that the two years that Mikey and I have been on the council. Um, I'd like to see this happen as soon as possible. Um, I'm, I'm ready to make a motion if nobody else has any comments. Jefferson, I know you haven't spoken yet. I don't wanna make the motion sooner uh, than we're ready to, but um, I'd like to move ahead and, and uh, provide direction to staff to, to take the next step to see this system implemented. I'll second that. Okay, um, Skylar. Um, I just wanna make sure that we put in there that we 
elect Reva or somebody else to have a, a real solid conversation with the county uh, and even maybe our COG for that matter. Because I don't know, um, there's always economies of scale when these things are getting built. But uh, I think it would be important to just to explore that. And we, and we wouldn't want to go in and put something in that wasn't able to work if the system is expanded or something like that. Um, and I think that the cost on this look like they could be higher than what's in here. And I think that we should get some more adequate costs to come back to the city that cover, uh, you know, the concrete or not con well, yeah, concrete based steel pole or galvanized pole that's, you know, painted, whatnot, um, so that we have real costs and we're not, you know, kind of thinking it's going to be a million dollars in total and we go out to get, you know, grant money and whatnot and it's a million and a half or two million. Yep. I just want to mention uh, one thing on uh, November 18th, I am having a meeting with the County Office of Emergency Management because they are now looking at the Santa Monica Mountains as a whole and they plan on expanding on the zones for the whole Santa Monica Mountains. And at that meeting, I will also bring up the, the siren issue because it seems like it would go hand in hand with that effort. So I can bring it up there and see what they say. And I'll, I'll pursue a conversation with the supervisor's office as well as with our COG on that. And, uh, sorry, I had one more question and I'm sure it's not too complicated, but in my understanding of a lot of the other siren systems is you sort of have to activate all of them. But in this, you could just activate, like if you only wanted to activate five of the 20 for a certain area, you could activate those. Like for example, in this last fire, I don't know if it would have made it sense to be activating sirens down you know, in the Big Rock area when we were dealing with the majority of the issues in, in the more Western part of the city. Sure. So, so with the software and, and the advancements in siren systems, you, you it's not activate all at once. Um, you can set up predetermined uh, pre zones um, that you can activate. Um, some of the manufacturer software actually lets you to uh, geofence it, um, and then it will pick up any sirens that cover that geofenced area. Uh, so there's a lot of different options today of, of how you activate those sirens. Uh, expandability of the system. Um, basically, what we usually recommend at implementation, especially in an area like you, uh, your area is um, it would be radio signal that would activate them. So you would have transmitters that would activate them. Um, doesn't matter how many sirens you now stick on the system, as long as that radio or that radio signal can hit it and it's part of your system, um, it will work. Uh, we're in the midst of uh, taking a look at implement a 90 siren system uh, in Madison County, uh, Kentucky. Actually, we're going to reduce it to 70 because they're going to tone only. Um, but uh, so it, there is no limit of what you would be tied into uh, if you wanted to try to expand out into uh, other um, entities. And, and, and if you choose to, you could have a, a direct automatic hook to the, the national iPod system. And all that could be, some of these alerts could be automated like the weather alerts and things like that. And it would look at uh, the geofencing like Pat said and automatically select what region, um, where the alerts would be alerted at. Okay. Jefferson. Oh, you're, you're muted. There you go. And we have so many visitors in the canyons now, it would seem wise to uh, include the canyon area at least up to the 90265 boundary because the bleed over would just simply go into some of Joe's properties, Joe Edmiston's properties, and the MRCA, which we could uh, maybe ask him to can help contribute on this effort. I have one brief question on the uh, indoor ones like uh, Amber Alert or something like that. So the city currently has systems that we could adopt to those indoor alerts as well, along with our phone messaging. Is that correct? 
That's correct, um, Councilmember Wagner. Uh, we um, participate in WIA, which is the Wireless Emergency Alert System, which allows us to issue alerts to cell phones, um, comes across like the Amber Alert um, and pings off of cell towers. So you'll, whoever is in that vicinity would get an alert. Thank you. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, so uh, we have a motion and a second. Councilmember Fair, I just wanted to confirm, did you accept the amendment from Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. And Councilmember Mullen is a seconder. Do you also accept that amendment? I do. Okay. Roll call, please. Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yeah. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right, you too. Okay, we're on to 6B, Professional Services Agreement with Quinto Consulting uh, LP for City Treasurer Services. Yeah, I'll handle this one actually, if I could, you know, it was a administration and finance subcommittee deal. And uh, as you know, the city council hires and fires only three people, city manager, city attorney, and the treasurer, treasurer, which is like a rare, rarely known position. And um seemingly limited role and at the administration finance committee, you know, our current treasurer was uh, having some health problems. So we wanted to explore um, not only hiring a new person, we put out an RFP for it, but also uh, potentially expanding the role of the treasurer to deal with the number of financial issues that the city deals with. So we did send it out you only got one response, but we actually pretty darn good one, I would say, when you consider uh, her resume, that's Ruth um, Quinto. And, you know, she's done uh, quite a bit of things in larger municipalities to include uh, Fresno and Moreno Valley. And she has a pretty good resume that I'm sure you've all read. And we're not only is, you know, when, she, when we were first talking to her, I thought, oh, well, you know, is this going to be like a a Zoom type thing? Is she going to be in Fresno? But no, she's going to be a member of the community and actually live in the city when she's moving here. So um, we interviewed her uh, at our last meeting and I think that we've got a pretty good, we've got a pretty darn good pick here. So that's what this is all about. And uh, I think it's, I, th I think it's a good move in the right direction. And I would like to see the city um, treasure assume a more visible and active role in the city's financial dealings. So are there any questions for anybody or Skylar, you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. I see, I see Ruthie is, uh, is here with us and, uh, you've waited hours only to be you know, just easily accepted and appreciated. Now, did you want to say anything? Now that she's got a peek at what she's in for, she might be heading for the door though. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, good evening, Mayor Pearson, members of the city council and city manager Feldman. And thank you so much. It is my pleasure actually to participate in the civic process here. Um, obviously um, have been through quite a few uh, council meetings and school board meetings. And um, you'd be happy to know that uh, you're not an uh, outlier. So <laughs> I completely understand. And it, uh, it's actually very um, heartwarming to have such an involved community um, in your processes. So I, I appreciate that very much. If, if there's anything else I need to add regarding my background or experience, I'd be happy to do so. Um, I My husband and I are uh, delighted to be residents of um, the city of Malibu. We moved into our little place um, 
a few weeks ago and I'm enjoying it very much. Um, and just so that the council and the public know, um, it is an important tenant of my overall uh, outlook to serve the community in which I, I live and, and enjoy. Um, and I've had the pleasure of doing that uh, while I was in Southern California and Moreno Valley and then um, for the last 20 years in Fresno, which is my hometown. But our two older children are graduates of UCLA and they're settled in Santa Monica. And that is um, uh, what we want to do is be settled in Southern California once again. So we're happy to be here and I'm very pleased and humbled that you're considering my contract this evening. Thank you. Excellent and a very impressive resume and, um, and great to hear from the ANF um, committee there. Um, maybe one of you would uh, venture a motion. I would like to make a motion that we hire this fine professional who is willing to not only assume the responsibilities as city treasurer, but wants to plant her flag right here in the city of Malibu and be a part of the community. Fine to second this tax paying citizen. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And just for the record, the, the motion is the staff recommendation to approve the contract. Yes. Correct. Okay, excellent. Well, let's have roll call and see how it goes. We didn't have any public speakers, right? I was going to mention oh. for the record, we do not have any public speakers. Great, thank you item. for bringing that up. I thank you. Sorry about that. So the roll call vote, Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Welcome aboard. Thank you Welcome very much. Welcome to the team. Thank you. Look, look forward to uh, when we can actually meet in person. That'll be great. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you. Okay. We're flying along here and uh, we're at item 4A, appeal number 20-006, appeal of planning commission resolution number 20-18 at 23325 Malibu Colony Drive. Um, can we have a staff report, please? Of course. Good evening, Mayor Pearson and honorable members of the City Council. The project was this project was approved by the Planning Commission in June of this year and was appealed by a neighbor of the project site who raised several issues. This presentation will provide an overview of the proposed project, the issues raised by the appellant and the staff and staff's response to each issue. Next slide, please. The project is located on the northeasternmost property within the Malibu Colony Overlay District that is accessed by a private road. The site is less than one third of an acre in size and is developed with an existing single family residence, a guest house and associated development. The site is bounded to the north and east by the Malibu Lagoon that is designated as a wetland Esha. And to the west of the site are single family residences and to the south are beachfront residences. The required 100 foot ESHA buffer from the wetland encompasses the entire property and development within this buffer area is unavoidable. Accordingly, the project is limited to a development area that must not exceed 25% the lot size. Next slide, please. The project includes the demolition of the existing residence and the construction of a new uh, residence that totals a little bit over 5,200 square feet. Um, there's also a swimming pool um, grading, the replacement of the septic system, landscaping, and associated development. Next slide, please. This slide provides a couple of elevations. The first, the, the top um, image is the image is the reflection of the residence that faces the street. Um, the image on the bottom is the east elevation that faces Surf Rider Beach. Next slide, please. Tonight, the council is considering the an appeal of the Planning Commission's approval of this project. 
In addition to concerns um, raised about the project's compliance with the LCP, the appellate contends that the city used the incorrect FEMA maps in its analysis of potential flood hazards. The septic tank um, size, they also um, contend that the septic tank size does not comply with the requirements established in the Malibu Municipal Code. There's also contentions that the project does not conform to the city's policy for environmental health review um, for development proposed within the Civic Center Prohibition Area. Next slide, please. The first LCP compliance issue raised by the appellant is related to increased eliminate, uh, illumination of the ESHA. This, this site is one of 14 properties that border the Malibu Lagoon ESHA. Based on visual analysis submitted, which include photo simulations and a photometric study, staff determined that the project lighting as proposed and conditioned would not result in light, mi light migration beyond the property boundaries. Um, this image shows, includes a picture of the story poles on the left, and then there's a photo simulation of the proposed residence on the right. And as demonstrated, the project will not include, would not result in increased illumination of the, of the ESHA. Next slide, please. And here's another image. This one is taken from the state park to the north of the site. Again, the image on the left shows the story pole placement and the image on the right shows how illumination will actually decrease as a result of the project. Next slide, please. The next LCP um, compliance issue raised by the appellant is the project's compliance with the maximum 25% development area. This slide shows how the existing development area um, is approximately 69% of the project um, of the lot size. Um, and the proposed um, project at the bottom shows the development's compliance with the 25% development area. The LCP's definition of development area allows the exclusion of an access driveway, a fire department turnaround area, and graded slopes if it is not feasible from an engineering standpoint to include the project grading in a development area. The project's coastal and civil engineers recommend the placement of approximately one foot of fill across the entire site to minimize potential flooding due to wave action and to assure the property drains away from the ESHA. The appellant believes the perimeter walls that are necessary to retain the additional fill should be counted in a development area. However, staff believes, believes the engineered grading and the associated walls have been properly excluded from the development area calculations. Next slide, please. The next LCP compliance issue raised by the appellant is related to the maximum height of 18 feet that is required to minimize impacts to the public's view of scenic areas. Staff has to conducted um, on-site visual analysis and consider the supplemental visual analysis prepared by the applicant, which is what you're looking at here, um, and determine that because of the backdrop of the existing development pattern that includes two and three-story residences in the area, that the project does not result in impacts to the public's views of scenic areas. Next slide, please. And this is another image of the residents. Um, the image on the left, and I regret I didn't highlight the story polls, but it shows how the project does blend in with the existing development pattern of the area. Next slide, please. The next LCP compliance issue raised by the appellant is related to proper sea level rise analysis conducted for the project. Although the project the site does not front the beach, staff determined that because the site is subject to wave action, that coastal engineering analysis is required. 
the white arrows outlined in blue show the direction of wave action analysis that was initially submitted for the, for the application that included sea level rise projections, which used the California Coastal Commission's recommendations for sea level rise projection scenarios. In response to this appeal, the project coastal engineer provided supplemental analysis, which is illustrated by the blue area at the bottom of your screen. This additional analysis determined that there was a potential for a water bore, bore of 18 inches to reach the property. As recommended by the city coastal engineer, the project has been conditioned to require floodgates to be installed in segments of the perimeter walls that have openings. After extensive sea level rise analysis reviewed in this application, staff has determined that the project is consistent with the shoreline development um, requirements of the LCP. The appellant has also raised a concern about compliance with the city's, uh, the LCP's five foot setback requirement for septic tanks when a two foot setback was originally proposed um, with this application. The Malibu Municipal Code contains additional standards for septic system design that allows the five foot setback to be reduced if the project incorporates recommendations by a civil engineer or geologist, as was the case in this application. However, since the filing of this appeal, the applicant has slightly shifted the septic tanks to comply with the five foot setback. And this is the only change in the subject application. Next slide, please. The appellant expressed a concern related to the procedure for coastal, excuse me, for cultural resource uh, review, which requires the city to notify the Native American Heritage Commission, the State Historic Preservation Officer, and the most likely descendant at every stage of the cultural resource review. Staff's initial review of the project, based, which was based on the city's archeology span maps. Um, it was also based on the fact that the, of the extensive development on the property and the fact that the site is subject to wave action, that there is a low potential for impacts to cultural resources. Although the project included standard conditions of approval to minimize potential impacts to cultural resources, during the Planning Commission's deliberation on this project, additional conditions were added to require a qualified archeologist to monitor all grading and earth, um, not all grade, I be believe it was up to two feet of grading and um, earth moving activities. Although there's no evidence to demonstrate potential impacts to cultural resources, staff did provide public notice to the aforementioned interested parties. Staff received a request from the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians for a formal consultation on this project. However, uh, because the consultation, this, this particular consultation is only applicable to projects reviewed under CEQA, i.e. if there was an initial study prepared on the project, the formal uh, consultation is not needed for this project. Next slide, please. Regarding the use of the appropriate FEMA maps, in 2016, FEMA updated the 2008 FEMA maps, and both maps are um, included here on this slide. The top map from 2008 shows the project site is within zone AO, um, was, is it within the flood zone AO. However, the updated maps, the map at the bottom, no longer include zone AO in this area and also show that the project site is no, is no longer located in, but is adjacent to the flood zone. The 2016 FEMA map is considered preliminary until it is formally adopted. The city's floodplain administrator 
who is the city's public works director, is responsible for implementing FEMA regulations related to flood hazards, which require the use of the latest information available. In this case, the 2016 maps are the latest information uh, available and the city's use of this map is consistent with FEMA regulations. Next slide, please. The appellant contends that the septic tank size does not comply with the size requirements of the Malibu Municipal Code. Based on the, pro based on the proposed number of bedrooms and water fixture units, the project requires a 2,750 gallon septic tank capacity. The project includes a 1,500 gallon septic tank and a second 1,500 gallon septic tank that includes advanced an advanced treatment processor for a combined total of 3,000 gallon, gallon capacity um, septic tank, making it consistent with the Malibu Municipal Code septic tank size requirements. Next slide, please. The last contention raised by the appellant is related to consistency with the MOU between the city of Malibu and the Regional Water Quality Control Board that establishes timeframes to cease wastewater discharge from septic systems in the Civic Center Prohibition area. In an effort to provide guidance to the public, the city published a policy for the review of septic systems within this prohibition area that isn't intended to prevent repairs and upgrades as long as the system does not result in increased flows of wastewater. This slide includes the calculations for the wastewater flow, which is based on the number of bedrooms of residential development. The top equation shows how the existing two bedroom house results in a 450, um, gallons per day um, wastewater flow. The existing development also includes a detached guest house, which is also um, calculated at 300 gallons per day, where the existing um, calculated gallons per day wastewater flow is 750. The project includes a four bedroom house where the initial bedroom is rated at 300 gallons per day and each additional bedroom is rated at 150 gallons per day, which results in the same amount of calculated wastewater flow for this project. Moreover, because the project will include the use of high efficiency, low flow water fixture units, the, the projected wastewater flow will actually result in 490 gallons per day. Next slide, please. Since the staff report was published, um, staff has received additional correspondence from the appellant who reiterated concerns raised in the appeal. Staff has also received the applicant's response to the appellant's correspondence, both of which were distributed to the city council. Next slide, please. In conclusion, based on the evidence on the record, staff recommends the city council adopt resolution number 20-55, denying the appeal and approving the subject coastal development permit. In addition to my availability to answer any of your questions, the following staff members are also available. Lauren Doyle and Mike Phipps, who both serve as the city's coastal engineer, Melinda Talent, who serves as the city's environmental health administrator. Rob DeBoe, who was the city's public works director who, and who also serves as the floodplain administrator. Yolanda Bundy, who was the city's environmental health sustainability director and building official. And Richard Malika, who was the city's acting planning director. Thank you. Thank you, Renika. Uh, great report. Um, I know we have speakers. 
We do. We don't have any public speakers at this time, but we do have representatives from both the appellant and applicant team. Um, okay. So each team will have 15 minutes to present and they can request us withhold time for rebuttal. Um, and if we don't withhold time, whatever is left at the end of their presentation will be available for rebuttal. Okay. So Excellent. the applicant team is Monica Brezeno and Ken Ehrlich. I don't see Ken in the meeting. So I think if we can unmute Monica first, she can start. Hi, good evening, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and council members. You have both Ken Ehrlich and Monica Brezeno here. Um, of our 15 minutes, we'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. And we also have a PowerPoint presentation. If staff can please queue it up, we'd appreciate that as well. The, the first slide uh, says appeal number 20-006. I don't believe that's our presentation. Yeah, the first page, just to try to help staff, is a, uh, a map with Malibu Lagoon State Beach, the project site outlined in yellow, and our writing that says appeal number 20-006, and then smaller writing 23325 Malibu Colony Drive. It was provided to staff uh, more than a week ago. Mikey, are you waiting for a PowerPoint to get pulled up? Uh, yeah, we're waiting. Yeah. Waiting for a PowerPoint. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're resending it now if it helps, but uh, it certainly was uh, sent and submitted more than a week ago. Uh, Mayor, um, staff is having trouble locating that uh, presentation, so I apologize for the delay. If uh, that, okay. uh, we could have it resent, we'll get it up immediately. And again, apologize for that. Thank you, Ken, for sending it again. Absolutely. And We're including the city manager on our email, just in case. Perfect. And thanks for your patience. I know it's been a long night. Thank you all for serving. Ken, did you send it? Because I'm not receiving it. We did. We sent it about 30 to 40 seconds ago. It's a four megabyte PowerPoint file, relatively small. Should be able to get it. Did we send it to? We sent it to Renika, Riva, and Alex. Okay. Alex, can you see if you have it? I don't have it. I don't, oh, I just got it. Give me one. As did I. Okay, one more moment and we'll get it loaded up. Thanks for your patience.
Perfect. Thank you. This is an instance, Mr. Mayor and Council, where we, with, with all due respect to staff and the split majority of the Planning Commission, we believe that staff and the Planning Commission have just gotten it wrong at this critical project, which is one, which is the first inland project that folks see coming inland from Malibu Lagoon State Beach. For example, just to show how the, the LIP, the LCP and, and Malibu Municipal Code is being contorted here, what I heard in the staff report just now is that well, perimeter walls that are needed to contain fill at this project should not be counted as walls and therefore don't equal part of the square, put, square footage of the entire project. That's exactly the type of language and interpretation that we're dealing with throughout this entire report. Monica, my colleague, is going to cover areas that are, we're focusing on for our appeal, including the building footprint itself, incomplete sea level rise analysis, illegal lighting, non-conformance with water usage requirements, and the ignorance of citywide height requirements. I'll defer the rest of our 10 minutes of time now to my colleague, Monica Briseño. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members, Monica Briseño. If I could please have the next slide. Next slide, please. First, we appreciate that as a result of the appeal, staff and applicant took steps to correct some of the violations, including providing the required archeological notice, clarifying the septic tank capacity and moving the septic tanks to account for the proper setbacks. The changes, however, highlight the root problem of this project. The applicant designed a project and then tried to fit that project into the applicable regulation. As a result, we had and continue to have a staff report that attempts to ensure that the LCP and municipal code conform to the project rather than have the project conform to the LCP and municipal code. This simply does not work. Next slide. First, as Mr. Ehrlich mentioned, staff continues to improperly omit development categories, including walls from the total development area. Next slide. According to the project plan, certain development is exempt per Malibu Planning Department. No explanation was initially provided for such exemptions. In response to the appeal, and as we just heard at the staff report, rather than address this apparent oversight, the response is that walls are not walls if they are on a graded slope. However, the response is neither correct nor reasonable. The project continues to exceed the allowable development area. Next slide. LIP section 4.7.1 limits the allowable development area for the property to 25% of the parcel size. The city's LIP defines development area to include, among other things, all structures. A structure in turn is defined as anything constructed or erected which requires a fixed location on the ground. Septic tanks and walls are structures. The LIP does allow for limited exclusions, including a 20 foot wide driveway, one hammerhead turnaround and certain grading. However, it does not exclude walls or a septic tank. Next slide. Staff and applicant now argue that the walls should not be included because they are necessary to quote, retain the grading required to minimize flooding. In other words, the walls are not walls, but part of the engineered graded slope. However, six foot walls are certainly not necessary to retain the grading noted. Staff acknowledges this much, noting that the additional height serves other purposes not subject to the exemption. As such, the six foot walls cannot be excluded from the development area as graded slopes. Moreover, the argument that walls are needed for the engineered slope is circular because the gradient is required due to the improper siting of the project within an area subject to wave action. As emphasized numerous times by staff, the current project will be subject to wave action. Finally, there is also no explanation for the exclusion of the other site walls that seem to have been omitted from the most recent staff report. Ultimately, the LCP is clear in what is included in the development area and the project exceeds the allowable development area when all proper development is included. Next slide. Similarly, city staff failed again to consider the height restrictions under the Scenic Visual and Hillside Resources Protection Ordinance. Next slide, please. LIP section 6.2 
clearly provides that all CDP applications concerning any parcel of land that is visible from any scenic road or public viewing area must be governed by the ordinance. As acknowledged by staff, the project will be visible from Malibu Lagoon State Beach, Beach and PCH, a public viewing area and scenic road respectively. Pursuant to the applicable development standards, the maximum allowable height for non-beachfront lots must be 18 feet or where found appropriate through site plan review increased. However, the applicant here did not apply for a site plan review. As such, the maximum allowable height is 18 feet. I'd also note that it is irrelevant that the project purportedly will not block blue water views. Next slide. Despite the clear application of the scenic visual and hillside resource protection ordinance, the staff report erroneously concludes that the Malibu Colony Overlay District overrides the specific standards of the ordinance. It does not. LIP section 3.4.1 specifically provides that the overlay districts replace the residential property development and design standards found in section 3.6 of the Malibu LIP. It does not replace all other development standards, including those in the scenic visual and hillside resources protection ordinance. The project is subject to the height limit. The lack of discussion of the benefit to public visual resources from the lowering of the height to a one story is also not sufficient in the staff report. The project will add mass to an area currently visible to those visiting and walking, walking the public trail that runs behind the property. Simply, the project as proposed violates the scenic visual and hillside resource protection ordinance. Next slide. Recently, the Coastal Commission provided guidance to the city and made clear that the appropriate sea level rise analysis for development in the Malibu area should be a medium high risk aversion, high emission sea level scenario, 8.5 feet by 2120. Nonetheless, in another example of staff attempting to make the LCP conform to the project instead of the project to the LCP, staff deviates from its own prior request that the applicant analyze sea level rise for the 100 year life of the project to 75 years. This is clearly contrary to the city's LCP, which clearly defines the life of the project as 100 years. It is also contrary to staff's prior request for a 100 year analysis. Notably, if the applicant found that the project would be subject to wave action under the current improper scenario, it can only be worse under a proper analysis. Next slide. We highlight recent correspondence to the city from the California Coastal Commission clearly noting that the proper analysis should be 8.5 feet by 2120. We further want to note that the concerns surrounding the floodgates put into light the fact that this wall around the perimeter will essentially function, function as a de facto seawall contrary to the LCP. Next slide. In another example of staff attempting to contort the LCP to conform to the project, Staff again failed to properly examine the new ESHA impacts from the increased lighting at a higher elevation, including around the proposed swimming pool. Illumination at a new height will create a scenic impact for those visiting the trail and create potential for increased light impact to ESHA. Importantly, the increase in height is not by right. Next slide. We'd like to point out that the applicant photos appear to emit views from the public trail that runs behind the property. Next slide. As with the development standards under the Scenic Visual and Hillside Resources Protection Ordinance, the overlay district does not supersede the ESHA development standards, which prohibit night lighting for private recreational facilities and ESHA buffer. The project as proposed violates these development standards. Next slide. Finally, the Civic Center Prohibition Area prohibits development in the area that expands the capacity of the systems or increases the wastewater flows. Staff and the applicant argue that a 5,220 square foot project will not necessarily have less wastewater flows as originally argued, but based on bedroom count, it will have the same flows as the original 1,080 square foot house. Now, appellant understands that technology allows for wastewater systems to become smaller and use less water but it defies logic to simply accept that a 5,000 plus square foot house with 64 water fixtures, five bathrooms, a pool and pool amenities will produce the same wastewater or now even less flow 
than the existing 1,080 square foot house. It is also concerning that the analysis appears to once again change in this recent report, which is another example of staff attempting to conform set standards to the project as opposed to the projects and standards. A rational reading of the evidence leads to the conclusion that as approved, wastewater flows to the project will exceed historic flows. Next slide. In conclusion, the project continues to violate the city's LPP and municipal code, and the city council should nullify the project approvals. Thank you. Thank you. We'll reserve the rest of our time. And on the um, Marnie Randall, uh, sorry, on the applicant team, Marnie Randall and Steve Kaufman were going to present. If we can unmute Marnie first, she can let us know in what order they'll speak. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Marnie. I can hear you, Marnie. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Pearson and council members. Thank you all for taking the time to uh, read this, all of this material and to visit the site. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to address. Uh, most of the images in our presentation have actually been addressed by staff, but there is uh, one particular issue. If you could advance to item to image 11, Alex. This is it. This is an aerial photo that shows you the location of the property with the black border uh, in, in its uh, behind these beachfront properties. And there were three scenarios addressed for in relation to potential sea level rise and flooding. But none of these actually resulted in wave uprush hitting the property at velocity. So the wall, I wanna make it very clear that the wall that surrounds this property is uh, for many purposes, part of it fuel modification, which is exempted from the development area and also to raise grade so that the uh, sea level rise does not flow into the site, but it's not intended as an impact repellent device. It's simply to contain sheet flow. And I want you to know that the coastal engineer who prepared these reports is here and can address that issue for you. And I believe your own coastal engineer is also on this call. And I'd like to ask uh, Steve Kaufman to address this issue as well, if you can unmute him. Steve? Yeah. Well, I think you addressed it, frankly. Uh, you know, the, we, this, this image here shows the three scenarios that we uh, analyzed uh, through our coastal engineer, Dave Weiss. What you need to know here is that he made certain assumptions. There is a bulkhead. Uh, along the ocean front. It protects the oceanfront homes and this home is behind it. So it's protected. When he did his analysis, he was asked to assume that there is no bulkhead, that there is no oceanfront home. So that's what he did. And he used the 100 uh, year uh, design life uh, in his analysis where the waves come straight into the house. Uh, he also looked at this from the lagoon side, that there are high berms uh, in the lagoon that prevent the water from going in that direction. So that really wasn't an issue. And he looked at sea level rise uh, from the uh, down coast side, the east side of the colony, where the, uh, the waves come in uh, at a cross angle uh, towards the down coast. They come in at the wrong way. They, come, they start farther out and they come in and then they backwash back to the ocean. But he assumed again, which he tried to be as conservative as we could on this. And he assumed that they wouldn't backwash out to the ocean and that it would uh, disperse, it would go towards the park. 
uh, and the berms that are in the park uh, next to the house, and then it would keep flow, uh, uh, and it would uh, uh, then come towards the uh, the perimeter wall, and then down Malibu Colony Road. Now, basically, he was looking at a scenario here that is, in, in my opinion, absurd, but he, he analyzed it anyway. He assumed the design life of 75 years, and he said in his report that around 75 years from now, this event might happen. It's a one in 20,000 event. Uh, as Barney points out, that's point zero 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 five, and the water would run down the street and it would come to about eight inches at the uh, the uh, front of the house. And that's why we decided, well, we'll put in a floodgate there and just seal it off. Uh, but that is an event that happens at the end of the design life, not in the next twenty-five years or even fifty years, seventy-five years from now. So. We analyzed all these uh, sea level rise scenarios uh, uh, at conservatively and at, uh, at length. Martin? Yes. Uh, the other issues that were raised about the, you know, allowing only an 18 foot high house because it's visible from a public area it seems to me to be ludicrous. They're, you're looking at a community of two and three story houses. Why would you restrict one of them to 18 feet in height? That doesn't make any sense at all. The colony development standards are their own overlay standards. And this house is designed to that set of regulations. There's no reason that this particular property should be treated any differently because it happens to be in a community next to a public area. It's not sitting out there by itself where in the middle of a wilderness where people are looking at nothing but nature and suddenly a house pops up. This makes no sense. And as far as the, uh, the MOU and, how, and the city's policy, you do have uh, city staff on the call who can address that issue. That is a little bit beyond my expertise. I understand it, but not well enough to explain it to you in detail. So I, I would hope that you would ask your staff and also your coastal engineering staff about these uh, scenarios that were applied to this property. And we believe that this, this development is environmentally very superior to what's there now and we don't see any impacts from this development that uh, should cause you to deny it. The only issue here is that there is a neighbor who has enjoyed a view from her second floor over this property for many years and she doesn't want to give it up. That's the only issue here. And we'll reserve the rest of our time for rebuttal, if we may. Absolutely, Marnie. And before we go further, I want to ask um, members of the city council for any ex parte communication. I should have done that earlier, but before we get to rebuttals, um, I'm having trouble seeing everybody at the moment. Okay, Karen, I think you put your hand up. Uh, yes, I had a site visit a few weeks ago um, with Marnie and I believe Steve and um, I did not learn anything that was not contained in the staff report. Okay, thank you, uh, Skyler. Same thing for me. Oh, Rick. Okay, Rick yeah. too. Okay. Yeah, you know, it was scheduled before, and that got continued, so it was, it was a few weeks ago. Okay, um, Jefferson. Yes, thank you, Mike. Yeah, I not have not visited the site, the person, the property that you're speaking about, but I've walked by it many times, and in the last month, twice from the public right of way, from the soils that are next to the house and in the uh, lifeguard area, which is the easterly side, the easterly side of the uh, colony, find the gate there at the end of the colony uh, where the lifeguard tower is. And I'm also aware of some uh, sand mitigation studies that the Adamson house is uh, 
pushing forward with the California Department of Parks of Recreation known as DPR uh, or the uh, sand analysis and the sand movement. So those things are not in the report and I would, would be happy to discuss them with anybody, but it's public knowledge uh, that these studies have been applied for through the city a year ago and now through uh, California State Parks DPR and the Adamson House Foundation. Okay, thank you. Anything else? That is all. Okay. And for myself, I visited the site just a few days ago um, with Marnie and Steve, I believe, and did not learn anything that we have. I haven't already heard here tonight. Okay. So, yes, Skylar. Uh, I visited. Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, actually, when Karen was there, I got there a little after Karen was there. Good morning, Mr. Kaufman. Uh, I think I might have got a phone call from Ken about it. Uh, this is a few weeks back, um, but I also separately on my own, uh, you know, kind of took the perspective of down the trail that Jefferson was refer referencing as well, which I did not take when I was there with Karen. Did you learn anything that's not in this in the staff report? Did I learn anything? I mean, just that you can obviously see that you'll be able to see the house when you're walking behind it on the road there that's it okay okay i think i also spoke to mr ehrlich he sent an email and i do believe i spoke to him on the phone around the same time i visited the site okay did you learn anything there not in the report nope, nope. okay i think that's all the communications and uh and uh, back to rebuttals Yes, Monica and Ken will have five minutes for rebuttal. There we go. Thank you. Um, just so we're clear and, and the record's clear, um, when I did speak with Council Member Peak, we spoke about the requested continuance and didn't talk about the substance of the project. And it was a very similar conversation with council member Mullen, but they, they absolutely represented our conversation and we had it and it was accurate. Addressing the points that the uh, applicant raised, a, a couple points. First of all, in the sea level rise analysis and the need for the walls around the property, I heard the consultant suggest that somehow if the walls are necessary for fuel modification, they're exempt from being calculated as part of the square footage of the house. That's not in the code, that's simply made up. So the walls are the walls and they get calculated as part of the square footage. When you calculate the walls and the other required elements of, of square footage, you are over the 25% um, square footage limitation within the Escher or Escher buffer. In addition, we heard at least two or three times that the uh, sea level rise analysis was done out of an abundance of caution to contain sheet flow but nonetheless, you have a house being built on the inland side of the Colony Road with floodgates. Now, seriously, the floodgates are being proposed for a reason, and it has to be either, number one, they're an improper shoreline protective device themselves, or number two, they're partly there to, get, to deal with sea level rise and wave uprush. Now, according to our review of all of the analysis that the applicant claims to have done, we didn't see a 100-year analysis by anybody. That's clearly required by the sea level rise guidance by the Coastal Commission. They need to at least address it. And the sea level rise guidance doesn't talk about arguing probabilities because we can all get frustrated or come up with the calculation of saying there's a one in three billion chance of this ever occurring. That's not the point of the sea level rise guidance. It is there so you at least analyze it and figure out what kind of protection a particular property needs. So you need to go through the 50, the 75, and the 100 year. And the guidance further tells you when you're this close to the coast, you need to apply the 100 year. Here, we didn't see the 100 year, nor was it applied. Finally, in connection with the height of the property, it's limited to 18 feet by the Escher requirements. Otherwise, if you wanna go higher, you need site plan review. The fact that the colony overlay, that this may be in the colony, 
doesn't mean that the colony overlay trumps the ESHA requirements. It explicitly does not within the LCP. And the LCP is very clear saying that the overlay requirements do not count. So you're limited to an 18 feet in height subject to site plan review. We don't see a site plan review request and none was made. So for those reasons, the city council, uh, we, we apologize that the planning commission erred, but the city council should correct that and reject this project. Thank you for your time, we appreciate it. We appreciate these tough choices, but you need to go by, the LCP needs to mean something, the city code needs to mean something. Thank you. Okay, and Marnie with the applicant has eight minutes and 15 seconds. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, let me just make a couple of comments and then I'm gonna turn this over to Steve. Uh, first of all, perimeter, solid perimeter fencing already exists on this property. And when I originally met with uh, the fuel modification plan reviewers, they're the ones who suggested originally that we change it to concrete block as part of our fuel mod plan. I've never worked on a project within ASHA setback or even in ASHA where perimeter fencing was considered part of development area. This is the first I've ever heard of this. And as far as shoreline protection, this, is, this perimeter wall is to protect against sheet flow basically coming from the side or a very shallow sheet flow coming across the, the road in an extreme scenario. It's not direct wave uprush, which is what shoreline protection devices protect against. There's a difference. And the 100 year standard is applied in the LCP to beachfront or bluff top development. This is neither. And now I'd like you to unmute Steve Kaufman, if you would, and let him make some comments. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Well, let me just uh, tick off a few issues here. As to the sea level rise guidance and the 100 year design life, the Coastal Commission uses typically for residential use a 75 year design life. Your uh, is exceptional. Of course, it was drafted by the Coastal Commission, it was certified in 2002, and it requires a 100 year design life oceanfront residences and oceanfront bluff residences. The LCP does not address a non-beachfront residence. This is really illustrated by the letter from coastal staff to your staff that Ken attached to uh, his letter to you. That letter dealt with a beachfront residence on Broad Beach. And that's why the commission cited the LCP policies which are uniform in saying you use 100 year design life. So I want to be clear about that. Uh, as to the floodgate, it's just a gate. <laughs> it's not an engineered seawall, it's not a shoreline protected device. And it was a suggestion that we made when we were looking at the, uh, the water uh, bore, I guess you would call it, the second uh, actually going into the beach and then turning left and coming down out of the Colony Road and passing by this house. Uh, it's, uh, if you look up and down Malibu Colony Road, everybody with limited exception has a perimeter wall and a gate. There's nothing exceptional about this. It's uh, much ado about nothing, which frankly is what I would have to say about most of these issues because the real issue here is about her private view from her second story. It's not a protected view. That's the issue. Uh, she's not concerned about sea level rise because her house is similarly situated. Her, her house is certainly above 18 feet, probably, as tall as the applicant's proposed house. Uh, we have extensive night lighting restrictions, which demonstrate to you how we comply with the dark sky ordinance, how it's supposed to be applied. She doesn't comply with that. 
we comply with a 25% development area limitation. And you've never uh, taken a perimeter fence and, and included that. Uh, and then I think the staff did a good job analyzing that in the staff report. And we have a far superior advanced treatment system to put, which is superior to first septic system. So you know, I would close by just highlighting some project benefits here and put this back into perspective. The existing hardscapes on the four detached buildings uh, on this, <laughs> I, I have an automatic light that goes off. <laughs> so let's see if I can do this in the dark. Uh, the buildings on the property right now uh, span over, I think, we're to 69%. It's about two thirds of the property. This project is going to flip that. It's going to reduce the impermeable coverage just under 30%. Uh, decreasing runoff in a uh, hundred year storm. That's a huge positive. Uh, to reduce encroachment into the Esha buffer, the project will have to comply with a 25% development area requirement. Currently, runoff leaving the site is untreated. There are no water quality treatment measures, but this project is going to add a biofilter and a green roof, which will provide that additional water quality treatment. Currently, pointed out, the existing residence uses a conventional septic system. This is going to provide instead an advanced treatment system, which will provide superior tertiary treatment for effluent generated by the residents. And under the colony overlay district, which governs here, the height limit is 30 feet because the roof proposed is pitched. But you saw the rendering. This project actually has a peak of 28 feet. Uh, two inches at tops, but it actually is less because it descends towards the middle and the massing is broken up. And so it's not a box. And again, it strictly complies with the dark lighting ordinance. So from an environmental standpoint, this particular development, perhaps even like any other in the, in the colony, is far superior to the existing development. And uh, as your staff analysis concluded, it fully conforms to its Requirements of the LUP, the LIP, and the 106 conditions. That's not too many. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you. So, are we done with? Uh... Marnie, did you have anything else to add? No, I just want to let you know that all of the project consultants are here. Uh, the civil engineer, the coastal engineer, the wastewater system engineer, any engineer you can name and the architect to answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you very much for that. And if there's no other speakers, we're back to the council. Oh, and there they are. By the way, Richard, you look very nice in your suit. <laughs> um, counselors, anyone want to uh, start this off? There's no public comment on this, right, Mikey? Oh, correct. Uh, correct. Yes, yes, correct. Uh, Rick, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the waste water, you know, the septic issue, I saw that formula. Is that a standard formula where the first bedroom's 300 and then the any additional bedrooms are 150 and a guest house is 300? That's that's standardly how you apply those things throughout uh, developmental projects. That's my understanding. Uh, Melinda Talent is all is also here, the Environment and Health Administrator, but it's my understanding that that's the standard calculation. So in the original building. It says the original building was has square footage of two nine six three that included the guest house. And then I saw another thing where the, I think it was from the, uh, uh, the appellant. No, the yeah the appellant that the original house was only like a thousand and eighty square feet. Right. So it sounds like I mean th their point is. Uh, let's draw this picture. We're going from a 1,000 square foot house to a 5,000 square foot house, and we got the same uh, septic flow. So in the new project, there's no guest house? There is not. Okay, so that's, if, if that 300 applies to a guest house, and that, strangely enough, sounds like it works out, but is that a standard thing? I mean, is that just, you applied for this product? I mean, Mikey, can you tell me about that? 
your your do you former guy is that uh, something that they apply to that? Restate your question for me, please. That you know, water flow. I'm just looking at it as a, a, a thousand square foot house and then a fifty five hundred square foot house, and they both have the same you know flow into the septic tank. The only difference really is there's no guest house for the four bedroom house, you know, and the other one. Yeah, that's interesting. That's not, I wouldn't say that's normal, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's all about, it's all about the amount of flow, all about the amount of- uh, But is the flow done by standard, just per bedroom? This is an older house, as I remember, right? That's there now? The site was originally constructed in like 1952. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But after, and speaking with um, Melinda Talent, um, it's really about the anticipated number of occupants. So in a two bedroom house, um, the master bedroom is assigned a 300 gallon per day, um, I guess, wastewater flow. Mm -hmm. And each additional bedroom is assigned 150 gallons per day, as I tried to show our work um, on that slide. No, I, um, I said that. So, so the math is on the little two bedroom, 1,000 square foot house, he's got a two bedrooms. So that's 450 plus a guest house. That's, that's correct. 750. 750. That's correct. And the 5,500 square foot, four bedroom house with no guest house as a 300 foot, 300 for one bedroom and then three times 150, which also equals 750. That's correct. Which seems bizarre, you know, because one house is a thousand, the other one's five times as big. So Hi. that's interesting. This is uh, Melinda Talent. Would you like me to help out with that question? Yeah, that'd be great, that'd be great. Okay, and you can hear me okay? Yes. And you can't, you can't see me because I don't have a camera on this uh, laptop. That's okay. Um, so we, yeah, we don't go by the square footage of the house and this is a standard criteria that we have in our code uh, that we calculate the wastewater flow from bedrooms based on the master bedroom is counted as 300 gallons per day and each bedroom, standard bedroom then is 150 gallons per day. So a guest house has a master bedroom, so that would be 300 gallons per day for the guest house. And the main house had two bedrooms. So it had 300 gallons and 150, which is 450 plus the 300 from the guest house, which is 750 gallons per day. Yeah, and I got that. I mean, I understand that math. It just seems bizarre that you have two buildings, a total square footage of whatever, and you get this gigantic thing that's twice as big as both of them. And, uh, but if that's the way you do it, okay. I just want to clarify that. Yeah, and that is a standard that we use. It's in our code. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the MOU that they keep referring to and what is that all about? Basically, the main thing is that a new house can't increase the flow to the septic tank? Yes. Okay. Would you like so me, awesome. Melinda, to answer that? Sure. Okay, so the prohibition policy is the state, or in our case, the local Los Angeles Regional Water Board's policy to stop discharge of septic in the Civic Center. The MOU was developed that the city, in this case, ESD, Environmental Health, would help implement that um, prohibition. And then we further developed the policy to help applicants with criteria for development projects. Maybe. So what that policy says is, and this is based on the prohibition for no increase in wastewater flow. So no additional wastewater flow, but it did allow for folks to do a water balance report for the fixture units. So you take the old existing house that has X number of fixture units using the old water flow values, for example, a toilet is five or six gallons you know, per flush. 
and you compare that to the new fixtures. And if you can show that the new fixtures will not increase it, the value of the existing wastewater flow, you're able to add those fixtures. Now, this is only for the prohibition area. If I can just jump in for one moment, just to make sure uh, we're clear on the MOU that um, has being referred to is the uh, memorandum of understanding that the city entered into uh, through the prohibition that was imposed from the State Water Resources Control Board, and we entered into an MOU with the Los Angeles Regional Water Control Board first in 2011, and then that MOU has been amended uh, a few times uh, before we completed phase one of the project. And so I just want to make sure that the council is clear uh, on what's being referred to because the prohibition, and I'll read uh, a bit of the section, prohibits discharge from existing wastewater treatment systems based on a phase schedule and they were supposed to seize discharges by a date certain. Um, but the MOU also does provide that it allows for repairs, maintenance and upgrades to existing systems uh, provided that they do not expand the capacity of the system or increase flows of wastewater. So that's what uh, is being addressed uh, by uh, Melinda and Renika, which is there's been a calculation done that because they're upgrading um, to low flow toilets and uh, systems that work differently that are more you know, up, up to modern technology that the calculations can uh, support that there's no additional discharge. So I hope that is, a, is helpful. Well, it is, but it, it sounds kind of irrelevant because it sounds like what they're doing is going by 300 plus 150 plus 150 not talking about fixtures they're just talking about the 150 correct and that all it all circles back to how we calculate flow and this is the same um uh, code that we follow when we develop the wastewater treatment facility so it that it, those are the standard calculations of how they just develop flow and i, I Get it doesn't quite make sense, but that is what is used. I see Skylar raising his hand, so I'll stop talking. I just want to throw that in there about the MOU. Okay. Guy. So yeah, um, I uh, I have uh, grave concerns about this rationale. Um, it just, I guess. So what I'm reading is quoted from the MOU. And it very clearly states any increase in the number of existing bedrooms, it doesn't say, and then it says, or plumbing drainage fixture units, which is a, a, a unit of a plumbing fixture, is considered a new discharge of sanitary waste and is clearly prohibited in this area as being allowed. Like it's, it's I see it as kind of being black and white. We're going from three bedrooms to four bedrooms, that would be an increase regardless of the flow calculation related to it. It doesn't state that in the MOU. It just says if you're increasing the number of bedrooms. And then it doesn't say whether you're dealing with the flow of the drainage fixtures. It's very clearly stating like how many actual fixtures. So my question is how many actual fixtures are in this 5,000 plus square foot development and how many fixtures were in the, the, the existing uh, home, guest house, and garage? And I don't know who can answer that for me, but I don't see that reference. I mean, I see a bunch of dialogue here, but I don't see the exact numbers of plumbing fixtures. And I'd like to know how many plumbing fixtures there are. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that number right in front of me, but from my uh, recollection, there were probably around 30 in the existing house, and I believe there are fixture units, and I believe there are 50 to 60 in the new house. Okay, so All right. I'm just, I, I can't, I can't buy it at all that we're conforming with the MOU strictly based on that. So we're essentially doubling the amount of fixtures or we're adding one additional bedroom. Yeah. So that's that's something that that I would need to I need to get some some better okay. clarification on or that can be clarified and sent back to the planning commission and they can deal with it. Well, I can clarify that a little bit right now if you'd like. 
Um, okay. So in our policy, in the Civic Center policy, there are provisions in there to do water balance reports, to add fixtures, to demonstrate that that flow is going to be the same or less by the addition of the fixture units. So this has also been discussed with the water board because ultimately they have the responsibility to approve these developments in the civic center area. And they concurred with the water balance report and the rationale that was used in this particular project and other previous projects as well. So do we have a letter from the regional water quality control board stating that they agree with this project? We do not have a letter. I have asked the applicant to contact the water board to obtain that information, but I've had two discussions with the water board staff about it. Okay, so Mar Marnie, do we have that? Do we have a letter from them? Or Steve? Can uh, somebody unmute them? No we, no, we do not have a letter from them. We. I wasn't aware that we needed to approach them. I thought that the city staff was, was talking with them. There have been other projects where this same type of redesign has taken place within the parameters allowed under the MOU. Um, okay, thank you, Mark. You're, you're quoting actually from the policy, the city's policy, not from the MOU itself uh, about fixtures. I'm, and the water balance report is what addresses the fixture unit count. Uh, we have correct. the, the waste I'm from the city's most recent guidance on the point. Pardon me? Yes, you're, you're, you are correct. I'm, I'm quoting from what the city's most recent guidance in regards, in regards to the MOU is. Right, but that, that section goes it, on. It's not and directly from the MOU. Okay, so I, I, uh, I want to figure out a way to be able to approve this, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with the wastewater stuff. And the other thing that is, was weird to me and is that we're not supposed to be like adding a new system, but yet it feels like we're adding a system because we're, we're putting in like an additional concrete tank or two concrete tanks, which I think is replacing an old system. So is that just considered an upgrade? Yeah, we would consider that a replacement or an upgrade in this case to an advanced treatment over the conventional system that's existing. And, so Keep in mind that this is going to be connected to the treatment plant in 2024. I, yeah, I, I, very much, I very much understand that. And I, I mentioned that to Marnie that essentially this part of it isn't the end all knowing that that's gonna happen. I just think it's really lame that a lot of other people haven't done stuff because of this and that's separate, that's their own issue. And it feels like it's getting manipulated to work for this project. I'm just being honest with how I feel about that issue. Um, I had another question which was in regards to this discrepancy over 75 years or 100 years and I'm, I just want to know, was the 100 years used or the 75 years used when they were calculating whatever needed to be calculated in regards to the wave uprush, uh, Renika? It's my understanding that the initial wave uprush analysis submitted with the application used a 100 year um, economic life of the residents. Um, but if you look at the lengthy um, guidance document published by the California Coastal Commission on this issue, they basically have three different categories, a low risk, a medium to high risk, and I believe the last is the extremely high risk. So when the project was originally reviewed using the 100 economic life, they used a low risk aversion scenario. Um, the project coastal engineer can speak to why that was done. Um, but in response to the appeal, um, the supplemental coastal um, sea level rise analysis used the medium high risk aversion, which is basically the risk category that applies to residential development. 
So, so you're saying that the 100 year never applies to residential development? For beachfront, it does. This is not beachfront. So I believe, you know, it's rare to even do this type of analysis for a non beachfront property. Um, again, the coast, the project coastal engineer can speak to that because that's their scope of expertise. Um, I think they were trying to figure it out. Like, how do they apply wave up brush analysis for a non beachfront property? Um, I, I, that's, I, that's what they're I mean, to me, it seems like they're trying to apply it because of the elevation of the property and where it's located, considering the fact that water could come into the property, I mean, from the lagoon, from the easterly direction, and it could obviously come across from the other direction. I mean, the way that I saw the property and in, in, in being there and spending some time down there during my life is uh, water could enter it from three different areas or three different directions albeit i would say it's very unlikely but it could happen and it's clearly um has to be engineered in a way to handle that and they've indicated that the primary area would be you know i guess through the house across the street um into it or you know coming around it in different areas and that's why they said it needs to have special walls with special drainage so skylar uh, marnie's raised her hand she might have information on that if you care to hear uh, yeah, sure. Uh, can we let Marnie speak, please? There we yes. go. Yes. Yep. Hello. You're you're, okay. you're live. Okay. Well, I think Mike Phipps can probably address this, as can David Weiss, our our coastal engineer, who's on the call. Uh, the original uh, request for wave up brush study was done. Uh, with the assumption that the water would come across straight across and but there are houses and a seawall there and a 40 foot road so it was done to the 100 year analysis which was actually not required because that's in the lcp that's required for beachfront and bluff top only but it was done to the low risk analysis because of the objects that were in the way then, since we were trying to figure out how to do a study on a project that's not actually on the beach, then we went and looked at two other options. One was the wave coming up the beach to the east towards the pier and coming across and then hitting the berms between the ocean and the lagoon. And part of that water would flow back to the ocean and part of it would come sideways into the colony road as sheet flow and could then spread out onto not just this property, but properties along the road. And that would result in perhaps the need for floodgates to restrict that water from coming onto the site. The other option, as far as the water coming from the lagoon, from flooding from the lagoon, seems to be almost impossible because of the berms that were built when the lagoon was dredged, those pods, as I like to call them, were dredged out in the state parks project to create that park. And they, they dredged those lagoon areas and left the spoils and compacted them. And they basically protected the entire back of the colony with those, some of them very high. Yeah, I'm not, so, not going to speculate on the likelihood of any of it happening. All I'm going to say is that clearly somewhere in here they said that it could happen and that they've obviously included some design and it's been incorporated for that. So I think yeah. the answer to my question was no in regards to the 100 years across the board, but then at the same time mm -hmm. it had not been required anyways. And even if it was required, you have these other structures that are in front of it that would be impeding that. Right. Okay. Um, Pearson, if I could yes. just interject. Um, yes, Kelsey. Ken Ehrlich emailed me. He says he's trying to raise his hand. He'd also like to be unmuted if you would like to do that. I cannot see Ken, so I did not see that. I saw, I saw Monica make some sort of face, but it wasn't really a hand. <laughs> um, Ken, are you on, or is your name Monica here at the moment? Yes, there's a clap. He's <laughs> Happy now, so um, can 
Skyler, can we unmute him and get his input? There, you're unmuted. Yes. So thank you. We, we've been trying to do, we've been doing backflips over here trying to talk. Um, in any event, so uh, Council Member Peak absolutely hit it on the head that the hundred-year appropriate analysis for the medium high medium high risk was never done. That that's our whole point on this point and. And backtracking a few minutes, some people were asking about the fixture count. The total amount of fixtures that we got out of this staff report was 64 fixtures, 64 water fixtures in this new four bedroom, five bath home that is supposed to be equal to or less water producing than the thousand foot, three bedroom, two bedroom house with a guest house. So we just wanted to add those points. Thank you. Um, Mikey, if I, I had another question, which was um, just, I guess maybe Renika would be the best on this, or maybe Christy, but so the discussion about the site plan review being needed in the colony, does the overlay district supersede the need for site plan review there? It does, and I did not include that in my presentation tonight, although it is thoroughly discussed in the Planning Commission staff report, which was attached to your staff report for tonight. Um, but the development standards for non-beachfront properties within the Malibu um, Colony Overlay District supersede the height requirements and the general um, non-beachfront residential development standards so, so that not allow so, so if I understand this correctly, mm -hmm. all of the homes on the inland side of the colony, yes, none of those homes have a need for site plan review. That is correct. And none they're of them ever had site plan review. Well, I don't believe so. No, they're not allowed. They're not, we're not allowed. They're not required. The mm -hmm. permitted height by right is 24 feet for a flat roof and up to 30 feet for a pitched roof. Got it. Okay. So that's, then I haven't, if that's the, the truth. But the whole truth and nothing but the truth, then I'm good with that. I they do have an overlay district. That's true. That's true. Um, so, and then this other issue with regards to the, the square footage calculation and engineered walls is what, and Mikey, maybe you can answer this, but I mean, hey, I know that we've required uh, or considered a piece of artwork or structure. Last time, I mean, it's my understanding if we have an engineered wall that that's considered part of a structure, unless I'm missing something here. And I just don't know why that wouldn't be calculated if they're having to engineer walls around the entire property to make the property higher to deal with the wave uprush and the water flow off of it. And now those walls are going to be extended to a, a height that's even, you know, six feet, apparently. Um, for the, the majority of, this around, of the area around the structure, um, wouldn't that be calculated or no? That's pretty unique. I'm mean, Honestly, in all my years, I don't really recall seeing walls. I've seen walls built with backfill and such, but to raise a property is a little bit unique for my experience. But normally ex walls, fences, et cetera, are not counted. But this is a different wall, I must admit. What about a seawall? I don't think a seawall is counted as part of the of the square footage. That's the those are generally exterior. What, what, no, no. Obviously, I, I guess maybe square footage is not the right word for it. Hold on. Development go. area. Well, yeah, I was going to say it's more development area because it's definitely disturbing the dirt. It's it's it has a structural purpose because it's holding up the dirt here and yeah. it's. So um, I guess it's, it's like, where is it disturbed area or development area? I don't know. Development. Development, not, not, yeah. not disturbed. So it's, so it's definitely development area. Yes. So then it's, it's not being calculated properly. Because it's my understanding if they're supposed to be calculating, they have a limitation on what they can use for the development area. And then now we're going around and we're saying six or eight inches wide around almost the entirety, except for the driveway of the, the property, you know, that there's a certain number, I think it's about 200 square feet or something. Um, 
that would well, be. Well, it's, it's based on how the LCP defines development area. And it's very specific about excluding a um, 20 foot wide access driveway, um, a required fire department um, hammerhead. And if it's not feasible to include engineered graded slopes to exclude that area. Um, as mentioned in your staff report, um, there is additional grading that's necessary, or additional field that's necessary to address the wave uprush and the drainage away from the ESHA. But, but it could clearly be, it's clearly feasible, they just have to build a smaller house. Like it's just not feasible with what they presented, which is a problem that I have with many different projects because we look at feasibility and it's like, you know, there's kind of two, uh, there's definitely a couple different lenses that are used when, when one looks at that. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's uh, can I give uh, Jefferson a try here and then we, we can circle back around. Jefferson. Thank you, Mikey. Um, first of all, uh, anytime that you want to refer to this, uh, the pictures that uh, the, uh, pro the proposer of the project put up uh, where the, uh, it, aerial view of the colony looking toward the lagoon, I would use that as a reference. Uh, we don't need it now, but if anybody disputes what I'm about to say, then they can resort to that photo to see it there for themselves. So we're talking about a couple of things here. Skylar touched on it, um, and that was the wall and the fill. You're creating a hard wall, which is a hardened structure, which is just like a seawall. And that's what his intention is to do, to contain fill, compacted fill, and wall equals an island. You're creating an island and an ESHA buffer. So variance 19 of 062 puts you into that zone. Now you're creating mass, which is the wall and the soil. You're elevating the house. You're elevating the whole property, pretty much. And you're creating that hard island. The sand that Marnie had mentioned behind the walls of the colony along that walkway that everybody uses was a result of a lack of the removal of the soil that was required in the lagoon project that was qualified by the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission. That soil, which was 100,000 cubic yards, was what the New Zealand mud snail died in. The whole concept was is dry the soil and the sand, allow the mud, sna mud snail, the invasive species, to die off in that heated sand and then haul it away. But the public got so frustrated with the project that the 1,000 double dump truck loads that were promised to remove that material never happened. So mm. DR compacted the soil, brought sprinklers out there to bring water to that, to grow it over and compact it, so that is the wall that's behind there that Marnie spoke about. That's not supposed to be there. It won't be there in 10 or 15 years. What's happening is all that water energy that comes down Malibu Creek that originally would hit 63 yards off the colony fence post over there near where the lifeguard tower is, all that wave energy, water energy that comes through the bridge is directed to the cobble at the exit of the Malibu Lagoon. Currently, it does not do that. It heads eastwardly, and that's why we're losing the front end of the Malibu Adamson House. That's why we asked for this sand study through the city, and now we're asking it for through DPR, which we will fund through the Adamson House. So all of these calamities are building upon the fact that this structure that is proposed should not have that variance. And you cannot raise a house up and not count that in development square footage. I'm sorry. You go to Coastal Commission with this and they're gonna really get frustrated with us. I'm sorry to say, you can't give variances in something in a state park. I'm, I'm opposed to this and flat out, it's wrong. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jefferson. Um, Karen, did you wanna add anything here or? You know, this is one of the bigger reports I've seen. Uh, I think 
anybody could probably- Welcome to the Planning Commission. Yeah, right. Um, a ton of information that I spent quite a bit of time reading. Um, and every issue brought up by It seems confusing, but it looks like the, the since this is an appeal, the appellant is now referred to as the applicant, but every issue that was brought up was addressed in my opinion, solidly in the staff report. Um, so I, I don't see what Jefferson says. I don't, I don't see those issues. Um, and Renika, I, I guess I'll ask your opinion. Are there issues that the staff just failed to address? In my opinion, no, but I'm saying that from the perspective of someone that's been entrenched in this project for a while. Um, the Planning Commission staff report also mentions that there was a different version of this project originally submitted where the idea was that the ESHA development standards did not, did not apply to the project. Um, and there was another project that the Coastal Commission provided comments on that stated that um, when new development is proposed within the ESHA buffer, it is subject to the 25% development area. So the project had to be completely redesigned and a host of additional analysis had to be submitted to demonstrate compliance with the LCP. I believe calls. staff has done a, a thorough investigation of this project, but. Okay. And I, and I see Yolanda has popped on here and, and I'm a huge fan. So I'm sure she has something amazing to say, and I think we should hear it. Okay. Hey. Can I just mention one more thing? Um, yeah. It, it's the, the original house, which is a thousand some square feet has been referred to again and again tonight. Um, and the guest house has been uh, not referred to nearly as much. I assume the guest house had a kitchen. Renika, do you know? Um, I do not know. Maybe Melinda um, might provide some insight um, because- the Alley kitchen that sounds something which seems to me would be common. Yes, I, I did some investigation on that and I did find out that there was a kitchen. And that's how I determined that it was a true second unit. I could count that as a master bedroom because of the kitchen. Okay, thank you. So I think that helps explain the, um, the water usage or fixture count or whatever term you wanna use for it. Yes, and to add to it and also to Skyler's uh, question regarding the policy and the MOU, uh, the MOU clearly states, and again, I'm reading just from the MOU, this provision is not intended to prevent repairs and maintenance to existing septic disposal systems, provided that the repairs and the maintenance do not expand for the capacity of the system and increasing flow of the waste, wa uh, waste water. I think the key interpretation and what we have been very consistent uh, to interpret is that the increase on any flow on the wastewater. Um, we have been, as Melinda mentioned prior to uh, me speaking, uh, we have been in contact with the regional board with the previous director and now with the new director to make sure that we have consistency in the way we're interpreting this. And they agree that they, um, the, the main thing is that we are not increasing the flow. And so for example, on this house that we are seeing, prior to 1994, the average shower head gallons per minute was 5.5 .5 gallons per minute. As you guys all know, California has been going more to more conservative water usage. And in 2007, we had our first uh, California Green Building Code, and every three years has been uh, being more restricted. In 2007, the shower heads gallons per minute was 2.5. Then in 2010, it went to two. Now under this current code, 
the shower heads uh, at, uh, rate flows per minute is 1.8. So from 1994, we had a 5.5 .5 for a shower head, which is now 1.8 that is required. Um, what we have received from this applicant is a water analysis from their engineer proposing and addressing the replacement of all those old plumbing fixtures with new uh, uh, water conservation fixtures that are supporting uh, uh, not an increase uh, to this new uh, proposed, uh, instead of having two structures with two kitchens, with uh, uh, two bedrooms and one bedrooms, now everything is combined as just one kitchen with three, uh, with four bedrooms. The interesting thing to me here is that this house is barely going to be done before it's hooked up to the sewer system. Um, but that's a sub separate subject, but it is kind of ironic. I think, uh, but Yolanda, if, can you read me back the part of the MOU that you read at the beginning? Yeah. And so this is uh, on page one of the policy that we have under developments and properties. Uh, third, uh, third sentence, um, this prohibition is not intended to prevent repairs and maintenance to existing septic disposal systems, provided that the repairs and the maintenance do not expand the capacity That's of the good. system. That's good, because I mean, I, I don't, just the way that I read that is specifically that it's for repair and maintenance. And I don't see this as a repair or maintenance. So that's like another part of this that I, I don't wrap, I just don't wrap my hand around because it's, you're basically, it's a teardown with a new house and a new septic system and you two new concrete, a tertiary system and an advanced onsite wastewater treatment system. I don't see it as a repair. If we're referring to this as a repair, or maintenance, then if that's commonly what happens all the time, then that's then that's fine. But I just those are not the words that I use, you know. And uh, in regards, Skyler, to Skyler, Yolanda was reading from the city's policy, but the actual language in the MOU says the basin plan amendment does not prevent repairs, maintenance, and upgrades to existing systems. So it clearly has the word upgrade in it. Okay. Just, just to be clear, I, I just want to make sure she's reading from the policy and the actual MOU document. So. Okay, so and, and we look at that as, a, as an upgrade as being able to just jettison the old one and put in a new one? I, I'm not putting any opinion on it. I was just sharing. <laughs> well, I think in general, the city promotes putting new systems in because they're better. No, better. I, I, I totally yeah. think. I totally Hang on, Jefferson, we'll get there. But the whole issue with the area that we're talking about, and this is like a much bigger situation, is that people haven't been able to go in and put in a new system in order to build a new house. That's, that's what has not been allowed in this area. And that's what we're allowing. I, I get it on a remodel. I get it on an upgrade and some maintenance to the system, but I don't get it on tearing down a house, putting in a new system, building a new house, next to the ESHA with the wall, you know, with all these other calculations, it just doesn't sound right to me. And I think I would make a motion that we send it back to planning commission and, and with some very clear parameters on what the applicant can get right to get a project approved. I don't have, I don't have the issue with the height. I think that we clarified that. I think the, the real issues are in regards to the, the, the square footage and the wall that Jeff Jefferson referenced and whether or not they do the 100 year study and that would affect the property more. I mean, the the downside to, to that is they could come in and say, well, hey, you got to make it four feet higher, you know, and, and, and that would just, I think that that would even further enrage maybe some neighbors and would make it more of a blight to the, to the people that would view it. John, so, okay. That's kind of, that's kind of what I'm le leaning towards. <laughs> Okay, Jefferson. Thank you, Mikey. If it's a motion, I would second it. However, I'd like to add to that motion uh, a couple of quick comments. The words that Sam Unger left us with was, it's about output, output. 
what you're doing here with this project is you're increasing the output because people take a longer shower because they're only getting 1.8 gallons per minute. So they stand in the shower longer. That's why the treatment tanks, the septic tanks had to be increased to almost twice the size of what's existing. So that tells us a little bit of a story about the use of the house. And if Sam Unger were here, he would be saying the same thing. You're increasing the output. So that ends that septic issue, Skylar. I hope you can get clarity through that. No matter what Yolanda read you, the fact is, is this is not what was meant to be conducted under this MOU. So I'm resting assured that Charlie up in Sacramento, when John Seibert and I went up there, he said, the problem Malibu is having, having, having with the Coastal Commission and with us is you're granting too many variances and the more variances you grant, the rougher we're gonna get on you. And this is a perfect example of what we should not be doing. So I would second your motion, Skylar. Thank you. Skylar, did you make a motion? Uh, yeah, I did. It was to send it back to planning and to iron out the, the issues that were outlined uh, in regards to flow, uh, the, the walls that are around the, the wall that's around the property and particularly the one that, that faces the, the park and the, how that works in the development calculation of square footage. Um, and that's the walls, that's the site plan review we dealt with. And then if it needs to be a hundred years, I think that that needs, that just needs to be very clear. So, um, you know, whatever that hundred year study is gonna show, that's what needs, needs to get done. And I don't want like a, oh, it's a little bit partial or it's not partial, let's just be clear on it, that that's what needs to happen based on where the property is located and based on the fact that it could have flow from three different directions. Uh, I would add one thing, you know, Yolanda makes a great point about um, how all the apply, whatever they all. Fixtures? Guess, yeah, fixtures, thank you. <laughs> uh, are much more energy or water efficient now, lower flow. So if we can get that documentation from the regional board that they're buying off on it, that I think that would help a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think if we can get, yeah, I think we should get a letter from them stating that it's okay to, to go from a 2,300 square foot property to a 5,200 square foot property where we're going from 30 fixtures to 60 plus fixtures. So do you want, are you looking to continue it to get the answer on that? Yeah. I don't, well, I, I don't need to continue it to us. I just think that you get that stuff and then go back to planning. I don't think it needs to come back to the council. That's what the motion was, and I seconded the motion. Okay, okay, just checking. But I think they should do that water issue with it, you know, or that should be one of the things to look at. Yeah, I, yeah, I got that as a condition. So you want to add that as a, an amendment? Yeah, he just wants to get a letter from the Regional Water Quality Control Board saying that they're okay with it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, Yolanda makes a great point, and uh, if that's reality, then okay, let's go with it. You know, but we should have some documentation to back it up because it is kind of strange that you got a thousand square foot house and then a 5,500 and we're saying, oh, everything's the same. But, you know, one was built in the 50s and one's modern. So that's probably, you know, she makes some great points. Okay, right. And I, I see lots of hands up, but I know we've, uh, we've gone a long time here. Um, if, when we have a motion, we have a second. My, I mean, I haven't really spoke much here. I've just been listening, but my analysis here is that it's an interesting project in the sense that we definitely have a neighbor who has thrown the kitchen sink at this project because they like their view, but that doesn't mean there's not potentially issues. Obviously they, they threw a lot of them at the wall. Um, so um, we have a motion and a second. Karen, do you have anything to add before we see what happens with the motion no that's uh if we want to send it back to planning um i wish them luck uh I, I, again um i do i do have to say rick when you say we're going from a thousand feet to 5500 or something you know two structures to one in fact there's more than two structures but i think two are habitable 
So yeah, you know, Karen, I, I, I see what you're saying and I, I'm willing to accept that from the explanations that I've heard. But if we get some documentation, you know, for me, I'm not saying you have to send it all the way back to planning. For me, if you get some documentation from the Regional Water Quality Board, my concerns would be uh, addressed. However, if it's going to go back there, I want them to, you know, work on that one also. Yeah, I can, I can see that. I can. Yeah, I mean, that's the only thing I really care about. That's the only thing I care about. And I'd be happy with some documentation and seeing it at the next planning commission, I mean, next city council meeting. But it sounds like those guys want to send it back. So that's my only concern is that. So, yeah, and I, I just to be clear on the what's in here in regards to the square footage, we're going from 2,963 total, that's garage, guest house, main house, to the new structure with um, 5,200. So it's not necessarily double, it's almost double. But when you look at the fixture count, it's definitely double or more than double. Because I think we're going from what I heard was 30 to 64. Um, so I don't know if that's exactly correct, but I think it's somewhere in that range. All right, well, uh, let's, let's call for roll call on this item. If Mayor Pearson? Okay. Yes. I'm just, I just want to, make sure I understand. So the planning commission has already approved the project. So mm -hmm. are there changes that are being suggested to the project for the planning commission to reconsider? Yeah, I think- Or is it just additional documentation to address the appeal? In my motion, it's twofold. So there's one, on one hand, you have this issue that, um, is in regards to the wastewater. So we've basically sort of said, clear that up, get a letter from the regional board saying that that's good. And that can sort of um, remediate that issue. Then we have this issue with a wall that's up against ESHA, that's a solid block wall. And then we have an issue where we have this development that's going on all the way around the structure in a wall that's clearly development. We've all said it's development or it's a structure of some sort, but yet that's not calculated in the, the the, I, I guess maybe it would be, what is it, total development square footage or? Development area. The, development area, sorry. Your footprint. So, yes. so that footprint would, would make the, the house, I think, I want to say it's about 200 square feet smaller. Got it. So, so there are project they would, have to, they would just have to look at the project with all those changes in it. And I would imagine that they would be able to approve it if they get that letter, if they get that study done from, the, you know, the 100 year one that says it's good and they redesign or not redesign, they probably make it a little bit smaller to meet that um, footprint. Got it. I, just, I didn't realize you wanted project revisions. I wanted to make sure I clearly understood. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. Okay, and that's the your second Jefferson follows what, what Skylar said? Correct. <clears throat> okay. Okay, then let's have roll call. Mayor ask, I'm sorry. Can I ask for the motion to be restated? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> I have the motion that is, is to direct the project back to the Planning Commission to address issues related to wastewater flow with the Regional quali Water Quality Control Board, um, have analysis including the walls surrounding the property as part of the development area, and have the 100-year sea level analysis. And the analysis of the solid wall up against the ESHA. I believe that was the wall surrounding the property, but I can yeah. rephrase that. That's correct. It was, Jefferson had brought up a specific variance. That's what I was talking about as well. Oh. 62. What was that, Jefferson? It's a variance uh, grant that uh, oh. in the applicant's uh, letter. I believe it's 062. I'll go back and review it. Uh, I think it is 062. It is. Okay, thank you, Renika. I, I was doing it from memory. <laughs> if that addresses the concerns, I can go ahead with the roll call. Let's do the roll call. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. 
Mayor Pearson? Sure, yes. Motion carries. Okay, um, y'all, it's 12.23 and we have a really big important item in front of us. I'm gonna suggest we push it. I know a bunch of people have waited because they don't wanna miss out, but it's hard to tell how late this would go. I'm gonna suggest we push that to the next meeting and still just do the very quick, the uh, ordinance one that we have to clean up. I'm so tired, I can hardly even say the name of it. Uh, the, uh, give me calendar. a second. One more time. Calendar? No, oh, there's the calendar too. Uh, we have the um, massage, ordinance. massage ordinance, which was uh, a, a cleanup act and it'll help our local businesses be able to operate, a couple of local businesses be able to operate. We have to conform with the county. So I don't know, I'll, I'll take input on that. I mean, I think if we push forward on the... Uh, I know it's late, but I'm ready to go on it if you guys wanna go on it. On the standalone parking lots. I mean, I think it's gonna be quite a while. We got quite a few people here. I agree with Mikey. I mean, this is when we don't make our best decisions. I think we've discussed that a lot and it is definitely on the very late side of my opinion. What is the next um, agenda, you know, next city council meeting, we got a bunch of things on it or how does it look? The 22nd? Yeah. It's, uh, the 20, November 23rd, 23rd is the next meeting. Um, and I believe we have an appeal on it is, is one of the larger items. That's correct. That's an appeal. Um, can we order the agenda in the way that we put the appeal? Well, on? typically my style is if something gets bumped, which almost everything was bumped tonight, I try and I move it to the front because it's weighted. Um, and that way the people don't have to sit another night and have this happen again. Well, if, yeah, I'm always ready to rock, but if we've got people who are uh, saying we shouldn't do it and that they're not giving it their full mental acuity, I think we should probably push it. Yeah, because I think we could count on this being as much as two hours. So, I mean, with, uh, yeah, well, I see people jumping off already. There was there was 36 people here literally a minute ago. Now it's 25. So <laughs> um, I, I, I think we should push it so we can hit this one fresh. I think it's really important and we need to be pretty sharp on it would be I my agree. input. That's But that's me. Fine with me. I agree. Okay. Um, so let's let's quickly do there's two very short items let's do 4c can we have a report on 4c please mikey i think we have to make a motion to to continue item 4b to the next meeting oh okay thank you uh, yeah that shows how i am getting tired it's true i will admit it I'll make is, that, is that correct reva 4d I'll make that motion. Um, yes, that's fine. Or by consensus is fine too. I think we already did 4D earlier. Excuse so me. at the no. moment, uh, we're on 4B and it seemed like there was consensus from the council to continue 4B, the, uh, the next meeting. service parking Correct. lot to November 23rd. And there was a motion from council member Wagner to that effect. Right, I'll, I'll, okay, second. Um, and we have consensus, but we can take a vote if we like. Um, Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yep. Mayor Pearson? Yes. The motion carries and the item will be continued. Thank you very much. Okay, let's let's go to four four C. Four C, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is Christy. The um, ordinance before the council is the last piece of a regulatory scheme for massage businesses. The proposed ordinance adopts by reference chapter 7.54 of the county code, um, which imposes a permit requirement for these types of businesses. The city has previously adopted by reference the health code, which includes extensive requirements for the operation of these businesses. Um, massage businesses require special attention because they're known to be an integral part of human trafficking. 
Law enforcement has found that these criminal enterprises are often in violation of public health laws, wage and labor laws, and public safety regulations. These regulations are tailored to help prevent and to crack down on trafficking operations. Now, obviously there's a flip side to massage establishments, and that is um, that they can be legitimate therapeutic services that are welcome in the community. So the licensing element helps to sort the good businesses from the illegitimate ones. Um, the regulations proposed in the ordinance um, come within the rubric of state laws that also manage um, these sensitive businesses. Generally, the California Massage Therapy Council certifies um, practitioners. This local um, license would be in addition to the state certification. Basically, the ordinance requires um, a license with some exceptions to be obtained. A license um, he must uh, not, it has to pass a criminal background check. Um, no one can hold a license if they're like, a reg have to register as a sex offender or if they've been convicted of certain crimes like prostitution or indecent exposure or pimping. And um, they can't, nobody can, um, have a license if they've been the subject of an injunction for a nuisance or things similar to that. Uh, there are also operating requirements in the ordinance. Um, for example, signs alerting uh, occupants to the trafficking laws. There's a prohibition against videotaping in any of the tre treatment rooms. There can be no locking doors. Um, the exits have to be uh, unlocked, there has to be um, all services um, conducted on site. So you can see how these um, regulations are intended to help um, separate legitimate businesses from illegitimate ones. There's record keeping requirements that are also helpful. The county's ordinance has been added to the posted agenda so you can see the full panoply of that. Um, there's also, going back to that flip side, some legitimate um, uh, businesses that wish to open in Malibu by adopting this ordinance, you're going to help clear the path for that to help them more easily get um, situated. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and if the council decides to proceed, of course I stand ready to read the title and that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Christy. Is there um, any public speakers, Frankie? Yeah, I was going to check. Do we have any public speakers on this? Not on this item. Okay, thank you. So we're back here at council. Can I make a motion to approve item 4C? Second. So the motion on the floor is to introduce on first reading an ordinance of the city of Malibu adding chapter 5.65 to title five business licenses and regulations of the Malibu Municipal Code to adopt by reference the Los Angeles County Massage Ordinance and finding the same exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Is that your motion? I'll take that as a yes. Is that a yes? Um, everyone's muted suddenly. Yeah, that would be his motion. Otherwise, okay. we're not going anywhere. <laughs> and that was your second, right? Correct. Correct. Okay, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Peak. Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, last item is our 7A, our calendar for next year. Um, no real report. I can report. I looked at it, it looked wonderful. Didn't see anything unusual. I don't know about anyone else. If that's the case, I'd make a motion to approve it. Okay, let me make sure there's no public speakers on the calendar. Second. Not, no public speakers on this item. Okay, we have a first and a second. Any conversation? Are we ready for roll call? Okay, roll call on that, please. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, a long night. Uh, appreciate everyone's hard work. Can I get a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Okay.
Okay, um, so moved then. See you in a couple of weeks. Now we have to call a real quick roll, um, Heather. I'm sorry, I mean, uh, Kelsey. Yes, sorry, who made that motion? Wagner. Okay, Council Member Wagner? Yes. And I believe it was Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member uh, Mullen? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yep. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Have a great night, everyone. All right, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.